Chapter One of William the Fourth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. William the Fourth by Rick Malcrompton. Chapter One: The Weak Spot. You see, said Jameson Jameson, we're all human beings. That's a very important point. You must admit that we're all human beings jameson jameson aged nineteen and three quarters was very eloquent he paused more for rhetorical effect than because he really needed confirmation on the point his audience all under nineteen agreed hoarsely and unanimously they were all human beings they admitted it well then jameson continued warming to his subject as human beings we're equal as being equal we've got equal rights i suppose anyone deny that robert brown aged seventeen in whose room the meeting took place leaned forward eagerly he was thoroughly enjoying the meeting the only drawback was the presence of his younger brother william aged eleven by some mistake someone had admitted william and by some still greater mistake no one had ejected him and now it was too late he gave no excuse for ejection he was sitting motionless his hands on his knees his eyes under their untidy shock of hair glued on the speaker his mouth wide open there was no doubt at all that he was impressed but robert wished he wasn't there he felt that the presence of a kid was an insult to the mature intelligence around him most of whom were in their first year at college but no one seemed to mind so he contented himself with sitting so that he could not see william well continued jameson jameson then why aren't we equal why are some rich and some poor why do some work and others not tell me that there was no answer only a gasp of wonder and admiration jameson jameson whose parents had perpetrated on him the supreme practical joke of giving him his surname for a christian name so that people who addressed him by his full name always seemed to be indulging in some witticism brought down his fist upon the table with a bang then it's somebody's duty to make us equal it's only common justice isn't it you admit that those who haven't money must be given money and those who have too much must have some taken off them we want equality and no more tyranny the working class must have freedom and who's going to do it he thrust his hand into his coat front in a manner reminiscent of the late mr gladstone and glared at his audience from under scowling brows ah uh, who gasped the audience it's here that the bolshevists come in bolshevists said robert aghast the bolshevists are very much misjudged and uh, maligned retorted jameson jameson with emotion shamefully misjudged and he wasn't sure whether he'd pronounced it right so he ended feebly what i said before i'm not he admitted frankly in direct communication with lenin but i've read about it in a magazine and i know a bit about it from that the bolshevists want to share things out so as we're equal and that's only right isn't it cause we're all human beings and as such are equal and as such have equal rights well that's clear isn't it does any one he glared around fiercely wish to contradict me no one did william who was sitting in a draught sneezed and was annihilated by a glance from robert well he continued i propose to form a bolshevist society first of all just to start with you see the bolshevists have gone to extremes but we'll join the bolshevist party and and purge it of all where it's wrong now now who'll join the society as human beings with equal rights they were all anxious to join they were all fired to the soul by jameson jameson's eloquence even william pressed forward to give in his name but was sternly ordered away by robert but i believe all you do he pleaded wistfully about wantin other people's money and thinkin we oughtn't to work you've misunderstood me my young friend said jameson jameson with a sigh but we want numbers there's no reason why 
if that kid belongs i'm not going to said robert firmly we might have a junior branch suggested one of them so thus it was finally settled william became the junior branch of the society of reformed bolshevists alone he was president and secretary and committee and members he resented any suggestion of enlarging the junior branch he preferred to form the branch himself he held meetings of his branch under the laurel bushes in the garden and made eloquent speeches to an audience consisting of a few depressed daffodil roots and sometimes the cat from next door all gotter be equal he pronounced fiercely all gotter have lots of money all human beings that sense isn't it is it sense or isn't it the cat from next door scratched its ear and slowly winked well then said william someone ought to do something the society of advanced bolshevists met next month in robert's room william had left nothing to chance he had heard robert saying that he'd see no kids got in to this one so he installed himself under robert's bed before anyone arrived robert looked round the room with a keen and threatening gaze before he ushered jameson jameson into the chair or to be more accurate on to the bed the meeting began comrades began jameson jameson we have i hope all spent this time in thinking things out and making ourselves more devoted to the cause but now is the time for action we've got to do something if we had any money except the mean bit that our fathers allow us we could make people jolly well sit up we could here william who had just inhaled a large mouthful of dust sneezed loudly and robert made a dive beneath the bed in the scuffle that ensued william embedded his teeth deeply into jameson jameson's ankle and vengeance was vowed on either side well why can't i come i'm a bolshevist too like what all you are well you've got a branch of your own said robert fiercely jameson jameson was still standing on one leg and holding the other in two hands with an expression of fortunately speechless agony on his face look went on robert you may have maimed him for life for all you know and he's the life and soul of the cause and what can he do with a maimed foot you'll have to keep him all his life if he's maimed for life and when the bolshevists get in power he'll have your blood and i shan't mind he added darkly jameson jameson gave a feeble smile it's all right comrade he said i harbor no thought of vengeance i hope i can bear more than this for the cause very ungently william was deposited on the landing outside you can keep your nasty little branch to yourself and don't come bothering us was robert's parting shot it was then that william realized the power of numbers he resolved at once to enlarge his branch rubbing the side on which he had descended on the landing and frowning fiercely he went downstairs and out into the road near the gate was victor jameson jameson jameson's younger brother gazing up at robert's bedroom window which could be seen through the trees he's up there talkin he muttered scornfully doesn't he talk the tone of contempt was oil on the troubled waters of william's feelings i've just bit him hard he said modestly the two linked arms affectionately and set off down the road at the corner of the road they fell in with george bell william had left ronald bell george's elder brother leaning against the mantelpiece in robert's room and examining himself in the glass he was letting his hair grow long and he hoped it was beginning to show what do they do up there at your house demanded george with curiosity he won't tell me anything he says it's secret he says no one's got to know now but all the world will know some day that's what he says ma said victor scornfully they talk that's all they do they talk let's find a few more said william and i'll tell you all about it it being saturday afternoon they soon collected the few more and the company returned to the summer house at the end of william's garden the company consisted chiefly of younger brothers of the members of the gathering upstairs 
William rose to address them with one hand inside his coat in an attitude copied faithfully from Jameson Jameson. They've got her old society, he said, and they've made me a branch, so I can make all of you branches. So now you're all branches, see? Well, they say how we're all human beings and equal. Well, they say if we're equal, we oughtn't to have less money and things than other folks, and more work to do and all that. That's what I heard em say. Here the cat from next door, drawn by the familiar sound of William's voice, peered into the summer house, and was promptly dismissed by a well-aimed stick. It looked reproachfully at William as it departed. And today they said, went on William, that now is the time for action, and how we'd only the mean bit of money our fathers gave us, and then they found me and I bit his leg, and they threw me out, and I bet I've got a bigger old bruise on my side, and I bet he's got a bigger old bite on his leg. He sat down amid applause, and George, acting with the generosity born of a sudden feeling of comradeship, took a stick of rock from his pocket and passed it round for a suck each. This somewhat disturbed the harmony of the meeting, as Ginger, William's oldest friend, was accused of biting a piece off, and the explanation that it came off in his mouth was not accepted by the irate owner, who was already regretting his generosity. The combatants were parted by William, and peace was sealed by the passing round of a bottle of licorice water belonging to Victor Jameson. Then William rose for a second speech. "'Well, we're all branches, so let's do same as them. They're going to get equal cause they're human beings. So let's try and get equal, too.' "'Equal with what?' demanded Douglas, whose elder brother had joined Jameson Jameson's society and had secretly purchased a red tie, which he did not dare to wear in public, but which he donned behind a tree on his way to William's house, and doffed in the same place on his way from William's house. "'Equal to them,' said William. "'Why, just think of the things they've got.' They've got lots of money, haven't they? Lots more than we have, and they can buy anything they want, and they stay for dinner always, and go out late at night, and eat what they want with no one saying had they better, or certainly not, or what happened last time, and they smoke, and don't go to school, and go to their pictures, and they've got lots more things, and we've got bicycles, and grammar phones, and fountain pens, and watches, and things what we've not got. Well, we're human beings, too, and we ought to be equal, and why shouldn't we be equal? And now's the time for action. They said so. There was a silence. But, said Douglas slowly, we can't just take things, can we? Yes, said William. We can, if we're Bolshevists. They said so. And we're all Bolshevist branches. They made me, and I made you. See? So we can take anything to make us equal. See? we've got to be equal. Here the meeting was stopped by the spectacle of the senior Bolshevist issuing from the side door, wearing frowns of stern determination. Douglas's brother fingered his red tie ostentatiously. Ronald pulled down his cap over his eyes with the air of a conspirator. Jameson Jameson limped slightly and smiled patiently and forgivingly upon Robert, who was still apologizing for William. The words that were wafted across to listening ears upon the spring breeze were, Next Tuesday, then. Then the branches turned to a discussion of details. They were nothing if not practical. After about a quarter of an hour, they departed, each pulling his cap over his eyes and frowning. As they departed, they murmured, Next Tuesday, then. Next Tuesday dawned bright and clear, with no hint that it was one of those days on which the world's fate is decided. The senior Bolshevists met in the morning. They discussed the possibility of getting in touch with Lenin, but no one knew his exact address or the rate of postage to Russia, so no definite step was taken. During the afternoon, Robert followed his father into the library. His face was set and stern. 
look here father he said we've been thinking some of us things don't seem fair we're all human beings it's time for action we're all agreed to speak to our fathers today and point things out to them they've been misjudged and maligned but we're going to purge them of all that you see we're all human beings and it's time for action we're all agreed on that we've got equal rights because we're all human beings he paused, inserted a finger between his neck and collar, as if he found its pressure intolerable, then smoothed back his hair. He was looking almost apoplectic. "'I don't know whether I make my meaning clear,' he began again. "'You don't, old chap, whatever it may be,' said his father soothingly. "'Perhaps you feel the heat, or the spring. You ought to take something cooling, and then lie down for a few hours.' you don't understand said robert desperately it's life or death to civilization you see we're all human beings and all equal and we've got equal rights and yet some have all the things and some have none you see we thought we'd all start at home and get things made more fair there and our fathers to divide up the money more fairly and give us our real share and then we could go round teaching other people to give things up to other people and share things out more fairly you see we must begin at home and then we start fair we're all human beings with equal rights you are so very modest in your demands said robert's father would half be enough for you are you sure you wouldn't like a little more robert waved the suggestion aside no he said you see you have the others to keep but we've all decided to ask our fathers today. then we can start fair and have some funds to go on a society without funds seems to be so handicapped and it would be an example to other fathers all over the world you see at this moment robert's mother came in what a mess your room's in robert i hope william hasn't been rummaging in it robert turned pale william he gasped and fled to investigate he returned in a few minutes, almost inarticulate with fury. My watch, he said, my purse, both gone. I'm going after him. He seized his hat from the hall and started to the door. His father watched him, leaning easily against the doorpost of the library and smiling. From the garden, as he passed, came a wail. My bicycle, gone too, the shed's empty. In the road, he met Jameson Jameson burglars said jameson jameson all my money's been taken and my camera the wretches i'm going to scour the country for them various other members of the bolshevist society appeared filled with wrath and lamenting vanished treasures it can't be burglars said robert because why only us do you think someone in the government found out about us being bolshevists and is trying to intimidate us jameson jameson thought this very likely and they discussed it excitedly in the middle of the road some hatless some hatted all talking breathlessly then at the other end of the road appeared a group of boys they were happy rollicking boys they all carried bags of sweets which they ate lavishly and handed round to their friends equally lavishly one held a camera or the remains of a camera whose mechanism the entire party had just been investigating one more had a large wristwatch upon a small wrist one walked or rather leapt upon a silver-topped walking-stick one the quietest of the group was smoking a cigarette at the side near the ditch about half a dozen rode intermittently upon a bicycle the descent of the bicycle and its cargo into the ditch was greeted with roars of laughter they were happy boys they sang as they walked we've been to the pictures in the best seats bought lots of sweets and a mouth organ we've got a bicycle and a camera and two watches and a fountain pen and a razor and a football and lots of things white with fury the senior bolshevist charged down upon them the junior bolshevist stood their ground firmly with the exception of the one who had been smoking a cigarette and he perforce a coward for physical rather than moral reasons crept quietly home relinquishing without reluctance his half-smoked cigarette 
in the homeric battle that followed accusations and justifications were hurled to and fro as the struggle proceeded you beastly little thieves you said to be equal and why should some people have all the things you little wretches we're human beings and got to take things to make equal you said so give it back to me why do you have it and not me it was time for action you said you spoilt it well as much as mine as yours we've all equal rights we're all human beings but the battle was one-sided and the junior branch having surrendered their booty and received punishment fled in confusion the senior branch bending lovingly and sadly over battered treasures walked slowly and silently up the road about your society began mr brown after dinner no said robert it's all off we've given it up after all we don't think there's much in it after all none of us do now we feel quite different but you were so enthusiastic about it this afternoon sharing fairly and all that sort of thing yes said robert that's all very well it's all right when you can get your share of other people's things but when other people try to get their share of your things then it's different ah said mr brown that's the weak spot i'm glad you found it out end of chapter one Chapter Two of William the Fourth by Rick Mall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two: William and Photography. Mrs. Adolphus Crane was William's mother's second cousin and William's godmother. Among the many senseless institutions of grown-up life, the institutions of godmothers and godfathers seemed to William the most senseless of all moreover mrs adolphus crane was rich and immensely respectable the last person whom fate should have selected as his godmother fortunately she lived at a distance and so was spared the horrible spectacle of william's daily crimes his meetings with her had not been fortunate so far in spite of his family's earnest desire that he should impress her favorably there had been that terrible meeting two months ago william was running a race with one of his friends it was quite a novel race invented by william the competitors each had their mouths full of water and the one who could run the farthest without either swallowing his load or discharging it won william in the course of the race encountered mrs adolphus crane who was on her way to william's house to pay him a surprise visit she recognized him and addressed to him a kindly affectionate remark of course if he had had time to think over the matter from all points of view he might have conceived the idea of swallowing the water before he answered but as he afterwards explained he had no time to think the worst of it was that the painful incident was witnessed by almost all william's family from the drawing-room window mrs adolphus crane's visit on that occasion was a very short one she seemed slightly distant it was felt strongly that something must be done to win back her favor william disclaimed all responsibility well i can't help it i can't help it i don't mind honestly i don't mind if she doesn't like me well i don't mind if she doesn't come again either but william she's your godmother well said the goaded william i can't help that i didn't do that when mrs adolphus crane's birthday came william's mother attacked him again you ought to give her something william you know especially after the way you treated her the last time she came over well, i've nothing to give her said william simply she can have that book uncle george gave me if she likes yeah she can have that he warmed to the subject uh, you know the one about ancient history don't mind her having it a bit but you haven't read it oh, i don't mind not reading it said william generously i i'd like her to have it he went on but it was mrs brown who had the great inspiration we'll have william's photograph taken for her 
it was quite simple to say that and it was quite simple to make an appointment at the photographer's but it was another matter to provide an escort for him mrs brown happened to have a bad cold mr brown was at the office robert william's grown-up brother flatly refused to go with him so after a conversation that lasted almost an hour william's elder sister ethel was induced mainly by bribery and corruption to go with william to the photographer's but she took a friend with her to act as a buffer state william at the appointed hour was in a state of suppressed fury to william the lowest depth of humiliation was having his photograph taken mrs brown had expended much honest toil upon him he had been washed and brushed and combed and manicured till his spirits had sunk below zero to william complete cleanliness was quite incompatible with happiness he had been encased in his best suit a thing of hard unbending cloth with that horror of horrors a stiff collar won't a jersey do he said plaintively it'll probably make me ill give me a sore throat or something this tight thing of my neck and i wouldn't like to be ill cause i giving you trouble he ended piously mrs brown was touched she was the one being in the world who never lost faith in william but you wear it every sunday dear she protested sundays is different he said everyone wears silly things on sundays but but suppose i met someone on my way there his horror was pathetic well you look very nice dear where are your gloves gloves he said indignantly yes to keep your hands clean till you get there is anyone going to give me anything for doing all this she sighed no dear it's to give pleasure to your godmother i know you like to give people pleasure william was silent cogitating over this entirely new aspect of his character he set off down the road with ethel and her friend blanche bosom friends of his with jerseys with normal dirty hands and faces passed him and stared at him in amazement he acknowledged their presence only by a cold stare on ordinary days he was a familiar figure on that road himself also comfortably jerseyed and gloriously dirty he would then have greeted them with a war-hoop and a friendly punch but now he was an outcast a pariah a thing apart a boy in his best clothes and kid gloves on an ordinary morning the photographer was awaiting them william returned his smile of welcome with a scowl so this is our little friend said the photographer and what is his name william grew purple ethel began to enjoy it willie she said now there were many insults that william had learned to endure with outward equanimity but this was not one ethel knew perfectly well his feeling with regard to the name willie it was a deliberate revenge because she had to waste a whole morning on him moreover ethel had various scores to wipe off against william and it was not often that she had him entirely at her mercy william growled that is the only word that describes the sound emitted pretty name for a pretty boy commented the photographer in sprightly vein ethel and blanche gurgled william dark and scowling looked unspeakable things at them come forward said the photographer invitingly any preparations of fancy dress i think not gurgled ethel i have some nice costumes he persisted a little page bubbles but perhaps the hair is hardly suitable cupid i have some pretty wings and drapery but perhaps the little boy's expression is hardly a uh, no i think not hastily as he encountered the fixed intensity of william's scowling gaze remove the cap and gloves my little chap he looked up and down william's shining immaculate person ah very nice he waved ethel and blanche to a seat now my boy he waved the infuriated william to a rustic woodland scene at the other end 
now uh, stand just there oh that's right no no not quite so stiff and no not quite so hunched up my little chap the hands resting carelessly uh, one on the hip i think just easy and natural oh that's right but no hardly relax the brow a little and oh no not a grimace it would spoil a pretty picture oh the feet so and the head so the hair is slightly deranged oh that's better let it stand to william's eternal credit that he resisted the temptation to bite the photographer's hand as it strayed among his short locks at last he was posed and the photographer returned to the camera but during his return william moved feet hands and head to an easier position the photographer sighed ah he's moved william's moved what a pity we'll have to begin all over again he returned to william and very patiently he rearranged william's feet and hands and head the toes turned out not in you see willie and the hands so and the head is slightly on one side so oh no not right down on to the shoulder ah oh, that's right that, that that sweet a very pretty picture ethel had retired hysterically behind a screen the photographer returned to his camera william promptly composed his limbs more comfortably ah oh, what a pity willie's moved again we shall have to commence afresh he returned to william and again put his unwilling head on one side his hand upon his hip and turned william's stout boots at a graceful angle he returned william was clinging doggedly to his pose anything to put an end to this torture ah right commented the photographer splendid very pretty the head just a leetle bit more on one side the expression a leetle less uh, melancholy a smile please just a leetle smile oh no hastily as william savagely bared his teeth perhaps it is better without a smile suppressed gurgles came from behind the screen where ethel clung helplessly to blanche one more please uh, sitting i think this time the legs crossed easily and naturally uh, so uh, the elbow resting on the arm of the chair and the cheek upon the hand uh, so he retired to a distance and examined the effect with his head on one side a little spoilt by the expression perhaps but uh, uh, very pretty the expression a little less uh, fierce if you will pardon the word william here deigned to speak i can't look any different to this he remarked coldly now uh, think of the things i say went on the photographer brightly sweeties ah looking merrily at william's unchanging ferocious expression do i see a saucy little smile as a matter of fact he didn't because at that moment ethel her eyes streaming peeped round the screen for another look at the priceless sight of william in his best suit in the familiar attitude of the bard of avon encountering the concentrated fury of william's gaze she retired hastily seaside with spade and bucket went on the photographer watching william's unchanging expression pantomimes that nice soft furry pussycat you've got at home but seeing william's expression change from one of scornful fury to one of nebuchadnezzar rage and fury he hastily pressed the little ball lest worse should follow ethel's description of the morning considerably enlivened the lunch table only mrs brown did not join in the roars of laughter but i think it sounds very nice dear she said very nice i'm very much looking forward to the proofs coming well it was priceless said ethel it was ever so much funnier than the pantomime i wouldn't have missed it for anything for years to come if i feel depressed i shall just think of william this morning his face <laughs> his face william defended himself my face is just like anyone else's face he said indignantly i don't know why you're all laughing there's nothing funny about my face i never done anything to it it's no different to other people's it doesn't make me laugh 
no dear said mrs brown soothingly it's very nice uh, very nice indeed and i'm sure it will be a beautiful photograph the proofs arrived next week they were highly appreciated by william's family there were two positions in one william in an attitude of intellectual contemplation glowered at them from an artistic background in the other he stood stiffly with one hand on his hip his toes in spite of all turned resolutely in and glared ferociously and defiantly upon the world in general mrs brown was delighted oh i think it's awfully nice she said and he looks so smart and clean william mystified by robert's and ethel's reception of them carried them up to his room and studied them long and earnestly well i can't see what's funny about em he said at last half indignantly and half mystified it don't seem funny to me you'll have to write a letter to your godmother dear said mrs brown as mrs adolphus crane's birthday drew near me said william bitterly i should think i've done enough for her no said mrs brown firmly you must write a letter i don't know what to say to her say whatever comes into your head i don't know how to spell all the words that come in my head i'll help you dear seeing no escape william sat gloomily down at the table and was supplied with pen ink and paper he looked round disapprovingly suppose i wear out the nib he said sadly mrs brown obligingly placed a box of nibs at his elbow he sighed wearily life sometimes is hardly worth living after much patient thought he got as far as dear godmother he occupied the next ten minutes in seeing how far you could bend apart the two halves of a nib without breaking them after breaking six he wearied of the occupation and returned to his letter with deeply furrowed brow and protruding tongue he continued his efforts many happy returns of your birthday i hope you are very well i am very well and so is mother and father and ethel and robert he gazed out of the window and chewed the end of his penholder into splinters some he swallowed then choked and had to retire for a drink of water then he demanded a fresh pen after about fifteen minutes he returned to his epistolary efforts it is not raining to-day he wrote after much thought then it did not rain yesterday and we are hoping it will not rain to-morrow having exhausted that topic he scratched his head in despair wrinkled up his brows and chewed his penholder again i have a hole in my talking was his next effort then i have had my photograph took and send it for a birthday present some people think it funny but to me it seems all right i hope you will like it your loving godson william mrs adolphus crane was touched both by letter and photograph i must have been wrong she said with penitence he looks so good and there's something rather sad about his face she asked william to her birthday tea party to william this was the climax of a long chain of insults but i don't want to go to tea with her he said in dismay but she wants you darling said mrs brown i expect she liked your photograph i'm not going said william testily if they're all going to be laughing at my photograph all the time i'll just sick of people laughing at my photograph of course they won't dear said mrs brown it's a very nice photograph you look a bit uh, pressed in it that's all well that's not funny he said indignantly of course not dear you'll behave nicely won't you i'll behave ordinary he said coldly but i don't want to go i don't want to go cause 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 he sought silently for a reason that might appeal to a grown-up mind then with a brilliant inspiration cause i don't want my best clothes to get all wore out i don't think they will dear she said don't worry about that william dejectedly promised not to the afternoon of mrs adolphus crane's birthday dawned bright and clear and william resigned and martyred set off he arrived early and was shown into mrs adolphus crane's magnificent drawing-room an air of magisterial magnificence shed gloom over mrs adolphus crane's 
whole house mrs adolphus crane as magisterial and magnificent and depressing and enormous as her house entered good afternoon william now i've a pleasant little surprise for you william's gloomy countenance brightened i put your photograph into my album there what an honor for a little boy william's countenance relapsed into gloom you can look at the album while i'm getting ready and then when the guests come you can show it to them won't that be nice she departed william was trapped trapped in a huge and horrible drawing-room by a huge and horrible woman and he would have to stay there at least two hours and ginger and henry were bird-nesting ah oh, the horror of it why was he chosen by fate for this penance he felt a sudden fury against the art of photography in general william's sudden furies against anything demanded some immediate outlet so william with the aid of a pencil looked at mrs adolphus crane's family album till mrs adolphus crane was ready then she arrived and soon after her the guests or rather such of them as had not had the presence of mind to invent excuses for their absence for funeral affairs were mrs adolphus crane's parties liveliness and hilarity dropped slain on the doorstep the guests came sadly into the drawing-room and mrs adolphus crane dispensed gloom from the hearthrug her voice was low and deep how do you do oh thank you so much i doubt whether i shall live to see another oh yes my nerves by the way my little godson they turned to look at william who was sitting in silent misery in a corner his hands on his knees he returned their interested stares with his best company frown on the chair by him was the album have you seen the family album went on mrs adolphus crane it's most interesting do look at it a group of visitors sadly gathered round it and one of them opened it mrs adolphus crane did not join them she knew her album by heart she took her knitting sat down by the fire and poured forth her knowledge the first one is great uncle joshua she said a splendid old man never touched tobacco or alcoholic drinks in his life they looked at great uncle joshua he sat grim and earnest and respectable with his hand on the table but a lately added pipe in pencil adorned his mouth and his hand seemed to encircle a tankard quite suddenly animation returned to the group by the album they began to believe that they were going to enjoy it after all then comes my poor dear mother poor dear mother wore a large eyeglass with a black ribbon and a wild indian headdress the group by the album grew large there seemed to be some magnetic attraction about it then comes my paternal uncle james a very handsome man paternal uncle james might have been a very handsome man before his nose had been elongated for several inches and his lips curved into an enormous smile showing gigantic teeth he smoked a large vulgar-looking pipe a beautiful character too said mrs adolphus grain she continued the family catalogue and the visitors followed the photographs in the album they were all embellished some had pipes some had blue noses some had black eyes some giant spectacles some comic headdresses some had received more attention than others aunt julia a most saintly woman positively leered from her cabinet with a huge nose and a black eye and a cigar in her mouth the album was handed from one to another an unwanted hilarity and vivacity reigned supreme and always there were crowds round the album mrs adolphus crane was surprised but vaguely flattered her party seemed more successful than usual people seemed to be taking quite a lot of notice of william too one young curate who had wept tears over the album pressed half a crown into william's hand by some unerring instinct they guessed the author of the outrage 
as a matter of fact mrs adolphus crane did not happen to look at her album till several months later and then it did not occur to her to connect it with william but this afternoon she somehow connected the strange spirit of cheerfulness that pervaded her drawing-room with him and was most gracious to him he's been so good she said to mrs brown when she arrived to take william home quite helped to make my little party a success mrs brown concealed her amazement as best she could but what did you do william she said on the way home as william plodded along beside her his hands in his pockets lovingly fingering his half-crown me said william innocently uh, nothing End of chapter 2three of william the fourth by rick mall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the fete and fortune william took a fancy to miss tabitha croft as soon as he saw her she was small and inoffensive looking she didn't look the sort of person to write irate letters to william's parents william was a great judge of character he could tell at a glance who was likely to object to him who was likely to ignore him and who was likely definitely to encourage him the last was a very rare class indeed most people belonged to the first class but as he sat on the wall and watched miss tabitha croft timidly and flutteringly superintending the unloading of her furniture at her little cottage gate he came to the conclusion that she would be very inoffensive indeed he also came to the conclusion that he was going to like her william generally got on well with timid people he was not timid himself he was small and freckled and solemn and possessed of great tenacity of purpose for his eleven years miss tabitha happening to look up from the debris of a small table which one of the removers had carelessly and gracefully crushed against the wall saw a boy perched on her wall scowling at her she did not know that the scowl was william's ordinary normal expression she smiled apologetically a good afternoon she said afternoon said william there was silence for a time while another of the removers took the door off his hinges with little or no effort by means of a small piano which he then placed firmly upon another remover's foot then the silence was broken during the breaking of silence william's scowl disappeared and a rapt smile appeared on his face can't they think of things to say he said delightedly to miss tabitha when a partial peace was restored miss tabitha raised a face of horror and misery oh dear she said in a voice that trembled it's simply dreadful william's chivalry that curious quality was aroused he leapt heavily from the wall i'll help he said airily don't you worry he helped he staggered from the van to the house and from the house to the van he worked till the perspiration poured from his freckled brow he broke two candlesticks a fender a lamp a statuette and most of a breakfast service after each breakage he said oh never mind comfortingly to miss tabitha and put the pieces tidily in the dustbin when he had filled the dustbin he arranged them in a neat pile by the side of it he was completely master of the situation miss tabitha gave up the struggle and sat on a packing case in the kitchen with some sal volatile and smelling salts one of the removers gave william a drink of cold tea another gave him a bit of cold sausage william was blissfully riotously happy the afternoon seemed to fly on wings he tore a large hole in his knickers and upset a tin of paint which he found on a window-sill down his jersey at last the removers departed and william proudly surveyed the scene of his labors and destruction well he said i bet things would have been a lot different if i hadn't helped oh, i'm sure they would said miss tabitha with perfect truth seems about tea-time doesn't it went on william gently miss tabitha gave a start and put aside the sal volatile yes do stay and have some here 
thanks said william simply i was thinking you'd most likely ask me over the tea to which he did full justice in spite of his previous repast of cold tea and sausage william waxed very conversational he told her of his friends and enemies uh, chiefly enemies in the neighbourhood of farmer jones who made such a fuss over his old apples of the rev p craig who entered into a base conspiracy with parents to deprive quite well-meaning boys of their sunday afternoon freedom if sunday school's so nice and good for folks as they say it is said william bitterly why don't they go i won't mind them going he told her of ginger's air gun and his own catapult of the dead rat they found in the ditch and the house they had made of branches in the wood of the daredevil career of robber and outlaw he meant to pursue as soon as he left school in short he admitted her unreservedly into his friendship and while he talked he consumed large quantities of bread and jam and butter and cakes and pastry at last he rose well he said i suppose i'd better be going miss tabitha was bewildered but vaguely cheered by him you must g come again she said oh yes said william cheerfully i'll come again lots and uh, let me know when you're moving again i'll come and help again miss tabitha shuddered slightly thank you so much she said he arrived the next afternoon i've just come to see he said how you're getting on Miss Tabitha was seated at a little table, with a row of playing cards spread out in front of her. She flushed slightly. I'm, I'm just telling my fortune, William, she said. Oh, said William. He was impressed. It does sometimes come true, she said eagerly. I do it nearly every day. It's curious how it grows on one. She began to turn up the covered cards and study them intently william sat on a chair opposite her and watched with interest there was a letter in my cards yesterday she said and it came this morning sometimes it comes true like that but often she sighed it doesn't what's in it today said william scowling at the cards a death said miss tabitha in a sepulchral whisper and a letter from a dark man and jealousy of a fair woman and a present from across the sea and legal business and a legacy but they're none of them the sort of thing that comes true i don't know though she went on dreamily the income tax man might be dark i don't know and i may hear from him soon it's wonderful really i mean that any of it should come out it's quite an absorbing pursuit shall i do yours mm, said william graciously you must wish first william wished with his eyes screwed up in silent concentration i've done it he said miss tabitha dealt out the cards she shook her head sorrowfully you'll be treated badly by a fair woman she said william agreed gloomily uh, that'll be ethel my sister he said she thinks that just cause she's grown up he relapsed into subterranean mutterings and you'll have your wish she said william brightened then his eye roved round the room to a photograph on a bureau by the window who's he he said miss tabitha flushed again he was once going to marry me she said and he went away and he never came back Spect he met someone he liked better and married her, suggested William cheerfully. I expect he did, said Miss Tabitha. He surveyed her critically. Perhaps he didn't like your hair not being curly, he proceeded. Some don't. My brother Robert, he says if a girl's hair doesn't curl, she ought to curl it. Perhaps you didn't curl it? No, I didn't. My sister Ethel does, but she gets mad if I tell folks, and she gets mad when I use her old things for making poles and apples and cardboard and things. She's an awful fuss, he added contemptuously. When he got home, he stood transfixed on the dining room threshold, his mouth open, his eyes wide. Crumbs, he ejaculated. He had wished that there might be ginger cake for tea, and there was at tea was the vicar's wife the vicar's wife was afflicted with the sale of work mania it is a disease to which vicar's wives are notoriously susceptible 
she was always thinking out the next but one sale of work before the next one was over she was always praised in the local press and she felt herself to be a very happy woman i'm going to call the next one a fake she said it will seem more of a change fake said william with interest she murmured dear boy vaguely we'll advertise it widely i'm thinking of calling it the king of fates such an arresting title we'll have donkey rides and coconut shies so democratic and we ought to have fortune-telling one doesn't um course believe in it but it's what people expect some quite harmless fortune-telling by cards for instance william gasped she did mine wonderful he said excitedly it came just what i wished there was it for tea who what said the vicar's wife oh, the new one a at the cottage i did all her furniture for her and got paint on my clothes and she told me about him not coming back cause of her hair perhaps and i got some of her things broke out but not many and she gave me tea and said to come again gradually they elicited details i'll call said the vicar's wife it would be so nice to have someone who knows to do it someone respectable fortune tellers are so often not white uh, you know what i mean dear she cooed to william's mother of course murmured william abstractly it mayn't have been her hair it may have been just anything william was having a strenuous time fate was making one of her periodic assaults on him everything went wrong miss drew his form mistress at school had taken an altogether misguided and unsympathetic view of his zeal for nature study in fact when the beetle which william happened to be holding lovingly in his hand as he did his sums by her desk escaped and made its way down her neck her piercing scream boded no good to william the further discovery of a caterpillar and two woodlice on his pencil box a frog in his satchel and earwigs in his pocket annoyed her still more and william stayed in school behind his friends to write out one hundred times i must not bring insects into school his addition because they frightened miss Drew, made relations still more strained he met with no better luck at home his unmelodious and penetrating practices on a mouth organ in the early hours of the morning had given rise to a coldness that changed to actual hostility when it was discovered that he had used ethel's new cape as the roof of his wigwam in the garden and robert's new expensive brown shoe polish to transform himself to a red indian chief he was distinctly unpopular at home there was some talk of not allowing him to attend the king of fates but as the rest of the family were going and the maids had refused to be left with william on the premises it was considered safer to allow him to go but any of your tricks said his father darkly leaving the sentence unfinished the day of the king of fates was fine the stalls were bedecked in the usual bright and inharmonious colors a few donkeys with their attendants surveyed the scene contemptuously ethel was wearing the new cape brushed and cleaned to a running accompaniment of abuse of william mrs brown was presiding at a stall robert wearing a large buttonhole with his shoes well browned and a new tin of polish purchased with william's pocket money presided at a miniature rifle range william having been given permission to attend and money for his entrance hung round the gateway glaring at them scornfully he always disliked his family intensely upon public occasions he had not yet paid his money and was wondering whether it was worth it after all and it would not be wiser to spend it on bull's-eyes and gingerbreads and his afternoon in the fields as a solitary outlaw and hunter of cats or whatever other life prey fate chose to send him in a tent at the farther end of the fate grounds was miss tabitha croft arrayed in a long and voluminous garment covered with strange signs they were supposed to be mystic eastern signs but were in reality the invention of the vicar's wife suggested by the free-hand drawing of her youngest son aged three 
it completely enveloped miss tabitha from head to foot leaving only two holes for her eyes and two holes for her arms she had shown it to william the day before i don't quite like it she had confessed i hope there's nothing blasphemous about it but she ought to know being a vicar's wife she ought to know i only hope she went on shaking her head that i'm not tampering with the powers of darkness even for the cause of the church organ outside was a large placard fortune-telling by the woman of mystery two shillings sixpence each inside the woman of mystery sat trembling with nervousness in front of a table on which reposed her little well-worn pack of cards each with a neat hieroglyphic in the corner to show whether it meant a death or a wedding or a legacy or anything else william surveying this scene from the gateway became aware of a figure coming slowly down the road it was a man a very tall man who stooped slightly as he walked as he came to william he became suddenly aware in his turn of william's scowling regard he lifted his hat oh, good afternoon he said courteously afternoon said william brusquely do you know went on the man whether a miss croft lives in the village he pointed down the hill to the cluster of roofs i think said william slowly i've seen your photo only you wasn't so old when you had it took where have you seen my photo said the man in her house what i helped her to remove to said william proudly the man's kind rather weak face lit up could you show me her house you see he went on simply i'm a very unhappy man i went away but i've carried her in my heart all the time but it's taken me a long long time to find her i'm a very tired unhappy man william looked at him with some scorn you was soft he said perhaps it was cause her hair not curlin where is she said the man in there said william pointing to the enclosure sacred to the king of fates i'll get her if you like thank you said the man william still grudging his entrance money walked round the enclosure till he found a weak spot in the hedge behind a tent through this he scrambled with great difficulty leaving his cap en route blackening and scratching his face tearing his knickers in two places and his jersey in three but william who could not see himself fingering tenderly the price of admission in his pocket felt that it had been trouble well expended he met the vicar's wife she was raffling a tea cosy highly decorated with red and yellow and purple tulips on a green ground she wore her sale of work smile william accosted her he wants her he's come back could you get her he said he's had the right one in his inside all the time he said so but she had no use for william william did not look as if he was good for a one and six raffle ticket for a tea cosy sweet thing she murmured vaguely and effusively caressed his disordered hair as she passed william made his way towards the tent of the woman of mystery but there was an ice-cream stall on his way and william could not pass it robert and ethel glasses of fashion and moles of form passed at the minute at the sight of william with torn coat and jersey dirty scratched face no cap and tousled hair consuming ice-cream horns among a crowd of his social inferiors a shudder passed through both of them they felt that william was a heavy handicap to them in life's race send him home said robert i simply wouldn't be seen speaking to him replied ethel william having satisfied his craving for ice cream with the greater part of his entrance money wandered on towards the tent of the woman of mystery he entered it by crawling under the canvas at the back the woman of mystery happened to be having a slack time the tent was empty he's come announced william he's waiting outside who said the woman of mystery the one what you've got a photo of you know he's just by the gate oh dear gasped the woman of mystery does he want me mm, said william oh dear fluttered the woman of mystery i must go yet how can i go people will be coming for their fortunes william waved aside the objection oh i'll see to that he said but, but can you tell fortunes dear she asked i don't know said william i've never tried yet 
the woman of mystery drew off her curious gown i must go she said with that she fled through the back opening of the tent william slowly and deliberately arrayed himself he put on the gown and arranged it so that his eyes came to the two holes and his hands out of the two armholes then he lifted the hassock on which the woman of mystery had disposed her feet on to the chair and took his seat upon it carefully hiding it with the gown at that moment the flap of the tent opened and a client entered she put half a crown on the table and sat down on the chair opposite william peering through his eye-holes william recognized miss drew he spread out a row of the playing cards and began to whisper william's whisper was such a little-known quantity that it was not recognized you've got a bad temper he whispered true sighed miss drew you've got a cat and hens went on william true you've been hard on a boy just lately he may not live very long you've time to make up to him miss drew started that's all miss drew looking bewildered and troubled withdrew from the tent william was surprised on peering through his eye-holes to recognize ethel in his next visitor he spread out the cards and began to whisper again you've got two brothers he whispered ethel nodded the small one won't live long probably you'd better be kinder to him while he lives come in to him more that's all ethel withdrew in an awed silence robert entered next william was beginning to enjoy himself you've got her brother he whispered well he's not strong and he may die soon this is a warning for you you'd better make him happy while he's alive that's all robert went slowly from the tent at that moment the little woman of mystery fluttered in from the back oh thank you so much dear such a wonderful thing has happened but i must return to my post he'll wait till the end he says still talking breathlessly she drew the robe of mystery from william and put it on herself william wandered out again into the fate ground he visited the ice cream stall again then wandered aimlessly around the first person to accost him was miss drew hello william she said gazing at him anxiously i've been looking for you would you like some ice cream william graciously condescended to be fed with ice cream oh, would you like a box of chocolates went on miss drew do you feel all right william dear you've been a bit pale lately william accepted from her a large box of chocolates and three donkey rides he admitted that perhaps he hadn't been feeling very strong lately when she departed he found robert and ethel looking for him they treated him to a large and very satisfying tea and several more donkey rides both used an unusually tender tone of voice when addressing him ethel bought him a pineapple and another box of chocolates and robert bought him a bottle of sweets and apologized for his unreasonable behavior about the shoe polish when they went home william walked between them and they carried his chocolates and sweets and pineapple for him feeling that too much could not be made of the present state of affairs he made robert do his homework before he went to bed up in his room he gave his famous imitation of a churchyard cough that he had made perfect by practice and which had proved a great asset to him on many occasions ethel crept softly upstairs she held a paper bag in her hand william darling she said i've brought this toffee for your throat it might do it good william added it to his store of presents thank you he said with an air of patient suffering and i'll give you something to make your wigwam with to-morrow dear she went on thank you said william and if you want to practice your mouth organ in the mornings it doesn't matter a bit thank you said william in a small martyred voice the next evening william walked happily down the road it had been a very pleasant day miss drew had done most of his work for him at school he had been treated at lunch by his family with a consideration that was quite unusual he had been entreated to have all that was left of the trifle while the rest of the family had stewed prunes 
in the garden of the little cottage was miss tabitha croft and the tall stooping man oh this is william said miss tabitha william is a great friend of mine i saw william yesterday said the man william must certainly come to the wedding william said miss croft it was kind of you to take my place yesterday did you manage all right oh yes said william after a moment's consideration i managed all right thank you End of chapter three chapter four of william the fourth by rickmall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four william all the time william was walking down the road his hands in his pockets his mind wholly occupied with the christmas pantomime he was going to the christmas pantomime next week his thoughts dwelt on the rapturous memories of previous christmas pantomimes of puss in the boots of dick whittington of red riding hood his mouth curved into a blissful smile as he thought of the funny man inimitable funny man with his red nose and enormous girth how william had roared every time he appeared with what joy he had listened to his uproarious songs but it was not the funny man to whom william had given his heart it was to the animals it was to the cat in puss in boots the robins in the babes in the wood and the wolf in red riding hood he wanted to be an animal in a pantomime he was quite willing to relinquish his beloved future career of pirate in favor of that of animal in a pantomime he wondered it was at this point that fate who often had a special eye on william performed one of her lightning tricks a man in shirt-sleeves stepped out of the wood and looked anxiously up and down the road then he took out his watch and muttered to himself william stood still and stared at him with frank interest then the man began to stare at william first as if he didn't see him and then as if he saw him would you like to be a bear for a bit he said william pinched himself he seemed to be awake a b -b 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 bear he queried his eye almost starting out of his head yes said the man irritably a bear b e a r bear animal zoo never heard of a bear william pinched himself again he seemed to be still awake yes he agreed as though unwilling to commit himself entirely i've heard of a bear all right come on then said the man looking once more at his watch once more up the road once more down the road then turning on his heel and walking quickly into the wood william followed both mouth and eyes wide open the man did not speak as he walked down the path then suddenly down a bend in the path they came upon a strange sight there was a hut in a little clearing and round the hut was clustered a group of curious people a father christmas holding his beard in one hand and a glass of ale in the other a rather fat goldilocks in the act of having yellow powder lavishly applied to her face several fairies and elves sucking large and redolent peppermints a ferocious but depressed-looking giant rubbing his hands together and complaining of the cold and several other strange and incongruous figures in front of the hut was a large species of camera with a handle and behind stood a man smoking a pipe get turned up he said william's guide shook his head no he said they've missed their train or lost their way or evaporated or got kidnapped or something but this happened to be passing and it looked the same size pretty near what do you think the man took his pipe from his mouth in order the better to concentrate his whole attention on william he looked at william from his muddy boots to his untidy head then he reversed the operation and looked from his untidy head to his muddy boots and then he scratched his head seems on the big side for the middle one he said at this point a hullabaloo arose from behind the shed and a small bear appeared howling loudly we took a my bit of toffee yelled the bear in a very human voice ah shut up said the man in his shirt sleeves the small bear was followed by a large bear protesting loudly i gave him half of mine and he promised to give me a his and then he tried to eat it all and ah shut up repeated the man then he turned to william 
all you're got to do he said is to fix on the middle bear suit and do exactly what you're told and i'll give you five shillings at the end see these rural places are a beautiful change murmured goldilocks mother darkening her eyebrows as she spoke so calm and quiet these christmas shows grumbled the giant flapping his arms vigorously are the very devil here william found his voice crumbs he ejaculated then feeling the expletive to be altogether inadequate to the occasion quickly added gosh take the kid round someone said the shirt sleeve man wearily and fix on his togs and let's get on with the show here a fairy queen appeared from behind the hut i don't see how i'm possibly to go through with this here performance she said in a voice of plaintive suffering i had toothache all last night if you think said the shirt-sleeve man that you can hold up this blessed show for a tuppenny halfpenny toothache if you're going to be insulting said the fairy queen in shrill indignation ah shut up said the shirt-sleeve man here father christmas who had finished his ale led william into the hut a bare suit lay on a chair the kid what was to wear this not having turned up he said by way of explanation and you by all accounts being willing to oblige for a small consideration we shall have to see what can be done i suppose he added you have no objection me said william whose eyes and mouth had grown more and more circular every minute me objection golly i should think not the little bear and the big bear surveyed him critically he's too big said the little bear contemptuously his hair's too long contributed the big bear his face is too dirty his ears is too long his nose is too flat his head's too big his william speedily and joyfully put an end to the duet and father christmas wearily disentangled the struggling mask it may be a bit on the small side he conceded as he deposited the small bear upside down beneath the table but we'll do what we can here the shirt-sleeve man appeared at the window that's right he said kindly take all day about it don't hurry we all enjoy hanging about waiting for you father christmas offered to retire from his post in favour of the shirt-sleeve man and the shirt-sleeve man hastily retreated then came the task of fitting william into the skin it was not an easy task you're bigger said father christmas than what you look in the distance considerable william could not stand quite upright in the skin but by stooping slightly he could see and speak through the open mouth of the head in an ecstasy of joy he pummeled the big bear the little bear gladly joined in the fray and a furry ball of three struggling bears rolled out of the door of the hut the shirt-sleeve man rang a bell after this somewhat lengthy interlude he said by the way may i inquire the name of our new friend william proudly shouted his name through the aperture in the bear's head well billiam he said jocularly do just what i tell you and you'll be all right now all clear off a minute please we've only a few scenes to do here location he read from a paper in his hand hut in wood enter fairies with fairy queen dance how am i expected to dance said the fairy queen bitterly tortured by toothache i can't think you don't dance with your teeth said the shirt-sleeve man unsympathetically let's go through it once more before we turn on the machine you've rehearsed it often enough now come on they danced a dance that made william gape in surprise and admiration so dainty and airy was it enter father christmas went on the shirt-sleeve man what i can't think said father christmas fastening on his beard is what a father christmas is doing in this effect nor a giant said the giant sadly it's for a christmas show said the shirt-sleeve man you gotta have a father christmas in a christmas show or else how people know it's a christmas show and you gotta have a giant in a fairy tale whether there is one in it or not father christmas joined the dance gave presents to all the fairies then retired behind the hut to his private store of refreshment enter goldilocks said the shirt-sleeve man now where the dickens is that kid 
goldilocks fat fair and rosy appeared from behind a tree where she had been eating bananas she peered down the middle bear's mouth it's a new one she said the other one hasn't turned up said the man this is billiam who is taking on the middle one for the small consideration of five shillings he's put out his tongue at me she screamed in shrill indignation at this the big bear whose adoration of goldilocks was very obvious closed with william and goldilocks mother screamed shrilly the giant separated the two bears and goldilocks came to the hut with an expression of patient suffering meant to represent intense physical weariness she gave a sort of joy at the sight of the hut which apparently she did not see till she had almost passed it she entered she gave a second start of joy at the sight of three porridge plates she tasted the first two and consumed the third she wandered into the other room she gave a third start of joy at the sight of three beds she tried them all and went to sleep beautifully and realistically on the smallest william was lost in admiration come on bears said the man in shirt sleeves billiam walk between them don't jump walk in at the door that's right now billiam look at your plate then shake your head at the big bear trembling with joy william obeyed the big bear in the privacy of the open mouth put out his tongue at william with a hostile grimace william returned it now to the little one said the man in shirt sleeves but william was still absorbed in the big one enraged by a particularly brilliant feat in the grimacing line which he felt he could not outshine he put out a paw and tripped up the big bear's chair the big bear promptly picked up a porridge plate and broke it on william's head the little bear hurled himself ecstatically into the conflict father christmas wearily returned to his work of separating them if you aren't satisfied with your bonus said the shirt-sleeve man to william take it out of me not the scenery you've just done about five shillings worth of damage already now let's get on the rest of the scene went off fairly well but william was growing bored it wasn't half such fun as he thought it would be he wasn't feeling quite sure of his five shillings after those smashed plates the only thing for which he felt a deep and lasting affection from which he felt he could never endure to be parted was his bearskin it was rather small and very hot but it gave him a thrill of pleasure unlike anything he had ever known before he was a bear he was an animal in a pantomime he began to dislike immensely the shirt-sleeve man and the hut and the fairy queen and the giant and all the rest of them but he loved his bear suit it was while the giant was having a scene by himself that the brilliant idea came to william he was standing behind a tree no one was looking at him he moved very quietly further away still no one looked at him he moved yet further away and still no one looked at him in a few seconds he was leaping and bounding through the wood alone in the world with the bearskin he was a bear he was a bear in a wood he ran he jumped he turned head over heels he climbed a tree he ran after a rabbit he was riotously blissfully happy he met a boy who fled from him with echoing yells of terror and to william it seemed as if he had drunk of ecstasy's very fount he ran on and on roaring occasionally and occasionally rolling in the leaves then something happened he gave a particularly violent jump and strained the skin which was already somewhat tight the skin did not burst but the head came down very far on to william's head and wedged itself tightly he could not see out of its open mouth now he could just see out of one of the eye-holes but only just his mouth was wedged tightly in the head and he found he could not speak plainly he put up his paws and pulled at the head to loosen it but with no results it was very tightly wedged william's spirits drooped it was all very well being a bear in a wood as long as one could change oneself to a boy at will it was a very different thing being fastened to a bearskin for life he supposed that in time if he went on growing to a man he'd burst the bearskin 
on the other hand he couldn't get to his mouth now so he couldn't eat and he'd not be able to grow at all starvation stared him in the face he was hungry already he decided to return home and throw himself on the mercy of his family then he remembered that his family were all out that afternoon his mother was at a mother's meeting at the vicarage he decided to go straight to the vicarage perhaps the united efforts of the mothers of the village might succeed in getting his head off he went out from the woods on to the road but was discouraged by the behavior of a woman who was passing she gave an unearthly yell tore a leg of mutton from her basket flung it at william's head and ran for dear life down the road screaming as she went william much depressed returned to the woods and reached the vicarage by a circuitous route feeling too shy to ring the bell and interview a housemaid in his present costume he walked round the house to the french windows of the dining-room where the meeting was taking place he stood pathetically in the doorway of the window mother he began plaintively in a muffled and almost inaudible voice but it would have made little difference had he spoken in his usual strident tones the united scream of the mother's meeting would have drowned it never in the whole course of his life had william seen a room empty so quickly it was like magic almost before his plaintive and muffled mother had left his lips the room was empty only two dozen overturned chairs an overturned table and several broken ornaments marked the line of retreat the room was empty the entire mother's meeting headed by the vicar's wife and the vicarage cook and housemaid were dashing down the main road of the village screaming as they went william sadly surveyed the desolate scene before him and retreated again to the woods he leant against a tree and considered the whole situation hello billiam turning his head to a curious angle and peering out of one of the bear's eye-holes he recognized goldilocks hello he returned in a spiritless voice why did you run away she said dunno he said i wanted the old skin wish i'd never seed it you do talk funny she said i can't hear what you say and so far was william's spirit broken that he only sighed i saw you going she went on and i went after you but you ran so fast that i lost you then i went round a bit by myself i say they won't be able to get on with the old thing without us i heard him shouting for us isn't it fun and i heard some people screaming in the road what was that william sighed again and then he shouted try and pull my head loose hard she complied she pulled till william yelled again you nearly took my ears off he said angrily in his muffled sepulchral voice but the head was wedged on as tightly as ever she went to the edge of the wood and peered across the road there's a place there she said with lots of men in it go and ask them william somewhat reluctantly for his previous experiences had sadly disillusioned him with human nature in general went through the trees to the roadside he looked back at the white-clad form of goldilocks wait for me he whispered hoarsely anxious to attract as little notice as possible he crept on all fours round to the door of the public-house he poked in his head nervously please can summon he began politely but in the clatter that arose the ghostly whisper was lost several glasses and a chair were flung at his head amid shoutings and uproar the innkeeper went for his gun but on his return william had departed and the innkeeper who knew the better part of valor contented himself with bolting the door and fetching a sol volatile for his wife after a decent interval he unlocked the door and the inmates crept cautiously home one by one a great furious brute they were heard to say must have escaped from a circus if we hadn't been quick uh, we oughtn't to get up a party with guns let's go and warn the school or it'll get the kids on reaching their homes most of them found their wives in hysterics on the kitchen floor after a hasty return from the mother's meeting meanwhile william sat beneath a tree in the wood in an attitude of utter despondency his head on his paws why didn't you tell them said goldilocks impatiently i tell every one said william nobody'll listen to me they make a noise and throw things 
I'm going to go home. He rose and held out a paw. He felt utterly and miserably cut off from his fellow men. He clung pathetically to Goldilocks's presence. Come with me, he said. Hand in hand, a curious couple, they went through the woods to the back of William's house. If I die, he said at once, afore we get home, you'd better bury me. There's a spade in the back garden. He took her round to the shed in his back garden. You stay here, he whispered, and I'll try and get my head took off and then get us something to eat. Cautiously and apprehensively, he crept into the house. He could hear his mother talking to the cook in the kitchen. It stood right in the window, she was saying in a trembling voice. Not a very big animal, but so ferocious looking. We got out just in time. It was just getting ready to spring it. William crept to the open kitchen door and assumed his most plaintive expression, forgetting for the moment that his expression could not be seen. Just as he was opening his mouth to speak, Cook turned round and saw him. The scream that Cook emitted sent William scampering up to his room in utter terror. It's gone up, plunging into Master William's room. Oh, the brute! Oh, thank heaven the little darlin's out playing. Oh, mum, the cunning brutes have shut the door. Oh, my, it turned me inside out, it did. Oh, I daresn't go up and lock it in, but that's what ought to be done. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get someone with a gun, said Mrs. Brown weakly. Oh, we, uh, oh, here's the master. Mr. Brown entered as she spoke. I've got terrible news for you, he said. Mrs. Brown burst into tears. Oh, John, nothing could be worse than, than that. John, it's upstairs. Do get a gun in William's room. And oh, my goodness, suppose he's there. Suppose it's mangling him. Do go. Mr. Brown sat calmly in his chair. William, he said, has eloped with a jeune premier and a bearskin. An entire Christmas pantomime is searching the village for him. They've spent the afternoon searching the wood, and now they are searching the village. Father Christmas is drinking ale in a pub. He discovered that William had paid it a visit. A fairy queen is sitting outside the pub, complaining of toothache, and Goldilocks' mother is complimenting the vicar on the rural beauty of his village, in the intervals of weeping over the loss of her daughter. I gathered that William had visited the vicarage. There's a giant complaining of the cold, and a man in his shirt sleeves, whose language is turning the air blue for miles around. I was coming up from the station, and was introduced to them as William's father. I had some difficulty in calming them, but I promised to do what I could to find the missing pair. I'm rather keen on finding William. I don't think I can do better than hand him over to them for a few minutes. As for the missing damsel, Mrs. Brown found her voice. Do you mean, she gasped feebly, do you mean that it was William all the time? Mr. Brown rose wearily. Of course, he said, isn't everything always William, all the time? End of chapter 4「William the Fourth by Rickmall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter five Aunt Jane's Treat William was blessed with many relations, though blessed is not quite the word he would have used himself. They seemed to appear and disappear and reappear in spasmodic succession throughout the year. He never could keep count of them. Most of them he despised, some he actually disliked. The latter class reciprocated his feelings fervently. Great Aunt Jane was one he had never seen, and so he suspended judgment on her. But he rather liked the sound of her name. He received the news that she was coming to stay over Christmas with indifference. All right, he said, I don't care. She may come if she wants to. She came. She was tall and angular and precise. She received William's scowling greeting with a smile. "'Best wishes of this festive season, William,' she murmured. William looked at her scornfully. "'All right,' he murmured. However, his opinion of her rose the next morning. "'I'd like to give you some treat, William, dear,' she said at breakfast, "'to mark the festive season, something quiet and orderly, as I don't approve of merrymaking.' William looked at her kind, weak face, with the spectacles and scraped-back hair, and sighed. 
he thought that aunt jane would be enough to dispel the hilarity of any event great aunt jane's father had been a plymouth brother and great aunt jane had been brought up to disbelieve in pleasure except as a potent aid of the devil william asked for a day in which to choose the treat he discussed it with his friends well advised ginger you jolly well order to something she can't muck up like when my aunt took me to a messy old museum and showed me stones and things no animals nor nothin what about the zoo said henry the zoo was suggested to great aunt jane but she shuddered slightly i don't think i could she said it's so dangerous i always feel those bars look so fragile i should never forgive myself if little william were mangled by wild beasts when in my care william sighed and called his friends together again she won't go to the zoo said william something or other about bars and mangles well what about masculines and devons said henry my uncle took me once it's all magic william much cheered at the prospect suggested masculines that evening aunt jane thought it over for some time and then shook her head no dear she said i feel that these illusions aren't quite honest they pretend to do something they really couldn't do and it practically amounts to falsehood they deceive the eye and all deceit is wrong william groaned and returned to his advisory council she's awful he said gloomily she's cracky i think they discussed the matter again douglas had seen a notice of a fair as he came along try that he said there's merry-go-rounds and shows and coconut shies and all sorts it ought to be all right that evening william suggested a fair aunt jane looked frightened what exactly happens in a fair she said earnestly william had learnt tact oh he said you just walk around and look at things what sort of things do you look at said aunt jane oh just stalls of gingerbreads and lemonade it sounded harmless aunt jane's face cleared very well she said of course i could stand outside while you walked around but upon investigation it appeared that william's parents had not that perfect trust in william that william seemed to think was his due and objected strongly to william's walking round by himself so aunt jane steeled herself to dally openly with the evil power of pleasure-making we can be quite quick she said and it doesn't sound very bad william reported progress to his counsel it's all right he said cheerfully the old loony's going to the fair then his cheerfulness departed though when you come to think of it he said it jolly well won't be much fun for me well said ginger suppose we all try to go there the same time we can leave your old aunt jane somewhere and go off can't we william brightened that sounds better he said i guess she'll be quite easy to leave aunt jane was so nervous that she did not sleep at all on the night before the day arranged for the treat never before in her blameless life had aunt jane deliberately entered a place of entertainment i do hope she murmured on the threshold holding william firmly by the hand that there's nothing really wrong in it she was dressed in a long and voluminous black skirt a long and voluminous black coat and a small black hat adorned with black ears of wheat perched upon her prim little head inside she stopped bewildered the glaring lights the noise the shouting seemed to be drawing aunt jane's eyes out of her sockets and through her large round spectacles it isn't a bit what i thought william she said i imagine just stalls just quiet plain stalls why are they throwing balls about william it's a coconut shy said william can can anyone do it said aunt jane anyone can try said william if they pay tuppence and what happens if they knock it off they get the coconut exclaimed william loftily i i, I wonder if it's very difficult mused aunt jane at this moment a well-aimed ball sent a coconut rolling in the sawdust aunt jane gave a little scream oh he did he did it she cried I i'd love to try there there can't be anything wrong in it with trembling fingers she handed the man tuppence and took the three wooden balls 
a sudden hush of astonishment fell on the crowd when aunt jane's curious figure came to the fore at the first throw she shook her hat crooked at the second she shook a tail of hair down at the third she shook off her spectacles the third ball went wider of the mark than all the others and hit a young man on the shoulder seeing aunt jane however he only smiled she demanded another two pennyworth the bystanders cheered her loudly the crowd round the coconut shy stall grew people from afar thought it was an accident and crowded up to watch then they saw aunt jane and stayed at last after her sixth shot aunt jane flushed and panting and dishevelled turned to william it's much more difficult than it looks william she said regretfully as she straightened her hat and hair i would have liked to have knocked one off what about me said william coldly oh yes she said you must try to so she paid another tuppence and william tried too but the crowd began to melt away at once and even the proprietor began to look bored william realized that he was an anticlimax and felt dispirited you should use more force i think william said aunt jane and more directness of aim william growled well you didn't do it he said aggressively no said aunt jane but, but i think with practice here william was cheered by the sight of henry and douglas and ginger who had all managed to evade lawful authority and come to the help of william they had decided to hide from aunt jane and then abscond with william but aunt jane hardly saw them she hurried on ahead her cheeks flushed her eyes alight and her prim little hat awry it has she said a decidedly inspiriting effect the light and music and crowds decidedly inspiriting she halted before a roundabout i wonder if it's enjoyable she said musingly the circular motion of course might be monotonous however she decided to try it she paid for william and douglas and henry and ginger and herself and mounted a giant cock it began she clung on for dear life it went faster and faster there came a gleam into her eyes a smile of rapture to her lips again the crowd gathered to watch her she looked at the people as the roundabout slowed down how happy they all look she said innocently it's quite a pleasant motion isn't it it seems a pity to get off she stayed on clinging convulsively to the pole with one elastic sided boot waving wildly she stayed on yet again she seemed to find the circular motion anything but monotonous it seemed to give her a joy that all her blameless life had so far failed to produce william and ginger had to climb down pale and rather unsteady henry and douglas followed their example the next time it stopped but still aunt jane stayed on smiling blissfully her hat dangling over one ear and still the crowd at the roundabout grew the rest of the fair ground was comparatively empty all the fun of the fair was centered on aunt jane at last she descended from her mount and joined the rather depressed-looking group of boys who were her escort it's curious she said how much pleasanter is a circular motion than a straight one this is much more exhilarating than say a train journey and of course the music adds to the pleasantness well said william you jolly well stayed on it seemed she said quite a pity to get off the little party moved from the roundabout followed by most of the crowd the crowd liked aunt jane they wouldn't have lost sight of her for anything aunt jane for the first time in her life appealed to the british public william and his friends felt themselves to be in a curious position they had meant to leave aunt jane to her fate and go off to their own devices but it did not seem possible to leave aunt jane because everything seemed to center round aunt jane and they would only have been at the back of the crowd instead of at the front but they felt that their position as escort of aunt jane was not a dignified one moreover their feats drew forth none of the applause which aunt jane's feats drew forth they felt neglected by the world in general 
aunt jane was next attracted by the poster of the fat woman outside one of the tents she fixed her spectacles sternly and approached the man who was crying the charms of the damsel surely that picture is a gross exaggeration my good man she said exaggeration he repeated it ain't arf the truth that's what it end it ain't arf the truth we we couldn't get her on the picture if we made her as big as what she is exaggeration why she's a walking mountain that's what she is a regular walking mountain come on and see her come in and judge for yourselves just come in and see if what i'm telling you isn't gospel somehow or other they were swept in aunt jane sat on the front seat she gazed intently upon the fat woman who sat at her ease upon a small platform she seems said aunt jane unnaturally large certainly the showman discoursed upon the size of the fat woman and then invited the audience to draw near touch her if you want he said touch her and see she's real no deception aunt jane drew near with the rest and accosted the showman has she ever tried any of those fat reducing foods she said the man looked at william is she batty he said simply if you'll give me her address i'll talk to my doctor about her i think something might be done to make her less abnormal at this the walking mountain rose threateningly from her gilded couch here she said who are you calling names of you tell me that who are you a givin a your thoughts to you strike to me straight art if you wants to and i'll talk to you back not arf don't go a hurlin of your insults at me through him my young man he'll talk to you na if you wants er young man he is the strong man in the next tent explained the man they're fiancés they are and he's the devil and all to tackle he is i'd advise her as friend to friend to clear before she calls of him but aunt jane the imitation wheat in her hat trembling with emotion was already clearing they quite misunderstood she said as soon as she had cleared the word abnormal conveys no insult surely i think i'll return and explain i'll refer them to the dictionary and the derivation of the word it simply means something outside the usual rule if she was returning eagerly to the tent to explain but found the entrance blocked by a crowd so she was persuaded to postpone her explanation moreover she had caught sight of the hoopla and was anxious to have the system explained to her william wearily explained it oh i see said aunt jane a test of dexterity and accuracy of aim shall we uh, shall we try they tried they tried till william was tired she had determined to get something or die the crowd was gathering again they applauded her efforts aunt jane was too short-sighted to notice the crowd but she heard its shouts isn't everyone encouraging she murmured to william it's most gratifying it's really a very pleasant place she actually did get something one of her wildly flung hoops fell over a tie pin of the extremely flashy variety which she received with a glowing pride and handed to william the crowd cheered but aunt jane was quite oblivious of the crowd come along she said let's do something else ginger disconsolately announced his intention of going home henry and douglas followed his example and william was left alone to escort aunt jane through the mazes of the land of pleasure it was at this point that things really seemed to go to aunt jane's head she went down the helter-skelter four or five times sailing down on her little mat with squeaks of joy she forgot now to straighten her hat or her hair her eye gleamed with strange light her cheeks were flushed there's something quite rejuvenating about it all william she murmured she had her fortune told by a gypsy queen who prophesied an early marriage with one of her many suitors she went again on the roundabout she had another coconut shy she went on the switchback the ferry boat and the wild sea waves william trailed along behind her he refused to venture on the wild sea waves and watched her on them with a certain grudging admiration crumbs he murmured she must have got her inside of iron finally aunt jane espied a stall at a distance under a glaring gas flame a man in a white coat was pulling out long strings of soft candy aunt jane approached 
what an appetizing odor commented aunt jane do you think he's selling it william thought he was and the glorious climax of that strange night was the sight of aunt jane standing under the flaring gas jet devouring soft pull-out candy hullo here's the game old bird said a man passing i don't see any bird do you said aunt jane to william peering round with her short-sighted eyes but this is a very palatable confection is it not then a clock struck and into aunt jane's face came the look that cinderella must have worn when the clock struck twelve william she said that surely was not ten sounded like ten said william aunt jane put down her last stick of pull-out candy unfinished we uh, we ought to go she said weakly well said william's mother when they returned i do hope it wasn't too tiring for you aunt jane sat down on a chair and thought she thought over the evening no she couldn't really have done all that have seen all that it was impossible quite impossible it must be imagination she must have seen someone else doing all these things she must have gone quietly round with william and watched him enjoy himself of course that was all she'd done it must have been the other was unthinkable so she smiled a patient weary little smile well of course she said i'm a little tired but i think william enjoyed it End of chapter five Chapter six of William the Fourth by Rick Mall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter six Kidnappers. There was quite a flutter in the village when the Darcys came to the Grange. A branch of the Darcy family, you know. Lord Darcy and Lady Darcy and Lady Barbara Darcy. Lady Barbara was seven years of age. She was fair, frilly, fascinating lady darcy engaged a dancing master to come down from london once a week to teach her dancing they invited several of the children of the village to join they invited william his mother was delighted but william freckled untidy and seldom clean was horrified to the depth of his soul no entreaties or threats could move him he said he didn't care what they did to him he said they could kill him if they liked it he said he'd rather be killed than go to an old dancing class anyway with that soft-looking kid well he didn't care who her father was she was a soft-looking kid and he wasn't going to no dancing class with her wildly ignoring the rules that govern the uses of the negative he frequently reiterated that he wasn't going to no dancing class with her he wouldn't be seen speaking to her much less dancing with her his mother almost wept you see she explained to ethel william's grown-up sister it puts us at a sort of disadvantage and lady darcy is so nice and it's so kind of them to ask william william's sister however took a wholly different view of the matter it might put them she said a good deal more against us if william went william's mother admitted that there was something in that william lay in the loft reclining at length on his front his chin resting on his hands he was engaged in reading on one side of him stood a bottle of liquorish water which he had made himself on the other was a large slab of cake which he had stolen from the larder on his freckled face was the look of scowling ferocity that it always wore in any mental effort the fact that his jaws had ceased to work though the cake was yet unfinished testified to the enthralling interest of the story he was reading black-hearted dick dragged the fair maid by the wrist to the captain's cave a bottle of grog stood at the captain's right hand the captain slipped a mask over his eyes and smiled a sinister smile he twirled his long black mustachios with his hand unhand the maiden dog he said then he swept her a stately bow fair maid he said unless thy father bring me sixty thousand crowns to-night thy doom is sealed thou shalt swing from yon lone pine tree the maiden gave a piercing scream then she looked closely at the mask face who who art thou she faltered again the captain's sinister smile flickered beneath the mask rudolph of the red hand he said 
at these terrible words the maiden swooned into the arms of black-hearted dick aha said the grim rudolph with a sneer no man lives who does not tremble at those words and again that smile curved his dread lips as he looked at the yet unconscious maiden for well he knew that the sixty thousand crowns would be his that even let her be treated with all courtesy till to-night he said as he turned away william heaved a deep sigh and took a long draught of licorice water it seemed an easy and wholly delightful way of earning money they're awfully nice people said ethel the next day at breakfast and it is so kind of them to ask us to tea very said mrs brown and they say bring the little boy the little boy looked up with the sinister smile he had been practising me he said ah -ha! he wished he had a mask because though he felt he could manage the smile quite well the narrative had said nothing about the expression of the upper part of rudolph of the red hand's face however he felt that his customary scowl would do quite well you'll come dear won't you said mrs brown sweetly i wouldn't make him said ethel nervously you know what he's like sometimes mrs brown knew william a mute scowling protest was no ornament to a drawing-room but wouldn't you like to meet the little girl said mrs brown persuasively ma ha ejaculated william the monosyllable looks weak and meaningless in print as william pronounced it it was pregnant with scorn and derision and sinister meaning he curled imaginary mustachios as he uttered it he looked round upon his assembled family then he uttered the monosyllable again with a yet more sinister smile and scowl he wondered if rudolph the red hand had a mother who tried to make him go out to tea he decided that he probably hadn't life would be much simpler if you hadn't with another short sharp ha he left the room william sat on an old packing case in a disused barn before him stood ginger who shared the same classroom in school and pursued much the same occupations and recreations out of school they were not a popular couple in the neighborhood william was wearing a mask the story had not stated what sort of a mask rudolph of the red hand had worn but william supposed it was an ordinary sort of mask he had one that he'd bought last fifth of november and it seemed a pity to waste it moreover it had the advantage of having mustachios attached it covered his nose and cheeks leaving holes for his eyes it represented fat red smiling cheeks an enormous red nose and fluffy gray whiskers william on looking at himself in the glass had felt a slight misgiving it had been appropriate to the festive season of november the fifth but he wondered whether it was sufficiently sinister to represent rudolph of the red hand however it was a mask and he could turn his lips into a sinister smile under it and that was the main thing he had definitely and finally embraced a career of crime on the table before him stood a bottle of licorice water with an irregularly printed label grog he looked round at his brave black-hearted dick he said your goddard stay present it was rather vague as to how outlaws opened their meetings but this seemed the obvious way present said ginger that's not much fun and it's all going to be like school well it's not said william firmly and you can have a drink of grog only one swallow he added anxiously as he saw black-hearted dick throwing his head well back preparatory to the draught that was a jolly big one he said torn between admiration at the feet and annoyance at the disappearance of his licorice water all right said ginger modestly i've got her big throat well what we going to do first william adjusted his mask which was not a very good fit and performed the sinister smile we got her kidnap someone first he said well who said ginger someone who can pay us money for em well who said ginger irritably william took a deep draught of licorice water well you can think of someone 
i like that said ginger in tones of deep dissatisfaction i like that you set up to be captain and wear that thing and drink up all the licorice water grog william corrected him wearily well grog and then you don't know who we're gonna kidnap i like that might as well be rat hunting or catching tadpoles or chasing cats if you don't know what we're gonna do william snorted and smiled sneeringly beneath his bilious-looking mask ah he said you come with me and i'll find someone for you to kidnap right enough ginger cheered up at this news and william took another draught of licorice water then he hung up his mask behind the barn door and took out of his pocket a battered penknife we may want arms he said keep your dagger handy he pulled his school cap low down over his eyes ginger did the same then looked at the one broken blade of his penknife i don't think mine would kill anyone he said does it matter you'll have to knock yours on the head with something said rudolph of the red hand grimly you know we may be imprisoned or hung or something for this rather said ginger with the true spirit of the bravado and i don't care they tramped across the fields in silence william leading in spite of his occasional exasperation ginger had infinite trust in william's capacity for attracting adventure they walked down the road and across a stile the stile led to a field that bordered the grange suddenly they stopped a small white figure was crawling through a gap in the hedge from the park into the field william had come out with no definite aim but he began to think that fortune had placed in his way a tempting prize he turned round to his follower with a resonant shh scowled at him placed his finger on his lips twirled imaginary mustachios and pulled his cap low over his eyes through the trees inside the park he could just see the figure of a nurse on a seat leaning against a tree trunk in an attitude of repose suddenly lady barbara looked up and espied william's fiercely scowling face she put out her tongue william's scowl deepened she glanced towards her nurse on the other side of the hedge her nurse still slumbered and then she accosted william well funny boy she whispered rudolph of the red hand froze her with a glance quick he said seize the maiden and run with a dramatic gesture he seized the maiden by one hand and ginger seized the other the maiden was not hard to seize she ran along with little squeals of joy oh what fun what fun she said inside the barn william closed the door and sat at his packing case he took a deep draught of licorice water and then put on his mask his victim gave a wild scream of delight and clapped her hands oh funny boy she said william was annoyed it's not funny he said irritably it's jolly well not funny you're kidnapped that's what you are unhand the maiden dog he said to ginger ginger was looking rather sulky all right i'm not handing her he said and when you've quite finished with the licorice water grog corrected william sternly well grog then and i out to make it perhaps you'll let me have a drink william handed him the bottle with a flourish finish it dog he said with a short scornful laugh the vibration of the short scornful laugh caused his bacchic mask never very secure to fall off on to the packing case lady barbara gave another scream of ecstasy oh do it again boy she said william glanced at her coldly and put on the mask again and then he swept her a stately bow holding on to his mask with one hand fair maid he said unless thy father bring me sixty thousand crowns by to-night thy doom is sealed thou shalt swing from yon lone pine he pointed dramatically out of the window to a diminutive hawthorn hedge the captive whirled round on one foot fair curls flying oh he's going to make me a swing nice boy william rose majestic and stately still cautiously holding his mask my name he said is rudolph of the red hand well i'll kiss you dear rudolph hand she said 
if you like william's look intimated that he did not like oh you're shy said lady barbara delightedly let her be treated william said with all courtesy till this even well said ginger that's all right but what we gonna do with her william glanced disapprovingly at the maiden who had turned the packing case upside down and was sitting in it well what we going to do said ginger it's not much fun so far well we just gotta wait till her people send the money well how are they going to know we got her and where she is and how much we want william considered this aspect of the matter had not struck him well he said at last i suppose you'd better go and tell him you can said ginger you'd better go said william cause i'm chief well if you're chief said ginger you are to go the kidnapped one emitted a shrill scream i'm a train she said shuk, 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 shuk. she's not acting right said william severely she ought to be fainting or something how much do we want for her sixty thousand crowns said william all right said ginger i'll stay and see she don't get away and you go and tell her people and don't tell anyone but her father and mother or they'll go getting the money themselves william hung up his mask behind the door and turned to ginger assuming the scowl and attitude of rudolph of the red hand all right he said i'll go into the jaws of death and you treat her with all courtesy till even who's going to curtsy said ginger indignantly you don't understand book talk said william scornfully he bowed low to the maiden who was still playing at trains rudolph of the red hand he said slowly with a sinister smile the effect was disappointing she blew him a kiss darlin rudolph she said william stalked majestically across the fields towards the grange with one hand inside his coat in the attitude of napoleon on the deck of the bellerophon he went slowly up the drive and up the broad stone steps then he rang the bell he rang it with the mighty force with which rudolph of the red hand would have rung it it pealed frantically in distant regions an indignant footman opened the door i wish to speak to the master of the house on a life or death matter said william importantly he had thought out that phrase on the way up the footman looked him up and down he looked him up and down as if he didn't like him oh do you he said and ere you aware as you nearly broke our front doorbell the echoes of the bell were just beginning to die away rudolph of the red hand folded his arms and emitted a short sharp laugh his lordship said the footman preparing to close the door is out his wife would do then said rudolph just tell her it's a life and death matter her ladyship said the footman is engaged in any more of your practical jokes here my lad and you'll hear of it he shut the door in william's face william wandered round the house and looked in several of the windows he had a lively encounter with a gardener and finally on peeping into the kitchen regions with a scornful laugh was chased off the premises by the infuriated footman saddened but not defeated he returned across the fields to the barn and flung open the door ginger panting and perspiring was dragging the lady barbara in the packing case round and round the barn by a piece of rope he turned a frowning face to william a life of crime was proving less exciting than he had expected well where's the money he said wiping his brow she's just about wore me out she won't let me stop dragging this thing about and she keeps worrying saying you promised her a swing he did said the kidnapped one shrilly well where's the money repeated ginger i've just about had enough of kidnapping i couldn't get the money said william i couldn't make em listen properly let's change and me stay here and you go and get the money all right said ginger i wouldn't mind changing to do anything from this what shall i say to em you'd better say you must speak to em on life and death i said that but they kind of didn't listen they'll perhaps listen to you well i jolly well don't mind going said ginger she's a wearing kid he went out and shut the door put the funny thing on your face ordered lady barbara it's not funny said william coldly as he adjusted the mask she danced around him clapping her hands dear funny boy and now make me the swing i'm not going to make you no swing said william firmly 
if you don't make me a swing she said i'll sit down and i'll scream and scream till i burst she began to grow red in the face there's no rope said william hastily she pointed to a coil of old rope in a dark corner of the barn that's rope silly she said he took it out and began to look round for a suitable and low enough tree be quick ordered his victim at last he had the rope tied up now lift me in now swing me go on more 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 nice funny boy she kept him at it for about half an hour and then she demanded to be dragged round the barn in the packing case go on she said quicker quicker the fine manly spirit of rudolph of the red hand was almost broken he began to look weary and disconsolate when ginger returned lady barbara was wearing the mask and chasing william go on she said then to be frightened then to be frightened go on william turned to ginger well he said ginger looked rather dishevelled his collar was torn away you might a told me he said indignantly what said william go on said lady barbara that they were like wild beasts up there they set on me soon as i said what you told me well did you get any money said william now how could i said ginger irritably when they set on me like wild beasts soon as i said it go on said lady barbara well said rudolph of the red hand slowly i'm just about fed up and you couldn't be fed upper than i am replied his gallant brave well let's chuck it said william it's getting tea time and we've got no money and i'm not going for it again nor am i said ginger fervently and i'm fed up with this kid so am i said ginger still more fervently well let's chuck it he turned to lady barbara you can go home he said her face fell i don't want to go home she said i'm going to stay with you always and always well you're not said william shortly cause we're going home so there he set off with ginger across the fields the kidnapped one ran lightly beside them i'm going where you go she said i like you they felt that her presence would be difficult to explain to their parents dejectedly they returned to the barn i'll go and see if i can see any one looking for her said william get down on your hands and knees and let me ride on your back shouted lady barbara ginger wearily obeyed william went out to the road and looked up it and down there was no one there except a man walking in the direction of the grange he smiled at the expression on william's face hello he said feeling sick or lost something we kidnapped a kid said william disconsolately and we couldn't get any money for her and we can't get rid of her the man threw back his head and laughed awkward he said by jove jolly awkward i suppose you'll have to take her home he was no use william turned back to the barn lady barbara was riding round the barn on ginger's back go on she said quicker ginger turned a purple and desperate face to william if you don't do something soon he said i shall probably go mad and kill someone we'll have to take her back said william grimly the kidnappers walked in gloomy silence the kidnapped danced along between them holding a hand of each i'm going wherever you go she said i love you once ginger spoke you're a nice kidnapper he said bitterly i couldn't help it said william it all went different in the book near the steps of the front door a lady was standing ginger turned and fled at the sight of her lady barbara held william's hand fast william hesitated till flight was impossible oh there you are darling the lady said dear nice boy said lady barbara he's been playing with me all the time and the other oh but the other's gone it's been lovely i do love him may we keep him darling said the lady i've only just heard you were lost nanny's in a dreadful state and this little boy found you and took care of you dear little boy she bent down and kissed the outraged and horrified william how very kind of you to look after my little girl and bring her back so nicely now come and have some tea she led william too broken in spirit to resist up the steps into the hall then into a room lady barbara still held his hand tightly there was tea in the room and people 
horror of horrors it was his mother and ethel there were confused explanations and her nurse went to sleep and she must have wandered off and got lost and your little boy found her and played with her and looked after her and brought her back for tea dear little man a man entered the man who had accosted william on the road he was evidently the father of the little girl the story was repeated to him great he said looking at william with amusement and a certain sympathy in his eyes he seemed to be enjoying the situation william glared at him and he rode me on his back and gave me rides in the box and made me a swing and put on a funny face to make me laugh dear little man crooned lady darcy they put him gently into a chesterfield and barbara sat beside him leaning against him nice boy she said mrs brown and ethel beamed proudly and he pretends said mrs brown not to like little girls we misjudge children so sometimes you'll go to the dancing class now won't you dear she ended archly dear little fellow said lady darcy it was only the fact that he had no weapon in his hand and that he had given up the unequal struggle against the malignancy of fate that saved william from murder on a wholesale scale barbara smiled on him fondly barbara's mother smiled on him tenderly his mother and sister smiled on him proudly and in their midst rudolph of the red hand with rage and shame and humiliation in his heart savagely ate his sugared cake End of chapter 6chapter seven of william the fourth by rickmall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven william's evening out william's family had come up to london for a holiday they had brought william with them chiefly because it was not safe to leave william behind william was not the sort of boy who could be trusted to live a quiet and blameless life at home in the absence of his parents he had many noble qualities but he had not that one so william gloomily and reluctantly accompanied his family to london william's elder sister and mother lived in a whirl of shopping and theatres william's elder brother went every day to see a county cricket match and returned in a state of frenzied excitement to discuss the play and players all the evening without the slightest encouragement from any one william's father foregathered with old cronies at his club or slept in the hotel smoking-room it was open to william to accompany any of the members of his family he might shop and attend matinees with his mother and ethel he might go on sufferance to watch cricket matches with robert or he might sleep in the smoking-room with his father he was encouraged by each of them to join some other member of the family and he occasionally managed to evade them all and spend the afternoon sliding down the banisters till firmly but politely checked by the manager of the hotel watching for any temporary absence of the liftman during which he might try to manipulate the machine itself or contending with the most impudent-looking page-boy in a silent and furtive rivalry in grimaces. But in spite of this, he was supremely bored. He regarded the centre of the British Empire with contempt. Streets, he said with devastating scorn, at the end of his first day here. Shops! Ugh! William's soul pined for the fields and lanes and woods of his home for his band of boon companions with whom he was wont to wrestle and fight and trespass and plot daredevil schemes and set the world at defiance for the irate farmers who helped to supply that spice of danger and excitement without which life to william and his friends was unendurable he took his london pleasure sadly oh history he remarked coldly when they escorted him round westminster abbey his only comment on being shown the tower was that it seemed to be taking up the whole day not that there was much else to do anyway his soul yearned for the society of his own kind the son of his mother's cousin who lived near had come to see him one day he was a tall pale boy who asked william if he could fox-trot and if he didn't adore axel haig's etchings and if he didn't prefer paris to london 
the conversation was an unsatisfactory one and acquaintance did not ripen but accompanying his family on various shortcuts in the back streets of london he had glimpsed another world a world of street urchins who fought and wrestled and gave vent to piercing whistles and hung on to the backs of carts and paddled in the gutter and rang front doorbells and fled from policemen he watched it wistfully socially his tastes were not high all he demanded from life was danger and excitement and movement and the society of his own kind he liked boys crowds of boys boys who shouted and whistled and ran and courted danger boys who had never heard of any silly old etchings as he followed his family with his air of patient martyrdom on all their expeditions it was the glimpse of this underworld alone that would lift the shadow from his furrowed brow and bring a light to his stern freckled countenance there were times when he stopped and tried to get into contact with it but it was not successful his mother's come along william don't speak to those horrid little boys always recalled him to the blameless and appalling respectability of his own family yet even before that hateful cry interrupted him he knew that it was useless he was an alien being a clean little boy in a neat suit with a fashionable mother and sister he was beyond the pale an outsider a pariah a creature to be mocked and jeered at the position galled william he was by instinct on the side of the lawless the anti-respectable his spirits rose as the time for his return to the country approached yet there was a wistful longing in his heart for the boy world of london still unexplored as well as a fierce contempt for the london his parents had revealed to him william had been invited to a party on his last evening in london william's mother's cousin lived in kensington and had invited william to a little gathering of her children's friends william did not wish to go to the party what is more william did not intend to go to the party but a wonderful plan had come into william's head it's very kind of her he said meekly yes i'll be very pleased to go that was unlike william's usual manner of receiving an invitation to a party generally there were expostulations indignation assertion of complete incapacity to go to anything that particular night william's mother looked at him you uh, you feel all right don't you dear she said anxiously oh yes said william and i feel i'll just like a party you can wear your eaton suit said mrs brown oh yes said william i'd like that william's face was quite expressionless as he spoke mrs brown pinched herself to make sure that she was awake i expect they'll have music and dancing and that sort of thing she said she thought perhaps that william had misunderstood the kind of party it would be william's expressionless face did not change oh yes he said pleasantly music and dancing will be fine when mr brown was told of the invitation he groaned and i suppose it will take the whole day to make him go he said no said mrs brown eagerly that's the strange part he seems to want to go he really does and he seems to want to wear his eaton suit and you know what a bother that used to be i suppose he's beginning to take a pride in his appearance i think london must be civilizing him well said mr brown dryly i suppose you know best i suppose miracles do happen when the evening of the party arrived there was some difficulty as to the transit of william to his place of entertainment the house was so near to the hotel where the browns were staying that a taxi seemed hardly worth while but there was a general reluctance to be his escort ethel was going to a theatre and robert had been out all day and thought he deserved a bit of rest in the evening instead of carting kids about mrs brown's rheumatism had come on again and mr brown wanted to read the evening paper william sleek and smooth and brushed and encased in his eaton suit his freckled face shining with cleanliness and virtue broke meekly into the discussion i know the way mother can't i just go myself mrs brown wavered oh, i don't see why not she said at last if you think that boy can walk three yards by himself without getting into mischief began mr brown william turned innocent reproachful eyes upon him 
oh but look at him said mrs brown and it isn't as if he didn't want to go to the party you want to go don't you dear yes mother said william meekly his father threw him a keen glance well of course he said returning to his paper do as you like i'm certainly not going with him myself but don't blame me if he blows up the houses of parliament or damns the thames or pulls down nelson's monument william's sorrowful wistful glance was turned again upon his father i won't do any of those things i promise father he said solemnly i don't see why he shouldn't go alone said mrs brown it's not far and he's sure to be good because he's looking forward to it so aren't you william yes mother said william with his most inscrutable expression so he went alone william set off briskly down the street a neat figure in an eaton suit an overcoat a well-fitting cap and patent leather shoes his expression had relaxed as soon as the scrutiny of his family was withdrawn it became expectant and determined once out of the sight of possible watchers from the hotel he turned off the road that led to his mother's cousin's house and walked purposely down a side street and thence to another side street there they were he knew they would be there boys boys after william's own heart dirty boys shouting boys whistling boys fighting boys william approached at his own home he would have been acclaimed at once as a leader of any lawless horde but here he was not known his present appearance moreover brushed hair evening clothes clean face was against him to them he was a thing taboo they turned on him with delightful yells of scorn yeah where's your mammy look at his shoes boo isn't his hair brushed nice yeah boo gone the tallest of them snatched william's cap from his head and ran off with it the snatching of a boy's cap from his head is a deadly insult william whose one wistful desire was to be friends with his new acquaintances yet had his dignity to maintain he flew after the boy and caught him by the back of his neck and then they closed the rest of the tribe stood round them in a ring giving advice and encouragement their contempt for william vanished for william was a good fighter he lost his collar and acquired a black eye and his hair in the exhilaration of the contest recovered from its recent severe brushing and returned to its favourite vertical angle the two were fairly well matched and the fight was a most satisfactory one till the cry of cops brought it to an abrupt end and the crowd of boys with william now in the middle fled precipitately down another street when they were at a safe distance from the blue helmet they stopped and the large boy handed william his cap here you are he said with a certain respect william with a careless gesture tossed the cap into the air don't want it he said what's your name william he's called bill said the boy to the others william read in their faces a growing interest not quite friendship yet but still not quite contempt he glowed with pride he put his hands into the pockets of his overcoat and there met a sixpence joy what's your name he said to his late adversary herb said the other still staring at william with interest come on herb said william jauntily let's buy some sweets eh he entered a small unsavouring sweet shop and the whole tribe crowded in after him he and herb discussed the rival merits of bull's eyes and cockernut kisses at length them lars is longer said herb but these are taste nicer finally william airily tasted one of the cockernut kisses and the whole tribe followed his example to be chased by the indignant shopkeeper all the way down the street eatin of em he shouted furiously eatin of em without payin for em i'll set the cops on you ye young thieves they rushed along the next street shouting whistling and pushing each other william's whistle was louder than any he ran the foremost the lust of lawlessness was growing on him they swarmed in at the next sweet shop and william purchased six pennyworth of bull's eyes and poured them recklessly out of the bag into the grimy outstretched palms that surrounded him 
William had no idea where he was. His hands were as grimy as the hands of his companions, his face was streaked with dirt wherever his hands had touched it, his eye was black, his collar was gone, his hair was wild, his overcoat had lost its look of tailored freshness, and he was happy at last. He was no longer a little gentleman staying at a select hotel with his family. He was a boy among boys, an outlaw among outlaws once more. He was no longer a pariah. He had proved his valor in fighting and running and whistling. He was almost accepted, not quite. He was alight with exhilaration. In the next street, a watering cart had just passed, and there was a broad, muddy stream flowing along the gutter. With a whoop of joy, the tribe made for it. Herb at the head, closely followed by William. William's patent leather shoes began to lose their damning smartness. It was William who began to stamp as he walked, and the rest at once followed suit. Splashing, shouting, whistling, jostling, they followed the muddy stream through street after street. At every corner, William seemed to shed yet another portion of the nice equipment of the boy who's going to a party. No party would have claimed him now, no hostess greeted him, no housemaid admitted him. He had completely burned his boats. But he was happy. All good things come to an end, however, even a muddy stream in a gutter, and Herb, a still leader, called out, Come on, you chaps, come on, Bill, bells! Along both sides of a street they flew at breakneck speed, pulling every bell as they passed. Three enraged householders pursued them. One of them, fleeter than the other two, caught the smallest and slowest of the tribe and began to execute corporal punishment. It was William who returned, charged from behind, left the householder winded in the gutter, and dragged the yelling scapegoat to the shelter of his tribe. "'Good old Bill,' said Herb, and William's heart swelled again with pride. Nothing on earth would now have checked his victorious career. A motor van passed with another gang of street urchins hanging on merrily behind. With a yell of battle, William hurled himself upon them, struggled with them in mid-air, and established himself, cheering on his own tribe and pushing off the others. In the fight, William lost his overcoat. His Eton coat was torn from top to bottom, and his waistcoat ripped open. But his tribe won the day. The rival tribe dropped off, hurling ineffectual taunts and insults, and on sailed William and his gang, half running, half riding, with an exhilarating mixture of physical exercise and joy-riding unknown to the more law-abiding citizen. And in the midst was William, William serene and triumphant, William dirty and ragged, William acclaimed leader at last, the motor van put on speed, there was a ride of pure breathless joy and peril before, at last exhausted, they dropped off. Then Herb turned to William. What you doing tonight, mate? he said. Mate? William's heart glowed. Nothing, mate, answered William carelessly. Oh, I'm going to the pictures, said Herb. If you like to help my old woman with the coffee stalls, you'll give her a tanner. A coffee stall? Oh, joy, was the magic of this evening inexhaustible. I'll oh, help her, oh, all right, mate, said William, making an effort to acquire his new friend's accent and intonation. I'll oh, type her near up to it, said Herb, and to the gang. Now you are all home, kids. Me and Bill is busy. He gave William a piece of chewing gum, which William proudly took and chewed and swallowed, and led him to a street corner from where a coffee stall could be seen in a glare of flaming oil jets. You just say Herb sent me, and you bet you'll get a tanner when she shuts up, if she's not in a paddy. Go on. Good night. He fled, leaving William to approach the stall alone. A large, untidy woman regarded him with arms akimbo. I've come to help with a stall, said William, trying to speak with the purest of Cockney accent. Herb sent me. The woman regarded him with a hostile stare, still with arms akimbo. Oh, he did, did he? He's always ready to send someone else. He's gone to the pictures, I suppose. He's a nice son for a poor woman to have, and they larking about all day and going to pictures all night. And where do I come in? I ask you where do I come in? 
william feeling that some reply was expected said that he didn't know she looked him up and down her expression implied that her conclusions were far from complimentary and you i suppose one of the young devils a picked up from heaven knows where told her you'd get a tanner i suppose well you'll get a tanner if you behaves my likin and you'll get a box on the ears if you don't and come on do don't stand there all night ears a apron buns is a penny each and sandwiches a penny each and cups of corfy a penny each get a move on he was actually installed behind the counter he was actually covered from neck to foot in a white apron his rapture knew no bounds he served strong men with sandwiches and cups of coffee he dropped their pennies into the wooden till he gave change generally wrong he turned the handle of the fascinating urn he could not resist the handle of the little urn when there were no customers he turned the handle to see the little brown stream gush out in little spurts onto the floor or onto the counter his feeling of importance as he handed over buns and received pennies was indescribable he felt like a king like a god he had forgotten all about his family then the stout lady presented him with a bowl of hot water a dishcloth and a towel told him to wash up wash up he had never washed up before he swished the water round the bowl with the dishcloth very fast one way and then quickly changed and swished it round the other it was fascinating he lifted the dishcloth high out of the water and swirled a thin stream to and fro he soaked his apron and swamped the floor finally his patroness who had been indulging in a doze awoke and fixed eyes of horror upon him what you think you're a doin of she said indignantly you think you're at the seaside weren't you you think you've got your little bucket a spade don't you wastin a good water spoilin of a good apron where did herb find you i'd like to know picked you off a lunatic asylum i should say oh lummy here's tough's comin sharp now be ready with de burn and try and have a bit of sense and everything double price for toffs now don't forget but william with a sinking heart had recognized the toffs looking wildly round he saw a large cap presumably herbs on a lower shelf of the stall he seized it put it on and dragged it over his eye the toffs approached four of them one of them the elder lady seemed upset have you seen she said to the owner of the stall a little boy anywhere about a little boy in an eaton suit no ma'am said the proprietor i ain't seen no one in a eaton suit he was going out to a party went on mrs brown breathlessly and he must have got lost on the way they rang up to say he hadn't arrived and the police have had no news of him and we've traced him to this locality you uh, you haven't seen a little boy that looked as if he were going to a party no ma'am said the lady of the coffee stall i ain't seen no little boy going to no party this evening oh mother said ethel and william trying to hide his face between his cap brim and his apron groaned in spirit as he heard her voice do let's have some coffee now we're here ah oh, very well darling said mrs brown four cups of coffee please william still cowering under his cap poured them out and handed them over the counter you couldn't mistake him said mrs brown tearfully he had a nice blue overcoat over his eaton suit and a blue cap to match and patent leather shoes and he was so looking forward to the party i can't think how much said william's father to william tuppence each muttered william there was a horrible silence i beg your pardon said william's father suavely and william's heart sank tuppence each he muttered again there was another horrible silence may i trouble you went on william's father and from the deadly politeness of his tone william realized that all was over may i trouble you to remove your cap a moment something about your voice and the lower portion of your face reminds me of a near relative of mine but it was robert who snatched herb's cap from his head and stripped his apron from him and said you young devil and ethel who said goodness just look at his clothes and mrs brown who said oh my darling little william and i thought i'd lost you 
and the lady of the coffee stall who said well yer can have him for all he knows about washin up and william returned sad but unrepentant to the bosom of outraged respectability End of chapter seven chapter eight of william the fourth by rick mall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight william advertises a new sweet shop a mallard's by name had been opened in the village it had been the sensation of the week to william and his friends for it sold everything a halfpenny cheaper than mr moss it revolutionized the finances of the outlaws the outlaws was the secret society which comprised william and his friends ginger henry and douglas jumble william's disreputable mongrel was its mascot the outlaws patronized mallards generously on the first saturday of its career william spent his whole threepence there on separate halfpenny worths he insisted on the halfpenny worths he said firmly that mr moss always let him have halfpenny worths in the end the red-haired young woman behind the counter yielded to him she yielded reluctantly and scornfully she took no interest in his choice she asked him in a voice of bored contempt not to finger the edinburgh rock she muttered as she did up his package waste of paper and time never heard such nonsense papers indeed william went out of the shop placing his five-minute packets in already overfull pockets and keeping out the sixth for present consumption i'm not sure he said darkly to ginger and henry who accompanied him douglas was away from home i'm not sure as i'm ever going there again have a bull's eye i didn't like the way she looked at me nor spoke at me and i've a jolly good mind not to go to mallard's next saturday but it's cheap said ginger taking out his package have an aniseed ball and it's cheap that matters in a shop i should think well i don't know said william with an air of wisdom that's all i say i just don't know i just don't know that cheap's all that matters well what else matters you tell me that said henry crunching up a bull's-eye and an aniseed ball simultaneously and taking out his package have a pear drop you just tell me what matters besides cheap in a shop william perceiving that the general feeling was against him put another bull's-eye in his mouth and waxed irritable well don't talk about it so much he said you keep talkin and talkin then an argument occurred to him and he brought it out with triumph suppose any one was a murderer well what would cheap have to do with it suppose someone what had a shop murdered someone well i suppose if they was cheap you'd say it was all right eh? with an expression of intense scorn and amusement william put the last bull's-eye into his mouth threw away the paper and took out the treacle toffee well who's she murdered said ginger pugnaciously just cause she didn't want to give you a ha'porth you go on and say she's murdered someone well who she's murdered that's all you can't go callin folks murderers and not prove who they've murdered bring out who she's murdered that's all william was at the moment deeply engrossed in his treacle toffee the red-haired girl had given it an insufficient allowance of paper and to william's pocket it had lost even this and formed a deep attachment to a piece of putty which a friendly plumber had kindly given him the day before the piece of putty was at that moment the apple of william's eye he detached it gently from the toffee and examined it tenderly to make sure that it was not harmed finally he replaced it in his pocket and put the toffee in his mouth then he returned to the argument how can i bring out who she's murdered if she's murdered them that's a sensible thing to say isn't it if she's murdered them she's buried them do you think folks what murder folks leaves them about for other folks to bring out to show they've murdered them you've not got much sense that's all i say you don't know much about murders why do you keep talking about murderers if you don't know anything about em 
Ginger was growing slightly bewildered. Arguments with William often left him bewildered. He was inclined, on the whole, to think that perhaps William was right, and she had murdered someone. At this point, Jumbo created a diversion. Jumbo loved treacle toffee, and he had caught a whiff of the divine perfume. He sat up promptly to beg for some, but the outlaw's mascot was seldom lucky himself. He sat up on the very edge of a ditch, and William could not resist giving him a push. Jumbo picked himself out of the bottom of the ditch and shook off the water, grinning and wagging his tail. Jumbo was a sportsman. William had finished the treacle toffee, but Henry threw Jumbo an aniseed ball, which he licked, rolled with his paw, and abandoned, and which Henry then carefully put back with the others in his packet. Then William threw a stick for him, and the discussion of the red-haired girl's morals was definitely abandoned. At the corner of the road they espied Joan Crewe. Though fluffy and curled and exquisitely dressed herself, Joan admired William's roughness and untidiness. Hello, said Joan. Hello, said the outlaws. Have you been to Mallard's? asked Joan. Muff, said the outlaws. It's a halfpenny cheaper than moss. Yes, said Ginger, but William says she's a murderer. I didn't, said William irritably. You can't understand English. That's what's wrong with you. You can't understand English. What I said was, finding that he had entirely forgotten how the argument arose, he hastily changed the subject. What you going to do now, he said. Anything, said Joan obligingly. Have a coconut lump, said William, taking out his third bag. Have an aniseed ball, said Ginger. Have a pear drop, said Henry. Joan took one of each and took out a bag from her pocket. Have a licorice treasure, she said. Munching cheerfully, they walked along the road, stopping to throw a stick for Jumble every now and then. Jumble then performed his trick. His trick was to walk between William and Ginger, a paw in each of their hands. It was a trick that Jumble cordially detested. He generally managed to avoid it. The word trick generally sent him flying towards the horizon like an arrow from a bow. But this time he was hoping that William still had some treacle toffee concealed on his person and did not take to his heels in time. He was finally released with a kiss from Joan on the end of his nose. In joy at his freedom, he found a stick, worried it, ran after his tail, and finally darted down the road. "'Have a monkey nut?' said William. They partook of his last packet. "'I once heard a boy say,' said Henry solemnly, "'that people who eat monkey nuts get monkey puzzle trees growing out of their mouths.' "'I don't suppose,' said Ginger, as he swallowed his, that just a few could do it. Anyway, it would be rather interesting, said William, going about with a tree coming out of your mouth. You could slash things about with it. But think of the awful pain, said Henry dejectedly, roots growing inside your mouth. Joan handed her monkey nut back to William. I, uh, I don't think I'll have one. Uh, thank you, William, she said. All right, said William philosophically, cracking it and putting it into his mouth. I don't mind eating them. Let them start growing trees out of my mouth if they can. They were nearing a little old-fashioned sweet shop. A man in check trousers, shirt sleeves, and a white apron stood in the doorway. Generally, Mr. Moss radiated cheerfulness. Today, he looked depressed. They approached him somewhat guiltily. Well, he said, you coming to spend your Saturday money? Uh, no, said William. We've spent it, said Ginger. At Mallard's, said Henry. It's, it's a halfpenny cheaper, said Joan. Well, said Mr. Moss, I don't blame you. Mind, I don't blame you. You're quite right to go where it's a halfpenny cheaper. You'd be foolish if you didn't go where it's a halfpenny cheaper. But all I say is it's not fair on me. They're a big company, they are, and I'm not. They've got shops all over the big towns they have, and I've not. They've got capital behind them, they have, and I've not. They can afford to give things away, and I can't. I've always kept prices as low as I could, so as just to be able to keep myself on them, and I can't lower them no further. That's where they've got me. They can undercut. 
they don't need to make a profit at first and all i say is it's not fair on me they say as this here place is growin and there's room for the two of us well all i can say is not more than ten people's come into this here shop since they set up and it's not fair on me his audience of four clustered around his shop door listened in big-eyed admiration as he stopped for breath william said earnestly well we won't buy no more of their old stuff anyway the outlaws confirmed this statement eagerly but mr moss raised his hand no he said you are to go where you get stuff cheapest i don't blame you you're quite right they walked alone in silence for a little while the memory of mr moss wistful and bewildered with his cheerful hilarity gone remained with them i won't go to that old mallard's again while i live said william firmly anyway she wasn't nice i didn't like her said joan she didn't care what you bought said william indignantly she didn't take any interest like what mr moss does yes and if she murders folks as william says she does began ginger i wish you'd shut up about that said william i didn't say she'd murdered anyone you did i didn't you did i didn't do have another licorice treasure said joan peaceful munchings were resumed anyway said william returning to the matter at hand i'd like to do something for mr moss what could we do said ginger we could stop folks going into old mallard's tis as if she took any interest in what you buy well how could we stop folks going into old mallard's make em go to mr moss well how why don't you say how well we'd have to have a meeting about it an outlaw meeting let's have one now let's go to our woodshed and have one now joan's face fell i can't come can i i'm not an outlaw you can be an outlaw ally said william kindly we'll make up a special oath for you and give you a special secret sign joan's eyes shone oh thank you william darling joan had taken the special oath it had consisted of the words i will not betray the secrets of the outlaws and i will stick up for the outlaws till death do us part the last phrase was an inspiration of henry's who had been to his cousin's wedding the week before they sat down on logs or stacks of firewood or packing cases to consider the question of mr moss first thing is said william with a business-like frown we've got to make people go to mr moss well how can we objected ginger just tell me that how can we make people go to mosses when mallard is a penny cheaper same way as big shops make people go to them they put up notices and things they say their things is better than other shops things and folks believes em well why shouldn't folks believe em said ginger pugnaciously henry was engaged upon his last few pear drops and had no time for conversation why should folks believe em when they say they're better than other shops and how can we stick up notices and where and who'll let us stick up notices you don't talk sense you're mad that's what you are first you go about calling folks murderers when you don't know who they've murdered nor nothing about it and then you talk about sticking up notices when there isn't any one who'd let us stick up any notices nor any one who'd take any notice of notices what we stuck up nor if you just stop talkin said william and deafenin us all for just a bit you've been talkin and deafenin us all ever since you came out do you think we never want to hear anything all our lives ever till death by you talkin and deafenin us all there is things that we'd like to hear sides you talkin and deafenin us all there's music and bird singin and and other folks talkin but you go on so's any one would think that here ginger hurled himself upon william and the two of them rolled on to the floor and wrestled among the faggots violent physical encounters were a regular part of the programme of the outlaws meetings henry watched nonchalantly from his perch crunching pear drops occasionally throwing small twigs at them and saying go it that's right go it joan watched with anxious horror and william do be careful and oh ginger darling don't hurt him 
Finally, the combatants rose, dusty and disheveled, shook hands, and resumed their seats on the stacks of firewood. Now, um, if you'll only let me speak, began William. We will, William, darling, said Joan. Ginger won't interrupt, will you, Ginger? Ginger, who had decidedly had the worst of the battle, was removing dust and twigs from his mouth. He gave a noncommittal grunt. Well, uh, you know the sale of work next week, went on William. They groaned. It was a ceremony to which each of the company would be led, brushed and combed and dressed in gala clothes in a proud parent's wake. Well, went on William, you just listen carefully. I got an idea. They leant forward eagerly. They had a touching faith in William's ideas that no amount of bitter experiences seemed able to destroy. The day of the sale of work was warm and cloudless. William's mother and sister worked there all the morning. A tent had been erected, and inside the tent were a few select stalls of flowers and vegetables. Outside, on the grass, were the other stalls. The opening ceremony was to be performed by a real live duke. William absented himself for the greater part of the morning, returning in time for lunch, and meekly offering himself to be cleaned and dressed afterwards, like the proverbial lamb for the slaughter. William, said Mrs. Brown to her husband, is being almost too good to be true. It's such a comfort. I'm glad you can take comfort in it, said Mr. Brown. From my knowledge of William, I prefer him when you know what tricks he's up to. Oh, I think you misjudge him, said Mrs. Brown, whose trust in William was almost pathetic. Ethel and I can't go to the opening, darling, said Mrs. Brown at lunch. I'm rather tired, so I suppose you'll wait and go with us later. William smiled his painfully sweet smile. I might as well go early. I might be able to help someone, he said shamelessly. Half an hour later, William set off alone for the sale of work. He wore his super-best clothes. His hair was brushed to a chastened, sleek smoothness. He wore kid gloves. His shoes shone like stars. He walked briskly down to the sale of work. Already a gay throng had assembled there. Joan was there, looking like a piece of thistledown, in fluffy white, with her mother. Ginger was there, stiff and immaculate, with his mother. William, Ginger, and Henry joined forces and stood talking in low, conspiratorial voices, looking rather uncomfortable in their excessive cleanness. Joan looked at them wistfully, but was kept close to the maternal side. The real live duke arrived. He was tall and stooping, and looked very bored and aristocratic. Everything was ready for the opening. It was to take place on the open space of grass at the back of the tent. The chairs for the committee and the chair for the duke were close to the tent. Then a space was railed off from the crowd, from the ordinary people. At the other side of the tent, the stalls were deserted. His grace stood for a few minutes in the tent by one of the stalls, talking to the vicar's wife. Then he went out to open the sale of work. A few minutes after his grace had departed, William might have been seen to emerge from beneath the stall, his cap gone, his hair deranged, his knees dusty, and join Ginger and Henry in the deserted space behind the tent. His grace stood and uttered the few languid words that declared the sale of work open, but the committee, who were a few yards behind him, sat in open-mouthed astonishment, for a large placard adorned his grace's coat behind. Have you tried Moss's coconut lumps? The committee could think of no course of action with which to meet this crisis. They could only gasp with horror, open-eyed and open-mouthed. The few gracious words were said. The applause rose. His grace turned round to converse pleasantly with the vicar's wife, exposing his back to the view of the crowd. The applause wavered, then redoubled ecstatically. Some kind of an advertising job, said the organist's wife. But the crowd did not mind what it was. 
they held their sides they clung to each other in helpless mirth they followed that tall slim elegant figure with its incongruous placard as it went with the vicar's wife round the tent to the stalls the vicar's wife talked nervously and hysterically oh my dear i couldn't she said afterwards i didn't know how to put it i couldn't think of words and i kept thinking suppose he knows and means it to be there it somehow seemed better bred to ignore it the committee clustered together in an anxious group it wasn't there when he came someone must have put it on my dear someone must tell him or creep up and take it off when he isn't looking my dear one couldn't suppose he turned round when one was doing it and thought one was putting it on the vicar must tell him let's find the vicar i think it would come better from a clergyman don't you yes and he might well he couldn't say much before a clergyman could he and a vicar is so practised in consolation i think you're right but who did it flustered panting distraught they hastened off in search of the vicar meanwhile his grace talked to the vicar's wife he was beginning to think that she was not quite herself her manner seemed more than peculiar he glanced round the stalls were still deserted they haven't begun to buy much yet have they he said i suppose i must set the example he wandered over to a stall and bought a pink cushion then he looked around again his cushion under his arm his placard still adorning the back of his coat the crowd were engaged only in staring at him they were fighting to get a glimpse of him they were following him about like dogs i suppose some of these people must know my name he said i thought that speech of mine in the house last week would wake people up er uh, uh, yes said the vicar's wife she blinked and swallowed er uh, uh, yes indeed uh, yes indeed i uh, quite agree er uh, quite here the vicar rescued her the vicar had not quite made up his mind whether to be jocular or condoling a splendid attendance isn't it your grace there's a little thing i want to uh, the vicar's wife tactfully glided away of course we all understand you're not responsible and on our honour we aren't quite an accident the guilty party however shall be found i assure you he shall uh, uh, shall be found would you mind said his grace patiently telling me of what you are talking the vicar drew a deep breath then took the plunge there's a small placard on your back he said well not small that is uh, allow me his grace hastily felt behind secured the placard tore it off put on his tortoiseshell spectacles and examined it at arm's length then he turned to the vicar who was mopping his brow the committee were trembling in the background one of them miss spence by name had already succumbed to a nervous breakdown and had had to go home another was having hysterics in the tent how long exactly asked his grace slowly have i been wearing this the vicar smiled mirthlessly and put up a hand nervously as if to loosen his collar er uh, quite a matter of minutes um of minutes one might say your grace since uh, uh, um, uh since the opening one might almost put it then said his grace why the devil didn't you tell me before the vicar put out his hand and coughed reproachfully at this moment william ginger and henry emerged from beneath one of the stalls in whose butter muslin shelter they had been preparing themselves and awaiting the most dramatic moment to appear they all wore sandwiches made from sheets of cardboard and joined over their shoulders by string william bore before him and behind him massa's treacle toffee is the best get your bull's eyes at massa's ginger wore before him and behind him you will like massa's monkey nuts mosses takes an interest henry bore before him and behind him go to mosses for fruity bits mosses makes hapos solemnly with expressionless faces and eyes fixed in front of them they paraded through the crowd 
his grace who had taken off his spectacles put them on again his grace was a good judge of faces secure that first boy he said the vicar nothing loath secured william by the collar and brought him before his grace his grace held out his placard did you attach this to my coat he asked sternly william shook off the vicar's hand yes he said as sternly as his grace you see we wanted people to go to mr moss's shop cause you see mallard's is a big company and he's not and they've got er a uh, capitals behind them and he's not see and we wanted to make people go to moss's and we thought we'd fix up notices what would make people go to moss like big shops do and we knew no one would take any notice of our notices if we just put them up anywhere but we thought if we fixed one on to somebody important what everyone's been looking at all the time and he's awful kind and he takes an interest and he cares what you get and his cockernut lumps is better than any one's and he makes hapers without making a fuss and he's awful worried and we wanted to help him and she's a murderer piped ginger before his grace could reply joan wrenched herself free from her mother's restraining hand and flew up to the group oh please don't do anything to william she pleaded it was my fault too i'm not a real one but i'm an ally till death do us part you know his grace looked from one to the other he had been bored almost to tears by the vicar's wife and the committee with a lightening of the heart he recognized more entertaining company well he said judicially come to the refreshment tent and we'll talk it over over an ice the news that his grace had spent almost the entire afternoon eating ices with william brown and those other children discussing pirates and red indians and telling them stories of big game hunting made the village gasp the further knowledge that he had asked them to walk down to the station with him had called at mosses tasted coconut lumps pronounced them delicious bought a pound for each of them and ordered a monthly supply left the village almost paralyzed but everyone went to mr moss's to ask for details mr moss was known as the confectioner who supplied the duke of ashbridge with coconut lumps mallard shop was let to a baker's the next month and the red-haired girl said she wasn't sorry of all the dead and alive holes to work in this place was the deadest it was miss spence who voiced the prevailing sentiment about william she did not say it out of affection for william she had no affection for william william chased her cat and her hens disturbed her rest with his unearthly songs and whistles broke her windows with his cricket ball and threw stones over the hedge into her garden pond but one day as she watched william progress along the ditch william never walked on the road if he could walk in the ditch dragging his toes in the mud his hands in his pockets his head poking forward his brows frowning his freckled face stern and determined his mouth pucked up to make his devastating whistle his train of boy followers behind him she said slowly there's something about that boy end of chapter eight Chapter Nine of William the Fourth by Rick Mall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: William and the Black Cat. Bunker, the old black cat, had been an inhabitant of William's home ever since he could remember. Bunker officially belonged to Ethel, William's sister, but he bestowed his presence impartially on every family in the neighborhood he frequently haunted the next-door garden where lived another black cat a petted darling named luke belonging to miss amelia blake william treated all cats with supreme contempt towards his own family's cat he unbent occasionally so far as to throw twigs at it or experiment upon it with pots of colored paints but he prided himself upon despising cats and considered that their only use in the world was to give exercise and pleasure to his beloved mongrel jumble 
when william lay in bed and miss amelia blake's tender accents rose nightly to his ears from the next garden looky 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 he would frown scornfully huh all oh, for an old cat fancy knowing em his boast was that he did not know one cat from another bunker was very old and very mangy he employed habitually an ear-splitting and horrible yell long drawn out and increasing in volume as it neared its nightmare's climax a yell which william loved to imitate yeah mr brown remarked many times that that cat and that boy would drive him to drink between them but at least that boy slept at night it was decided one morning when bunker had spent a whole night in the garden without once relaxing the efforts of his vocal cords that bunker should leave this unsympathetic world for some sphere where one hoped his voice could be better appreciated or at any rate submitted to some tuning process well he goes or i go said mr brown one or other of us must be destroyed the world can't hold us both you can take your choice. Thus Bunker's fate was sealed. Ethel, who had hardly looked at Bunker for months without disgust, began, now that his dissolution was eminent, to dwell upon his engaging kittenhood, to see him in her mind's eye as a black ball with a blue ribbon round his neck, and to experience all the feelings that one ought to experience when one's beloved pet is torn from one by death she would even have fondled him if he hadn't been so mangy when his hideous voice upraised itself she would murmur oh my darling bunker and only a week ago she had murmured why we keep that cat i can't think one afternoon when ethel was at the tennis club mrs brown approached william mysteriously william dear i think it would be so kind of you to take bunker to gordon's now while ethel is out i've told mr gordon and he's expecting him and it would be much nicer for ethel just to hear that it was all over nothing loath to help in bunker's destruction william took the covered basket from the pantry and went into the garden caught a glimpse of black fur beyond the summer-house crept up behind it, grabbed it with a triumphant, would you, and clapped it into the basket. Gorton's was a wonderland to William. Dogs in cages, cats in cages, guinea pigs in cages, rabbits in cages, white rats in cages, tortoises in cages, goldfish in bowls. Once William had been thrilled to see a monkey there. William had stood outside the shop for a whole morning watching it, and making encouraging conciliatory noises to it, which it answered by an occasional jabber that delighted William's very soul. William was glad of an errand that gave him an excuse for wandering round the fascinations of the shop. He handed his basket to Mr. Gorton, and began his tour of inspection. He spent half an hour in front of the cage of a parrot, who screamed repeatedly, "'Go away, you ass! Go away!' William would never have tired of the joy of listening to this, but discovering that it was almost tea-time, he reluctantly took up his empty basket and returned. When he entered the dining-room, Mrs. Brown was speaking to Ethel. "'Ethel, darling, William very kindly took dear Bunker to Mr. Gorton's this afternoon. We wanted you to be spared the pain of knowing till it was all over. But now it's over, and Bunker didn't suffer at all, you know, darling, and—' At that moment there arose from the garden the familiar, hair-raising, ear-splitting sound. "'Yeah!' Ethel burst into tears. "'It's Bunker's ghost,' she said. "'Oh, it's his ghost.' but it wasn't Bunker's ghost, for Bunker's solid, earthly, mangy form appeared at that very moment upon the window sill. William's heart stood still. In the sudden silence that greeted the apparition of the earthly body of Bunker, his mind grasped the important fact that he must have taken the wrong cat, and that the less he said about it, the better." "'William,' said Mrs. Brown reproachfully, "'you might have done a little thing like that for your sister.' 
i thought said william feebly i mean i meant well you must do it after tea said mrs brown firmly it isn't kind of you to cause your sister all this unnecessary suffering just because you're too lazy to walk down to gorton's his sister who was finding it difficult to whip up a loving sorrow for bunker while bunker mangy and alive stared at her through the window said nothing and william muttered all right after tea i'll go after tea he went after tea he handed the basket to mr gorton with an unblushing there was two really to be done here's the other he stood oppressed by the thought of his crime and waited the return of his basket he had even lost interest in mr gorton's wonderland when the parrot screamed go away you ass go away he replied huffily oh, go away yourself as he lay in bed that night he wondered vaguely whose cat he had consigned to an untimely death he soon knew lukey 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 where are you darling lukey lukey oh, lukey 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 what's happened to you lukey where are you darling lukey 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 it seemed to william to go on all night William's excursions in the character of robber chief, outlaw, or red Indian took him many miles outside the radius of his own village. Three days after the day of his ill-omened mistake, he was passing a wayside cottage in the character of a famous detective on the track of crime when he noticed a large black cat sitting upon the doorstep watching its face. There was something familiar about that cat. William stopped it wasn't bunker but was it lukey said william in a hoarse persuasive whisper the large black cat rose purring and came down the walk to william lukey said william again the large black cat rubbed itself fondly against william's boots a woman came out of the cottage smiling you admiring my pussy little boy in ordinary circumstances william would have resented most bitterly this mode of address and would have passed on with a silent glance of contempt but from william's heart the load of murder had been lifted he almost smiled um he said he is a nice pussy isn't he went on lukey's new owner i bought him at gorton's three days ago he was just what i wanted a nice full-grown cat kittens are so destructive he's called twinkie 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 she murmured fondly bending down to stroke him her voice rising affectionately in the scale at each repetition of his name lukey rubbed himself purring against her boots there she said proudly don't the dear dumb creature know its new mistress there then darling you come in and see the beauty lap up its milk some time little boy and i'll give you a gingerbread i like little boys to be fond of animals especially cats some nasty boys throw sticks and things at them but i'm quite sure you wouldn't would you william muttered something inaudible and set off down the road his heart torn between relief at knowing himself guiltless of the crime of murder and indignant shame at being accused of an affection for cats cats but he was horrified at the duplicity of mr gorton and decided to confront him with it at once he hastened to the cage hung shop and spending only ten minutes in front of the box of grass snakes entered the cool dark depths where mr gorton in his shirt sleeves was chewing tobacco mr gorton was a large burly man with a fat good-natured looking face and a gentle manner but mr gorton obeyed the scriptures in combining with his dove-like gentleness a serpent-like cunning now look here young gent he said when william had laid his accusation before him you say i sold that there hanimal now what you wanted was to be rid of that hanimal didn't you well you're rid of it aren't you so what have you got to grumble at see as that there animal come back to trouble you no i'm as good a judge of a cat's character i am as any one i know that there cat soon's i see them i says there's a hanimal as will curl up anywhere you like to put him and so long as he's got his cushion and his saucer of milk regular it won't anchor after nothing else it won't go no long torturous road journeys trying to find old ohms not he he'll rub himself against any one what'll say puss puss 
sides which it's again my feelings as a humane man to put to death a young and healthy animal william stared at him now the second one you brought in well he's ripe for death all right and it's a pleasure and kindness to do it in these circs sides which mr gordon went on as another argument occurred to him what proof have you got that this ere animal of miss cliff's is the same animal what you brought to me saturday they're both black cats no marks on em well there must be hundreds of black cats same as that thousands millions just think of them all over the world well just you prove that these two animals is identical william having for once in his life met his match in eloquence moved away despondently all right he said i only asked he went to the parrot who was still there and who greeted him with an ironical laugh and a cry of my word what a nut oh my word william's spirits rose how much is the parrot he said five pounds said mr gorton william's spirits sank again snakes one and six and then see here i'll give you a baby tortoise just to stop you worrying about that animal william walked home proudly carrying his baby tortoise in both hands miss amelia blake was in the drawing-room she was speaking tearfully to his mother and i leave a saucer of milk out every night and i call him every night my poor lukey i can hardly sleep with thinking of my darling oh, perhaps hungry and needing me oh william if you see any traces of my lukey you'll let me know won't you and william oppressed by the weight of his guilty secret muttered something inaudible and went to watch the effect of his new pet upon jumble that night the plaintive cry arose again to his room lukey 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 what are you darling lukey 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 william's conscience though absolved of the crime of murder felt heavy as miss amelia blake called her lost pet mournfully night after night now william's conscience was a curious organ it needed a great deal to rouse it when roused it demanded immediate action he took one of his white rats round to miss amelia blake and miss amelia blake screamed and got on to a table he even rose to supreme heights of self-denial and offered her his baby tortoise but she refused it no william dear it's very kind of you but what i need is something i can stroke and i don't want anything but my lukey and i don't like its expression it looks as if it might bite i couldn't stroke that greatly relieved william took it back that afternoon perched on the garden fence his elbows on his knees his chin in his hands he watched the antics of jumbo round the baby tortoise though william had had the tortoise for three days now jumble still barked at it with unabated fury and william watched the two with unabated interest but william's thoughts were still occupied with the twinky lukey problem the ethics of the case were difficult it belonged to miss blake but miss cliff had paid for it then suddenly the solution occurred to him a week each they would have it a week each that would be quite easy to manage his heart lightened he jumped down put his tortoise into his pocket called high jumble took a stick jumped almost over the bed in the middle of the lawn and went whistling down the road followed by jumble the covered basket was very old and very shabby and it did not need much persuasion on william's part to induce mrs brown to give it to him just to keep my things in and carry em about in mother he said plaintively so as i won't be so untidy i shan't be half as untidy if i have a basket like that to keep my things in and carry em about in all right dear said mrs brown much pleased she was eternally optimistic about william william spent an entire saturday morning stalking lukey in the neighborhood of miss cliff's garden miss cliff went into the town to do her shopping on saturday mornings finally he caught him put him in the basket and secretly deposited lukey in miss amelia blake's garden miss blake was overjoyed he's come back mrs brown mrs brown he's come back william he's come back lukey's come back miss cliff was distraught 
little boy you haven't seen my twinkie anywhere have you my darling twinkie's gone twinkie 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 the next four saturdays he successfully changed twinkie lukey's place of abode on arrival at miss cliff's twinkie made immediately for his favorite cushion and went to sleep on arrival at miss amelia blake's lukey did the same the owners became almost accustomed to the week's mysterious absence he's gone away again mrs brown miss blake would call over the fence i only hope he'll come back as he did last time you haven't seen him have you lukey 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 then william became bored at first the glorious consciousness of duty done and the salving of his sense of guilt had upheld him but he began to feel that this could not go on forever when all is said and done saturday is saturday a golden holiday and a drab procession of school days william began to think that if he had to spend every saturday of his life stalking twinky lukey and conveying him secretly from one end of the village to the other he might as well not have been born he had put twinky lukey in the basket and was setting off with it down the road it was very hot and twinky lukey was very heavy and william was very cross he had just come to the conclusion that some other solution must be found to the twinky lukey problem when he heard the sound of the bus that made its slow and noisy progress from the neighboring country town to the village in which william lived a ride in the bus would save him a long hot walk with the heavy basket and by some miraculous chance he had the requisite penny in his pocket and anyhow he was sick of the whole thing he hailed the bus by swinging the basket round and putting out his tongue at the driver the driver put his out in return and the bus stopped william holding the basket entered the bus was very full but there was one empty seat William had taken this seat before he realized with horror that on one side of him sat Miss Amelia Blake and on the other Miss Cliff. The bus had started again and it was too late to get out. He went rather pale, pretended not to see them, stared in front of him with a set, stern expression on his face and clasped the basket containing Twinkie Lukies tightly to his bosom. Miss Amelia Blake and Miss Cliff did not know each other but they both knew william good morning little boy said miss cliff mornin muttered william still staring straight in front of him good morning william said miss blake mornin muttered william have you been doing some shopping for your mother said miss blake brightly uh said william his eyes still fixed desperately on the opposite window the basket still clutched tightly to his breast you must call and see my pussy again soon little boy said miss cliff a shadow passed over miss amelia blake's face you haven't seen lukey have you william he's been away all this week william felt a spasmodic movement in the basket at the sound of the name he moistened his lips and shook his head miss amelia blake was looking with interest at his basket it happened that she wanted a new shopping basket and had called at the basket shop about one that morning may i look at your basket william she said kindly i like these covered baskets for shopping the things can't tumble out on the other hand of course you can't get so many things in are the fastenings firm her hand was outstretched innocently towards the fastenings a cold perspiration broke out over william he put his hands desperately over the fastenings i wouldn't i wouldn't touch them he said hoarsely it's a bit full i wouldn't like all the things to come tumbling out there miss amelia blake smiled agreement and miss cliff beamed at him from the other side william was wishing that the earth would open and swallow up miss amelia blake and miss cliff and twinky lukey and himself at last the bus stopped at the crossroad and they all got out william's relief was indescribable that was over and it was the last time he'd ever changed their old cats for em he turned to go down the road but miss amelia blake put her hand on his arm i'll hold it very carefully william she pleaded i won't let anything tumble out but i do want to see if the fastenings of these baskets are secure 
Miss Cliff stood by, smiling with interested curiosity. William mutely abandoned himself to fate. Miss Amelia Blake opened one fastening. The flap turned back, and a black-whiskered head arose and looked around with a purr. Lukey! Twinky! He's mine! I bought him at Mr. Gorton's. How can you say he's yours? He's mine, cried Miss Cliff. He isn't, retorted Miss Blake. He knows me. Twinky, Lukey. Both made a grab at Twinky Lukey, but Twinky Lukey escaped both and flew like a dart down the road in the direction of Mr. Gorton's. Like all real gentlemen, Twinky Lukey preferred death to a scene. William was no coward, but even a braver man than William would have fled. William's fleeing figure was already halfway down the road in which his home lay. At the crossroads, Miss Amelia Blake and Miss Cliff clung to each other hysterically and sent forth shrill, discordant cries after the fleeing Twinky Lukey. Twinky, 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 Twinky! Lukey, 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 Lukey! And William ran as if all the cats in the world were at his heels. End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of William the Fourth by Wickmall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten William the Showman. William and his friends, known to themselves as the outlaws, were in their usual state of insolvency. All entreaties had failed to melt the heart of Mr. Beesom, the keeper of the general stores in the village, who sold marbles along with such goods as hams and shoes and vegetables. William and his friends wanted marbles, simply a few dozen of ordinary glass marbles which could be bought for a few pence. But Mr. Beesom refused to overlook the small matter of the few pence. He refused to give the outlaws credit. "'My terms to you, young gents, is cash down, and well you know it,' he said firmly. "'If you,' said William generously, "'let us have the marbles now. "'We'll give you a halfpenny extra Saturday.' "'You said that once before, young gent, if I remember right,' said Mr. Beesom, adjusting his capacious apron and turning up his shirt sleeves preparatory to sweeping out his shop. William was indignant at the suggestion. "'Well,' he said, "'well!' you talk as if it was my fault as if i knew my people was going to decide sudden not to give me any money that week simply because one of their cucumber frames got broke by my ball and i brought back the things what you let me have i brought the trumpet back and the rock yes the trumpet all broke and the rock all bit said mr beesom no cash down is my terms and i sticks to em if you please young gents he began his sweeping operation with great energy, and the outlaws found themselves precipitated into the street by the end of his long broom. Mean, commented William, rising again to the perpendicular. Just mean. I've got a good mind not to buy em there at all. He's the only shop that sells em, remarked Ginger. And we've got no money to buy em anywhere anyway, said Henry. "'Suppose we couldn't wait for him till Saturday?' suggested Douglas tentatively. He was promptly crushed by the outlaws. "'Wait,' said Ginger, "'wait. What's the use of waiting? We may be doing something else on Saturday. We mayn't want to play with marbles all that long time off.' "'If only you'd save your money,' said William severely, "'stead of spending it the day you get it. We shouldn't be like this. No marbles and swept out of his shop and nothing to play at.' This was felt to be unfair. Well, I like that, I like that, said Ginger. What about you? What about you? Well, if I was the only one, you could have lent me money and we could get marbles with it. And if you'd not spent all your money, we could be buying marbles now instead of standing swept out of his shop. Ginger thought over this, aware that there was usually some fallacy in William's argument, if only one could lay one's hand on it henry turned away oh come along he said impatiently it's no good staring in at his old butter and cheese let's think of something else to do anyway it's nasty cheese said douglas comfortingly 
my mother said it was so perhaps it's a good thing we've been saved buying his marbles something else to do said william we want to play marbles don't we what's the good of thinking of other things when we want to play marbles it's all very well to talk like that said ginger with sudden inspiration and we might just as well say that if you had not spent your money you could have lent us some and that's just as much sense as you saying if we oh do shut up talking stuff no one can understand said william let's get some money how said ginger who was nettled all right get some and we'll watch you you gonna steal some or make some or you're clever enough to steal some or make some i'll be very glad to join with it yes well if i stealed some or made some you just wouldn't join with it said william crushingly let's sell something said henry we've got nothing anybody would buy said ginger let's sell jumble jumbo's mine you can just sell your own dogs said william sternly we've not got any well then sell em that's sense isn't it said ginger just kindly tell us how to sell dogs we've not got just but william was suddenly tired of this type of verbal warfare let's do something let's have a show what of said ginger without enthusiasm we've got nothing to show and who'll pay us money to look at nothing just tell us that we'll get something to show i know he said suddenly a selection of insects anyone pay to see an exhibition of a selection of insects won't they i don't suppose there are many collections of insects anyway it'd be interesting anyone interested in insects for a moment the outlaws wavered who'd collect em said henry dubiously i would said william with an air of stern purpose the collection of insects was almost complete the show was to be held that afternoon the audience had been ordered to attend and bring their halfpennies the audience had agreed but had reserved to itself the right not to contribute the halfpennies if the exhibition was not considered worth it well was william's bitter comment on hearing this i shouldn't have thought there would be so many mean people in the world he had taken a great deal of trouble with his collection. He had that very morning been driven out of Miss Euphemia Barney's garden by Miss Euphemia herself, though he had only entered in pursuit of a yellow butterfly that he felt was indispensable to the collection. Miss Euphemia Barney was the local poetess and the leader of the intellectual life of the village miss euphemia barney was the president of the society for the encouragement of higher thought the members of the society discussed higher thought in all its branches once every fortnight at the end of the discussion miss euphemia barney would read her poems euphemia barney's poems had never been published miss euphemia said that in these days of worldliness and money worship she would set an example of unworldliness and scorn for money i think it best she would say that i should not publish as a matter of fact she had the authority of several publishers for the statement she disliked william more than anyone else she had ever known and she said that she knew just what sort of a woman miss fairlow was as soon as she heard that miss fairlow had taken to william miss fairlow had only recently come to live at the village miss fairlow was a real live worldly money-worshipping author who published a book every year and made a lot of money out of it when she came to live in the village miss euphemia barney was prepared to patronize her in spite of this fact and even asked her to join the society for the encouragement of higher thought but to the surprise of miss euphemia miss fairlow refused miss euphemia pitied her as she would have pitied any one who had refused the golden chance of belonging to the society for the encouragement of higher thought under her miss euphemia barney's presidency but as she said to the society her influence would not have tended to the unworldliness and purity that distinguishes us from so many other societies and bodies it is all for the best to her most intimate friends she said that miss fairlow had refused the offer of membership in order to mask her complete ignorance of higher thought ignorant my dear she said 
ignorant like all these popular writers so the society for the encouragement of higher thought pursued its pure and unworldly path and miss fairlow only laughed at it from a distance chased ignominiously from miss euphemia's garden william went along to miss fairlow's he could see her over the hedge mowing the lawn hello he said hello william she replied got any insects there said william heaps come in and see william came in with a business-like air his large cardboard box under his arm and began to hunt among her garden plants would you call a tortoise an insect he said suddenly well, if i wanted to she replied well i'm going to said william firmly and i'm going to call a white rat an insect i don't see why you shouldn't it might belong to a special branch of the insect world a very special branch you ought to give it a very special name the idea appealed to william all right what name miss fairlow rested against the handle of her lawnmower in an attitude of profound meditation we must consider that something nice and long um shafu said william suddenly after a moment's thought it just came he went on modestly just came into my head it's a beautiful word said miss fairlow i don't think you could have a better one an insect of the omshafu branch i think i'll call its name omshafu too said william picking a furry caterpillar off a leaf yes said miss fairlow it seems a pity not to use a word like that as much as you can now you've thought of it william put a ladybird in on top of the caterpillar it's going to be jolly fine he said optimistically what said miss fairlow oh just a collection of insects i'm doing said william later in the morning william brought om shafu over to visit miss fairlow it escaped and miss fairlow pursued it up her front stairs and down her back ones and finally captured it om shafu rewarded her by biting her finger william was apologetic i dare say it just didn't like the look of me said miss fairlow sadly oh no william hastened to reassure her it's bit heaps of people this year it bites people it likes i don't see why it shouldn't be an insect anyway do you william's collection of insects was ready for the afternoon's show the exhibits were arranged in small cardboard boxes covered mostly with paper and these were all packed into a large cardboard box the only difficulty was that he could not think where to conceal it from curious or disapproving eyes till after lunch the garden he felt was not safe cats might upset it and once upset in the garden the insects would be able to return to their native haunts too quickly his mother would not allow him to keep them indoors she would find them and expel them wherever he put them unless william had a brilliant idea he hid them under the drawing-room sofa the drawing-room sofa had a cretonne cover with a frill that reached to the floor and he had used this place before as a temporary receptacle for secret treasures no one would look under it or think of his putting anything there he put the tortoise into a box with a lid and tied om shafu up firmly with string in his box and put them in the large cardboard box with the insects then he put the large cardboard box under the sofa and went into lunch with a mind freed from anxiety the exhibition was not to begin till three so william wandered out to find jumble he found him in the ditch threw sticks for him brushed him severely with an old boot brush that he kept in the outhouse for the rare occasions of jumble's toilette and finally tied round his neck the old raggy and almost colourless pink ribbon that was his gala attire then he came to the drawing-room for the exhibits there he received his first shock on the drawing-room sofa sat miss euphemia barney wearing her very highest thought expression she surveyed william from head to foot silently with a look of slight disgust then turned away her head with a shudder william sought his mother what's she doin in our house he demanded sternly 
i've lent the drawing-room for a meeting of the higher thought darling said miss brown reverently because she has the painters in her own drawing-room you mustn't interrupt mrs brown was not a higher thinker but she cherished a deep respect for them but began william indignantly and then stopped he thought upon deliberation that it was better not to betray his hiding-place he went back to the drawing-room determined to walk boldly up to the sofa and drag out the exhibits from under the very skirts of miss euphemia barney but two more higher thinkers were now established upon the sofa one on each side of the president and higher thinkers were pouring into the room william's courage failed him he sat upon a chair by the door scowling his eyes fixed upon miss euphemia's skirts the members looked at him with lofty disapproval the gathering was complete the meeting was about to begin miss euphemia barney was to speak on the commoner complexes but first she turned upon william who sat with his eyes fixed forlornly on the hem of her skirts a devastating glare do you want anything a little boy she said before william had time to tell her what he wanted the maid threw open the door and announced miss fairlow the higher thinkers gasped miss fairlow looked round as daniel must have looked round at his lions i came she said oh dear miss euphemia waved her to a seat it occurred to her that here was a heaven-sent opportunity of impressing miss fairlow with a real respect for higher thought miss fairlow must learn how much higher they were in thought than she could ever be it would be a great triumph to enlist miss fairlow as a humble member and searcher after truth under her miss euphemia's leadership you came to see mrs brown of course she said kindly and the maid showed you in here thinking you were uh, one of us mrs brown has kindly lent us her drawing-room for a meeting pray don't apologize perhaps you would like to listen to us for a short time we were about to discuss the commoner complexes i will begin by reading a little poem i spent most of this morning putting the final touches to it she ended proudly i spent most of this morning on the pursuit of omshifu said miss fairlow gravely there was a moment's tense silence omshifu the higher thinkers sent glances of desperate appeal to their president would she allow them to be humiliated by this upstart oh omshifu said miss euphemia slowly of course it is very interesting the higher thinkers gave a sigh of relief i could hardly tear myself away this morning replied miss fairlow pleasantly it was so engrossing engrossing some sort of eastern philosophy of course again desperate glances were turned upon the embodiment of higher thought again she rose to the occasion i felt just the same about it when i uh, when i uh, she risked the expression took it up she felt that this implied that she had known about omshifu long before miss fairlow and this conveyed a delicate snub miss fairlow's glance rested momentarily on her bandaged finger it goes very deep she murmured miss barney was gaining confidence there i disagree with you she said firmly i think its appeal is entirely superficial william had brightened into attention at the first mention of omshafu but finding the conversation beyond him had relapsed into a gloomy stare now his state became suddenly fixed his mouth opened with horror the exhibits were escaping from beneath the hem of miss euphemia's gown a cockroach was making a slow and stately progress into the middle of the room several ants were laboriously climbing up miss euphemia's dress so far no one had noticed william gazed in frozen horror i hear that omshafu has bitten most people this year said miss fairlow demurely miss euphemia pursed her lips disapprovingly she was growing reckless with success i think there's something dangerous in it she said you mean its teeth said miss fairlow brightly there was a moment's tense silence a horrible suspicion occurred to miss euphemia that she was being trifled with 
the higher thinkers looked helplessly first at her and then at miss fairlow then miss euphemia rose from the sofa with a piercing scream something stung me it's bees bees coming from under the sofa simultaneously the treasurer jumped upon a small occasional table black beetles she screamed help above the babble rose miss fairlow's clear voice and there's omshifu himself i can see his dear little pink nose peeping out babel ceased for one second while the society for the encouragement of higher thought looked at omshifu then it arose with redoubled violence william departed with his exhibits he had recaptured most of them omshifu had been taken from the ample silk sash of the treasurer in a fold of which he had taken refuge william had left his mother and miss fairlow pouring water on the hysterical treasurer william was late as it was behind him trotted jumble the chewed-up remains of his gala attire hanging from his mouth william miss fairlow was just behind carrying a cardboard box oh william she said i was really bringing this to you when they showed me into the wrong room and i couldn't resist having a game with them i found it this morning after you'd gone in an old drawer i was tidying and i thought you might like it william opened it it was a case of butterflies butterflies of every kind all neatly labeled i think it used to belong to my brother said miss fairlow carelessly would you like it oh crumbs gasped william thanks and i've had the loveliest time this afternoon that i've had for ages said miss fairlow dreamily thank you so much william hastened to the old barn in which the exhibition was to be held ginger douglas and henry and the audience were already there well you're early aren't you said douglas sarcastically do you think said william sternly that anyone what has had all the hard work i've had getting together this collection could be here earlier the half dozen little boys who formed the audience grasped their half pennies firmly and looked at william suspiciously they won't give up their half pennies said henry in deep disgust no said the audience not till we've seen if it's worth a half penny william assumed his best showman air this ladies and gentlemen he began ignoring the fact that his audience consisted entirely of males is the only tortoise like this in the world seen a tortoise got a tortoise at home said his audience unimpressed perhaps said william crutchingly but have you ever seen a tortoise with white stripes like what this one has no but i could if i got an old tin of paint and striped our william passed on to the next box he took out on Shafu. this he said is the only rat insect of the species of om if you think said the audience that we're going to pay a halfpenny to see that old rat what we've seen hundreds of times before and what's a bit us too well we're not despair began to settle down upon ginger's face william passed on to the third box here uh, ladies and gentlemen he said impressively is thirty separate and distinct species of insects i only ask you to look at them i they're just the same sort of insects as crawl about our gardens at home said the audience coldly but have you ever seen em collected together before said william earnestly have you ever seen em collected think of the trouble and time what i took collecting em why the time alone i took's worth more'n a halfpenny i should think that's worth a halfpenny i should think it's worth more'n a halfpenny i should think well we won't said the audience we'd as soon see em crawling about a garden for nothing as crawling about a bog for a halfpenny so there ginger douglas and henry looked at william gloomily they ain't worth getting a collection for said ginger they deserve to have their half pennies took off em said douglas but william slowly and majestically brought forth his fourth box and opened it revealing rows of gorgeous butterflies then closed it quickly the audience gasped 
when you've given in your half pennies said william firmly then you can see this wonderful and unique collection of twenty separate and distinct species of butterflies all collected together eagerly the half pennies were given to william he handed them to douglas triumphantly go and buy the marbles quick he said in a hoarse whisper case they want em back then he turned to his audience smoothed back his hair and reassumed his showman manner in mrs brown's drawing-room the members of the society for the encouragement of higher thought were recovering from various stages of hysterics we shall have to dissolve the society said miss euphemia barney she'll tell everyone it's a wicked name for a rat anyway almost blasphemous i'm sure it comes in the bible how was one to know but people will never forget it we might form ourselves again a little later under a different name suggested the secretary people will always remember said miss euphemia they're so uncharitable it's a most unfortunate occurrence and setting her lips grimly as is the case with most of the unfortunate occurrences in this village the direct cause is that terrible boy william brown at that moment the direct cause of most of the unfortunate occurrences in the village with his friends around him his precious box of butterflies by his side and happiness in his heart was just beginning the hard-won long-deferred game of marbles End of chapter 10chapter eleven of william the fourth by rick mall crompton this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter eleven william's extra day what's leap year asked william it's a year that leaps said his elder brother robert it's leap year this year said william who told you inquired robert sarcastically well i don't see much leapin about this year so far said william trying to rise to equal heights of sarcasm oh go and play leapfrog said robert scathingly i don't believe you know said william i don't for a minute believe you know why it's called leap year you don't care either so long as you can sit talkin to miss flower you don't care about anything else you not even got any curiosity about leap year nor anything else i dunno know what you find to talk to her about i bet she doesn't know why it's leap year no more'n you do you won't talk about anything sensible you and miss flower you robert's youthful countenance had flushed a dull red miss flower was the latest of robert's seemingly endless and quickly changing succession of grand passions you don't even talk most of the time went on william scornfully cause i've watched you you sit lookin just lookin at each other like what you used to with miss crane and miss blake and miss uh, what was she called and it does look soft let me tell you to anyone watchin through the window robert rose with murder in his eye shut up and get out he roared william shut up and got out he sighed as he wandered into the garden it was like robert to get into a temper just because somebody asked him quite politely what leap year was ethel william's grown-up sister was in the drawing-room ethel said william why is it called leap year because of february twenty ninth said ethel well said william with an air of patience tried beyond endurance if you think that's any answer to anyone asking you why it's leap year if you think that's an answer that means anything to any ornery person you see everything leaps on february the twenty ninth said his sister callously you wait and see william looked at her in silent scorn for a few moments then gave vent to his feelings anyone'd think that anybody's old as you and robert would know a simple thing like that just think of you and robert and miss flower not knowing why it's called leap year how do you know miss flower doesn't know well wouldn't she have told robert if she knew she must have told robert everything she knows by this time talking to him and talking to him like she does for that matters i don't suppose mr brooke knows he'd have told you if he did he's always ethel groaned will you stop talking and go away if i give you a chocolate she said 
William forgot his grievance. Three, he stipulated in a quick business-like voice. Give me three, and I'll go right away. She gave him three so readily that he regretted not having asked for six. He put two in his mouth, pocketed the third, and went into the morning room. His father was there reading a newspaper. Father, said William, why is it called leap year? How many times am I to tell you, said his father, to shut the door when you come into a room? There's an icy blast piercing down my neck now. Do you want to murder me? No, father, said William kindly. He shut the door. Father, why is it called leap year? Ask your mother, said his father, without looking up from his paper. She mightn't know. Well, ask someone else, then. Ask anyone in heaven or earth, but don't ask me anything, and shut the door when you go out. William, though as a rule slow to take a hint, went out of the room and shut the door. He doesn't know, he remarked to the hat rack in the hall. He found his mother in the dining room. She was engaged in her usual occupation of darning socks. Mother, said William, why is it called leap year? I simply can't think, William, said Mrs. Brown feelingly. How do you get such dreadful holes in your heels? It's that hard road on the way to school, I spect, said William. I've got her walk to school, I spect that's it. I spect if I didn't go to school and kept to the fields and woods, I wouldn't get like what I do. But you and father keep saying I gotta go to school. I wouldn't mind not going, just to save you trouble. I wouldn't mind growing up ignorant, like what you say I would, if I didn't go to school, just to save you trouble. I... Mrs. Brown hastily interrupted him. What did you want to know, William? William returned to his quest. Why is it called leap year? Well, said Mrs. Brown, it's because of February 29th. It's an extra day. William thought over this for some time in silence. Do you mean, he said at last, that it's an extra day that doesn't count in the ordinary year? Yes, that's it, said Mrs. Brown vaguely. William, dear, I wish you wouldn't always stand just in my light. It was February 29th. William was unusually silent during breakfast. In the relief caused by his silence, his air of excitement was unnoticed. After breakfast, William went upstairs. He took two small paper parcels from a drawer and put them into his overcoat pocket. One contained several small cakes surreptitiously abstracted from the larder, and the other contained William's disguise. William's disguise was a false beard which had formed part of Robert's hired costume for the Christmas theatricals. Robert never knew what had happened to the beard. He had been charged for it as missing by the theatrical costumer. William had felt that a disguise was a necessity to him. All the heroes of the romances he read found it necessary in the crises of their adventurous lives to assume disguises. William felt that you never knew when a crisis was coming, and that any potential hero of adventure, such as he knew himself to be, should never allow himself to be without a disguise. So far, he had not had need to assume it, but he had hopes for today. It was an extra day. Surely you could do just what you liked on an extra day. Today was to be a day of adventure. He went downstairs and put on his cap in the hall. You'll be rather early for school, said Mrs. Brown. William's unsmiling countenance assumed a look of virtue. I don't mind being early for school, he said. Slowly and decorously, he went down the drive and disappeared from sight. Mrs. Brown went back to the dining room, where her husband was still reading the paper. William's so good today, she said. Her husband groaned. Eight thirty in the morning, he said, and she says he's good today. My dear, he's not had time to look around yet. William walked down the road with a look of set purpose on his face. Near the school he met Bertram Roke. Bertram Roke was the good boy of the school. You're not going to school today, are you? said William. Course, said Bertram virtuously, aren't you? Me, said William. Don't you know what day it is? Don't you know it's an extra day? What doesn't count in the ordinary year? Catch me going to school on an extra day that doesn't count in the ordinary year? 
what are you going to do then said bertram taken aback i'm going to have adventures you'll you'll miss geography said bertram geography said the hero of adventures scornfully leaving bertram gaping over the school wall his latin grammar under one arm and his geography book under the other william walked up the hill and into the wood in search of adventures it was most certainly a gypsy encampment there was a pot boiling on a campfire and a crowd of ragged children playing round three caravans stood on the broad cart track that led through the wood william watched the children wistfully from a distance more than anything on earth at that moment william longed to be a gypsy he approached the children all of them fled behind the caravans except one a very dirty boy in a ragged green jersey and ragged knickers and bare legs he squared his fists and knocked william down william jumped up and knocked the boy down the boy knocked william down again but overbalanced with the effort they sat on the ground and looked at each other what's your name said the boy william what yours helbert what you're doing here looking for adventures said william it's an extra day you know i want today to be quite different from an ordinary day i want some adventures i'd like to be a gypsy too he ended wistfully helbert merely stared at him would they take me went on william nodding his head in the direction of the caravans i'd soon learn to be a gypsy i'd do all they told me i've always wanted to be a gypsy next to a red indian and a pirate and there don't seem to be any red indians or pirates in this country albert once more merely stared at him william's hopes sank i've not got any gypsy clothes he said but perhaps they give me some enviously william looked at albert's ragged jersey and knickers and bare feet enviously albert looked at william's suit suddenly albert's heavy face lightened he pointed to william's suit swap he said succinctly don't you really mind said william humbly and gratefully the exchange was effected behind a bush william carefully transferred his packet of provisions and his disguise from his pocket to the pocket of helbert's ragged knickers then while helbert was still donning waistcoat and coat william swaggered into the open space round the fire his heart was full to bursting he was a gypsy of the gypsies hello he called in swaggering friendly greeting to the gypsy children but his friendliness was not returned he stole albert's clothes you wait till my dad catches you he'll whop you ma he's got a helbert's jersey on a woman appeared suddenly at the door of the caravan she was larger and dirtier and fiercer looking than any one william had ever seen before she advanced upon william and william forgetting his dignity as a hero of adventure fled through the wood in terror till he could flee no more then he stopped and discovering that the fat woman was not pursuing him sat down and leant against a tree to rest he took out his crumpled packet of provisions ate one cake and put the rest back again into his pocket he felt that his extra day had opened propitiously he was a gypsy william never felt happier than when he had completely shed his own identity he did not regret leaving the members of the gypsy encampment he had not really liked the look of any of them there had been something unfriendly even about helbert he preferred to be a gypsy on his own he ran and leapt he turned cartwheels he climbed trees he was riotously happy he was a gypsy suddenly he saw a little old man stretched out at full length beneath a tree the little old man was watching something in the grass through a magnifying glass on one side of him lay a notebook on the other a large japanned tin box william full of curiosity crept cautiously towards him through the grass on the other side of the tree he peered round the tree trunk and the little old man looking up suddenly found william's face within a few inches of his own Shh, said the little old man a rare specimen ah gone my movement i am afraid never mind i had it under observation for quite fifteen minutes and i have a specimen of it 
he began to write in his notebook and then he looked up again at william who are you boy he said suddenly i'm a gypsy said william proudly what's your name albert said william without hesitation well albert said the little old gentleman would you like to earn sixpence by carrying this case to my house it's just at the end of the wood without a word william took the case and set off beside the little old gentleman the little old gentleman carried the notebook and william carried the japanned tin case an interesting life a gypsy's i should think said the old gentleman memories of stories he had read about gypsies returned to william i wasn't born a gypsy he said i was stole by the gypsies when i was a baby the little old gentleman turned to peer at william over his spectacles really he said that's interesting most interesting what are your earliest recollections previous to being stolen william was thoroughly enjoying himself he was william no longer he was not even helbert he was evelyn de vere the hero of stolen by gypsies which he had read a few months ago oh i remember a kinder palace and a garden with statues and peacocks and her waterfalls and her flowers and things and a black man that came in the night and took me off and i've got a birthmark somewhere that'll identify me he ended with modest pride dear me squeaked the little old man greatly impressed how interesting how very interesting they had reached the little old gentleman's house a very prim old lady opened the door you're late augustus she said sternly a most interesting specimen murmured augustus deprecatingly i found it as i was on the point of returning home and forgot the hour the prim lady was looking up and down william who is this boy she said still more sternly ah said the old gentleman as if glad to change the subject he is a little gypsy nasty creatures said the lady fiercely but he has told me his story said augustus eagerly peering at william again over the top of his spectacles interesting most interesting if you'll come into my study with me a moment the lady pointed to a chair in the hall sit there boy she said to william after a few minutes she and the little old gentleman came into the hall again where's this birthmark you speak of said the old lady severely without a moment's hesitation william pointed to a small black mark on his wrist the lady looked at it suspiciously my brother will go back with you to the encampment to verify your strange story she said if it is untrue i hope they will be very severe with you don't be long augustus no sophia said augustus meekly setting off with william william was rather silent it was strange how adventures seemed to have a way of getting beyond control i don't remember the peacocks very plain he said at last hush said the old man taking out his magnifying glass he crept up to a tree trunk he gazed at it in a rapt silence most interesting he said i much regret having left my notebook at home and of course said william any one might dream about statues they found that the encampment had gone there was no mistake about it there were the smouldering remains of the fire and the marks of the wheels of the caravan but the encampment had disappeared they went to the end of the wood but there were no signs of it along any of the three roads that met there the little old gentleman was distraught oh dear oh dear he said how unfortunate do you know where they were going next no said william truthfully oh dear oh dear what shall we do let's go back to your house said william trustingly i should think it's about dinner time well said sophia grimly you've kidnapped a child from a gypsy encampment and i hope you're prepared to take the consequences oh dear said the old gentleman almost in tears what a day and it opens so propitiously i watched a perfect example of a scavenger beetle at work for nearly half an hour and then this william was watching them with a perfectly expressionless face never mind he said it doesn't matter what happens today it's extra we must keep the boy said augustus till we have made inquiries then he must be washed said sophia firmly and those dreadful clothes must be fumigated 
William submitted to the humiliating process of being washed by a buxom servant. He noticed, with misgiving, that his birthmark disappeared in the process. He resisted all attempts on the part of the maidservant at intimate conversation. "'A deaf moot, that's what I calls him,' said the maid indignantly, "'and me wasting my kindness on him and taking interest in him, "'and him treating me with a scornful silence like that. "'A deaf mute he is.' The lady, called Sophia, had entered carrying a short, white, beflounced garment. "'This is the only thing I can find about your size, boy,' she said. "'It's a fancy dress I had made for a niece of mine about your size.' Although it has a flimsy appearance, the thing is made on a warm wool lining. My niece was subject to bronchitis. You will not find it cold. You can just wear it while you have dinner, while your clothes are being, uh, heated. A delicious smell was emanating from a saucepan on the fire. William decided to endure anything rather than risk being ejected before that smell materialized. He meekly submitted to Helbert's garments being taken from him. He meekly submitted to being dressed in the white, beflounced costume. He remembered to take his two paper bags from the pockets of Helbert's knickers and tried unsuccessfully to find pockets in the costume he was wearing and finally sat on them. Then, tastefully arrayed as a fairy queen, he sat down at the kitchen table to a large plateful of stew. It was delicious stew. William felt amply rewarded for all the indignities to which he was submitting. The servant sat opposite, watching him. Is all gypsies deaf moots? she said sarcastically. I'm not an ordinary gypsy, said William, without raising his eyes from his plate or ceasing his appreciative and hearty consumption of Irish stew. I was stole by the gypsies, I was. I've got a birthmark somewhere where you can't see it. What'll identify me? Lord, said the maid. Yes, and I recollect peacocks and statues and folks walking about in crowns. Crikey, said the maid, filling his plate again with stew. Yes, said William, attacking it with undiminished gusto. And the suit I was wearing when they stole me is all embroidered with crowns of peacocks and and and... Statues, I suppose, said the servant. Yes, said William absently. And you was wearing silver shoes and stockings, I suppose? Gold, corrected William, scraping his plate clean of the last morsel. Lord, said the maid, as setting a large plate of pudding before him. Now, while you're a-heatin' of that, I'll just pop round to a friend next door and bring of her in. I shouldn't like to miss hearing you talk, all dressed up like you are, too. It's a fair treat, it is. She went, closing the door cautiously behind her. William disposed of the pudding and considered the situation. He felt that this part of the adventure had gone quite far enough. He did not wish to wait till the maid returned. He did not wish to wait till Augustus or Sophia had made inquiries. He opened the kitchen door. The hall was empty. Sophia and Augustus were upstairs enjoying their after-dinner nap. William tiptoed into the hall and put on one of the coats. Fortunately, Augustus was a very small man, and the coat was not much too large for William. William gave a sigh of relief as he realized that his humiliating costume was completely hidden. Next, he put on one of Augustus' hats. There was no doubt at all that it was slightly too big. Then he returned to the kitchen, took his two precious paper packets from the chair, put them into Augustus' coat pockets, and crept to the front door. It opened noiselessly. William tiptoed silently and ungracefully down the path to the road. All was still. The road was empty. It seemed a suitable moment to assume the disguise. With all the joy and pride of the artist, William donned his precious false beard. Then he began to walk jauntily up the road. Suddenly he noticed a figure in front of him. It was the figure of a very, very old man, toiling laboriously up the hill, bending over a stick. William, as an artist, never scorned to learn. He found a stick in the ditch and began to creep up the hill with little faltering steps, bending over his stick. He was thoroughly happy again. He was not William. He was not even Helbert. He was a very old man with a beard, walking up a hill. The old man in front of him turned into the workhouse gates, 
which were at the top of the hill. William followed. The old man sat on a bench in a courtyard. William sat beside him. The old man was very short-sighted. "'Hello, Thomas,' he said. William gave a noncommittal grunt. He took out his battered paper bag and handed a few fragments of crumbled cake to the old man. The old man ate them. William, a thrilling with joy and pride, gave him some more. He ate them. A man in uniform came out of the door of the workhouse. Arter noon, George, he said to the old man. He looked closely at William as he passed. Then he came back and looked still more closely at William. And then he said, here, and whipped off William's hat. Then he said, well, I'm, and whipped off William's beard, and then he said, I'll be, and whipped off William's coat. William stood revealed as the fairy queen in the middle of the workhouse courtyard. The short-sighted old man began to chuckle in a high, quavering voice. It's a lady out of a circus, he said. Oh, dear, oh, dear, it's a lady out of a circus. The man in uniform staggered back with one hand to his head. "'Gore, blimey!' he ejaculated. "'Have I gone mad, or am I dreaming it?' "'It's a lady out of a circus,' <laughs> cackled the old man. But William had gathered up his scattered possessions indignantly and fled, struggling into the coat as he did so. He ran along the road that skirted the workhouse. Then, finding that he was not pursued, and that the road was empty, he adjusted his hat and beard and buttoned his coat. At a bend in the road, there was a wayside seat already partially occupied by a young couple. William, feeling slightly shaken by the events of the last hour, sat down beside them. He sat there for some minutes, listening idly to their conversation, before he realized with horror who they were. He decided to get up unostentatiously and shuffle away. They did not seem to have noticed him so far but Miss Flower was demanding a bunch of the catkin palm that grew a little farther down the road. Robert, William's elder brother, with the air of a knight setting off upon a dangerous quest for his lady, went to get it for her. Miss Flower turned to William. A good afternoon, she said. William shaded the side of his face from her with his hand and uttered a sound which was suggestive of violent pain or grief, but whose real and only object was to disguise his natural voice. Miss Flower moved nearer to him on the seat. "'Are you in trouble?' she said sweetly. William, at a loss, repeated the sound. She tried to peer into his face. "'Could, uh, could I help at all?' she said, in a voice whose womanly sympathy was entirely wasted on William. William covered his face with both his hands and emitted a bellow of rage and desperation. Robert was returning with the catkins. Miss Flower went to meet him. Robert, she said, have you any money? I've left my purse at home. There's a poor old man here in dreadful trouble. Robert's sole worldly possessions at that moment were two and sevenpence half penny. He gave her half a crown. She handed it to William, and William, keeping his face still covered with one hand, pocketed the half-crown with the other. "'Do speak to him,' whispered Miss Flower. "'See if you can help him at all. He may be ill.' Robert sat down next to William and cleared his throat nervously. N "'Now, my man,' he began, and then stopped abruptly, staring at all that could be seen of William's face. He tore off the hat and beard. "'You little wretch!' "'And whose coat are you wearing, you little idiot?' He tore open the coat. The sight it revealed was too much for him. He sank back upon his seat with a groan. Miss Flower sat on the grass by the roadside and laughed till the tears ran down her cheeks. "'Oh, William,' she said, "'you are priceless. I just love to walk through the village with you like that. Will you come with us, Robert?' no said robert wildly at every crisis of my life that boy turns up and always in something ridiculous he's he's more like a nightmare than a boy william faced a family council consisting of his father and mother and robert and ethel william was still attired as a fairy queen well said william in a tone of disgust you said today was extra. I thought it didn't count. I thought nothing anyone did today counted. I thought it was an extra day. And there's Robert taking a half crown off me, and no one seems to mind that. And Robert telling Miss Flower on the seat how he'd wanted to live a better life since he met her. 
Robert's face went scarlet. And then, taking a half crown off me, William continued, I don't call that living a better life. She gave it me and he took it off me. I don't call that being noble like what he said she made him want to be. I don't... Shut up, said Robert desperately. Shut up and I'll give you the wretched thing back. All right, said William, receiving the half crown. What I want to know, William, said Mrs. Brown almost tearfully, is uh, where are your clothes? William looked down at his airy costume. Oh, she took em off me and put this thing on me. She said she wanted to heat em up. I don't know why. She took off my green jersey and my... You weren't wearing a jersey, screamed Mrs. Brown. William's jaw dropped. Oh, those clothes. Crumbs. I'd forgotten about those clothes. I, I suppose Hilbert still got em. Mr. Brown covered his eyes with his hand take him away he groaned take him away i can't bear the sight of him like that any longer mrs brown took him away she returned about half an hour later william attired by the events of his extra day had fallen at once into an undeservedly peaceful slumber it'll take us weeks probably to put whatever he's done today right she said hysterically to her husband i do hope you'll be severe with him but Mr. Brown, freed from the horrible spectacle of William robed as a fairy queen, had given himself up to undisturbed and peaceful enjoyment of the fire and his armchair and evening paper. Tomorrow, he promised specifically, not today. You forget. Today doesn't count. Eavesdropping, burst out Robert suddenly. Simply eavesdropping. I don't know how he can reconcile that with his conscience. Let's all be thankful, said Mr. Brown, that February 29th only happens every four years. Yes, but William doesn't, said Robert gloomily. William happens all the year round. End of chapter 11「Twelve of William the Fourth by Rick Mall Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve. William enters politics. When William at the charity fair was asked to join a sixpenny raffle for a picture and shown the prize, a dingy oil painting in an oval gilt frame, his expression registered outrage and disgust. It was only when his friend Ginger whispered excitedly, I say, William, last week my aunt read in the paper about someone what scraped off an old picture like that and found a real valuable old master painting underneath and sold it for more than a thousand pounds. Then he hesitated. An inscrutable expression came upon his freckled face as he stared at the vague head and shoulders of a lightly clad female against a background of vague trees and elaborate columns. All right, he said, suddenly holding out the sixpence that represented his sole worldly assets and receiving ticket number 33. Don't forget it was me what suggested it, said Ginger. Yes, and don't forget it was my sixpence, said William sternly. William was not usually lucky, but on this occasion the number 33 was drawn, and William, purple with embarrassment, bore off his gloomy-looking trophy. Accompanied by Ginger, he took it to the old barn. They scraped off the head and shoulders of the mournful and inadequately clothed female, and they scraped off the gloomy trees, and they scraped off the elaborate columns, to their surprise and indignation, no priceless old master stood revealed. Being thorough in all that they did, they finally scraped away the entire canvas and the back. Well, said William, raising himself sternly from the task, when nothing scrapable seemed to remain, and will you kindly tell me where this valuable old master is? Who said definite there was a valuable old master, said Ginger in explanation. If you kindly remember right, perhaps you'll kindly remember that I said that an aunt of mine said that she saw in the paper that someone had scraped away an old picture and found a valuable old master. I never said William was arranging the empty oval frame round his neck. Perhaps now, he interrupted ironically, you'd like to start scratching away the frame in case you find a valuable old master frame underneath. Will it hoop? said Ginger, with interest, dropping hostilities for the moment. They tried to hoop it, but found that it was too oval. 
William tried to wear it as a shield, but it would not fit his arm. They tried to make a harp of it by nailing strands of wire across it, but gave up the attempt when William had cut his finger and Ginger had hammered his thumb three times. William carried it about with him, his disappointment slightly assuaged by the pride of possession, but its size and shape were hampering to a boy of William's active habits. So in the end he carefully hid it behind the door of the old barn, which he and his friends generally made their headquarters, and then completely forgot it. The village was agog with the excitement of the election. The village did not have a member of Parliament all to itself. It joined with a neighboring country town. But one of the two candidates, Mr. Chator, the conservative, lived in the village, so feeling ran high. William's father took no interest in politics, but William's uncle did. William's uncle supported the liberal candidate, Mr. Morris. He threw himself wholeheartedly into the cause. He distributed bills, he harangued complete strangers, he addressed imaginary audiences as he walked along the road, he frequently brought one hand down heavily upon the other with the mystic words, Gentlemen, in the sacred cause of liberalism. William was tremendously interested in him. He listened, enraptured, to his monologues, quite unabashed by his uncle's irritable refusals to explain them to him. Politically, the uncle took no interest in William. William had no vote. William's uncle was busily preparing to hold a meeting of canvassers for the cause of the great Mr. Morris in his dining room. Mr. Morris, a tall, thin gentleman, for some obscure reason very proud of his name, who went through life saying plaintively, Double S, E, please, was not going to be there. William's uncle was going to tell the canvassers the main features of the program with which to dazzle the electors of the neighborhood. I suppose, said William carelessly, you don't mind me coming? You suppose wrong, then, said William's uncle. I most emphatically mind your coming. But why, said William earnestly, I'm interested. I like to go canvassing, too. I know a lot about the reactionaries, you know, the old conservies. I'd like to go calling them names, too. I'd like... You may not attend the liberal canvassers' meeting, William, said William's uncle firmly. From that moment, William's sole aim in life was to attend the liberal canvassers' meeting. He and Ginger discussed ways and means. They made an honest and determined effort to impart to William an adult appearance, making a frown with burnt cork, and adding whiskers of matting, which adhered to his cheeks by means of glue. Optimists though they were, they were both agreed that the chances of William's admittance thus disguised into the meeting of the liberal canvassers was but a faint one. So William evolved another plan. The dining room in which William's uncle was to hold his meeting was an old-fashioned room. A hatch, never used, opened from it onto an old stone passage the meeting began. William's uncle arrived and took his seat at the head of the table with his back to the hatch. William's uncle was rather short-sighted and rather deaf. The other liberal canvassers filed in and took their places round the table. William's uncle bent over his papers. The other liberal canvassers were gazing with widening eyes at the wall behind William's uncle. The hatch slowly opened. A dirty, oval, gilt frame appeared, and was by no means soundlessly attached to the top of the open hatch. Through the aperture of the frame appeared a snub-nosed, freckled, rough-haired boy with a dirty face and a forbidding expression. William didn't read sensational fiction for nothing. In The Sign of Death, which he had finished by the light of a candle at 11.30 the previous evening, Rupert the Sinister, the international spy, had watched a meeting of masked Secret Service agents by the means of concealing himself in a hidden chamber in the wall, cutting out the eye of a portrait, and applying his own eye to the whole. William had determined to make the best of slightly less favorable circumstances. There was no hidden chamber, but there was a hatch. There was no portrait, but there was the useless frame for which William had bartered his precious sixpence. He still felt bitter at the thought. 
william felt not unreasonably that the sudden appearance in the dining-room of a new and mysterious portrait of a boy might cause his uncle to make closer investigations so he waited till his uncle had taken his seat before he hung himself ever optimistic he thought that the other liberal canvassers would be too busy arranging their places to notice his gradual and unobtrusive appearance in his frame with vivid memories of the illustration in the sign of death he was firmly convinced that to the casual observer he looked like a portrait of a boy hanging on the wall in this he was entirely deceived he looked merely what he was a snub-nosed freckled rough-haired boy hanging up an old empty frame in the hatch and then crouching on the hatch and glaring morosely through the frame william's uncle opened the meeting and we must emphasize the consequent drop in the price of bread don't you think that point's a very important mr moffat mr moffat a thin pale youth with a large nose and a naturally startled expression answered as in a trance his mouth open his strained eyes fixed upon william uh, very important uh, very we can't overemphasize it said william's uncle mr moffat put up a trembling hand as if to loosen his collar he wondered if the others saw it too overemphasize it he repeated in a trembling voice then he met william's stony stare and looked away hastily drawing his handkerchief across his brow i think we can safely say said william's uncle that if the government we desire is returned the average loaf will be three halfpence cheaper he looked round at his helpers not one was taking notes not one was making a suggestion all were staring blankly at the wall behind him extraordinary what stupid fellows seemed to take up this work that chap with the large nose looked nothing more or less than tipsy here are some pamphlets that we should take round with us he spread them out on the table william was interested he could not see them properly from where he was he leant forward through his frame he could just see the words peace and prosperity he leant forward further he leant forward too far accidentally attaching his frame round his neck on his way he descended heavily from the hatch there was only one thing to do to soften his fall he did it he clutched at his uncle's neck as he descended a confused medley consisting of william his uncle the frame and his uncle's chair rolled to the floor where they continued to struggle wildly oh my goodness squealed the young man with the large nose hysterically somehow in the melee that ensued william managed to preserve his frame he arrived home breathless and dishevelled but still carrying his frame he was beginning to experience a feeling almost akin to affection for his companion in adversity what's the matter said william's father sternly what have you been doing me said william in a voice of astonishment me yes you said his father you come in here like a tornado half dressed with your hair like a neglected lawn william hastily smoothed back his halo of stubby hair and fastened his collar uh, oh that he said lightly i've only just been out walkin and things mrs brown looked up from her darning i think you'd better go and brush your hair and wash your face and put on a clean collar william she suggested mildly yes mother agreed william without enthusiasm father did you know that the liberals are going to make bread and everything cheaper and and prosperity and all that i did not said mr brown dryly from behind his paper i'd give it a good brushing said his wife if there weren't no old reactionary conservy here said william i suppose there wouldn't be no reason why the liberals shouldn't get in as far as i can disentangle your negatives said mr brown your supposition is correct i simply can't think why it always stands up so straight said mrs brown plaintively well then why don't they stop em said william indignantly why do they let the old conservies come in and spoil things and keep bread up why don't they stop em why mr brown uttered a hollow groan william said he grimly go 
and brush your hair all right he said i'm just going mr chater the conservative candidate had addressed a crowded meeting and was returning wearily to his home he opened the door with his latch key and put out the hall light the maids had gone to bed then he went upstairs to his bedroom he opened the door from behind the door rushed a small whirlwind a rough bullet-like head charged him in the region of his abdomen mr chater sat down suddenly a strange figure dressed in pajamas and over those a dressing-gown and over that an overcoat stood sternly in front of him you gotta stop it said an indignant voice you gotta stop it and let the liberals get in you gotta stop mr chater stood up and squared at william william who fancied himself as a boxer flew to the attack the conservative candidate was evidently a boxer of no mean ability but he lowered his form to suit williams he parried williams wild onsets he occasionally got a very gentle one in on william they moved rapidly about the room in a silence broken only by william's snortings finally mr chater fell over the hearthrug and william fell over mr chater they sat up on the floor in front of the fire and looked at each other now said mr chater soothingly let's talk about it what's it all about they're going to make bread cheaper the liberals are panted william and you're trying to stop em and you ah said mr chater but we're going to make it cheaper too william gasped you he said the reactionaries but if you're both trying to make bread cheaper why are you fighting each other you know said mr chater i wouldn't bother about politics if i were you they're very confusing mentally suppose you tell me how you got here well i got out of my window and climbed along our wall to the road said william simply and then i got on to your wall and climbed along it into your window now you're here said mr chater we may as well celebrate do you like roasted chestnuts mm, said william well i've got a bag of chestnuts downstairs we can roast em at the fire i'll get em by the way suppose your people find you've gone oh my uncle may have come to see my father by now so i don't mind not being at home just now mr chater accepted this explanation i'll go down for the chestnuts then he said fortune was kind to william his uncle was very busy and thought he would put off the laying of his complaint before william's father till the next week the next week he was still more busy encountering william unexpectedly in the street he was struck by william's hastily assumed expression of wistful sadness and decided that the whole thing may have been a misunderstanding so the complaint was never laid moreover no one had discovered william's absence from his bedroom william came down to breakfast the next day with a distinct feeling of fear but one glance at his preoccupied family relieved him he sat down at his place with the air of meekness which in him always betrayed an uneasy conscience his father looked up good morning william he said care to see the paper this morning i suppose with your new zeal for politics oh politics said william contemptuously i've given em up they're so so frowning he searched in his memory for the phrase they're so confusing mentally his father looked at him your vocabulary is improving he said you mean my hair said william with a gloomy smile mother's been scrubbing it back with water same as what she said william walked along the village street with ginger their progress was slow they stopped in front of each shop window and subjected the contents to a long and careful scrutiny there's nothing there i'd buy if i had a thousand pounds oh isn't there well i just wonder how much have you got anyway <laughs> nothing how much have you nothing well said william continuing a discussion which their inspection of the general stores had interrupted i'd rather be a pirate than a red indian sailing the seas and finding hidden treasure i don't quite see said ginger with heavy sarcasm what's to prevent a red indian finding hidden treasure if there's any to find well said william heatedly you show me a single tale where a red indian finds a hidden treasure that's all i ask you to do just show me a single tale where a we're not talking about tales 
there's things that happen outside tales i suppose everything in the world that can happen isn't in tales besides think of the war hoops a pirate's not got a war hoop well if you think they stopped to examine the contents of the next shop window it was a second-hand shop in the window was a medley of old iron old books broken photograph frames and dirty china and there's nothing there i want to buy if i got a thousand pounds said william sternly it makes me almost glad i've got no money must be maddening to have a lot of money and never see anything in a shop window you'd want to buy suddenly ginger pointed excitedly to a small card propped up in a corner of the window objects purchased for cash william gasped ginger the frame a look of set purpose came into william's freckled face you stay here he whispered quickly and see they don't take that card out of the window and i'll fetch the frame panting he reappeared with the frame a few minutes later ginger's presence had evidently prevented the disappearance of the card an old man with a bald head and two pairs of spectacles examined the frame in silence and in silence handed william half a crown william and ginger staggered out of the shop half a crown gasped william excitedly crumbs i hope said ginger you'll remember who suggested you buying that frame and i hope said william that you'll remember who sixpence bought it this verbal fencing was merely a form it was a matter of course that william should share his half-crown with ginger the next shop was a pastry cook's it was the type of pastry cook's that william's mother would have designated as common on a large dish in the middle of the window was a pile of sickly-looking yellow pastries full of sickly-looking yellow butter cream william pressed his nose against the glass and his eyes widened i say he said only a penny each come on in they sat at a small marble-topped table between them a heaped plate of the nightmare pastries and ate in silent enjoyment the plate slowly emptied william ordered more as he finished his sixth he looked up his uncle was passing the window talking excitedly to mr morris's agent across the street a man was pasting up a poster vote for chater william regarded both with equal contempt he took up his seventh penny horror and bit it rapturously fancy he said scornfully fancy people worrying about what bread costs End of chapter 12chapter thirteen of william the fourth by rick mall crompton this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirteen william makes a night of it william had disliked mr benison from the moment he appeared although mr benison treated him with most conscientious kindness william disliked the way mr benison's hair grew the way his teeth grew and the way his ears grew and he disliked most of all his agreeable manner to william himself he was not used to agreeable manners from adults and he distrusted them mr benison was a bachelor and wrote books on the training of children he believed that children should be led not driven that their little hearts should be won by kindness that their innocent curiosity should always be promptly satisfied he believed that children trailed clouds of glory he knew very few he certainly did not know william mr benison had met ethel william's sister while she was staying with an aunt ethel possessed blue eyes and a riot of auburn hair of which william was ashamed he considered that red hair was quite inconsistent with beauty he found that most young men who met ethel did not share that opinion although mr benison had reached the mature age of forty without having found any passion to supersede his passion for educational theories he experienced a distinct quickening of his middle-aged heart at the sight of ethel with her forget-me-not eyes and copper locks william never could understand what men saw in ethel william considered her interfering and bad-tempered and stingy and everything that an ideal sister should not be yet there was no doubt that adult males saw something in her and william had the wisdom to make capital out of this distorted idea of beauty whenever he could 
william was in that state of bankruptcy which occurred regularly in the middle of each week he was never given enough pocket money to last from saturday to saturday that was one of his great grievances against life and just now there were some pressing calls on his purse it was ginger william's boon companion who had seen the tops in the shop window and realized suddenly that the top season was upon them once more the next day almost the whole school was equipped with tops only william and ginger seemed topless to william a born leader the position was intolerable it was wednesday the thought of waiting till saturday was not for one moment to be entertained money must somehow or other be raised in the interval tops of a kind could be bought for sixpence but the really superior tops the ones which befitted the age and dignity of william and ginger cost one shilling and william and ginger never daunted by difficulties determined to raise the sum by the next day we must get a shilling each said william with his expression of grim and fixed determination and we'll buy em to-morrow well you know what my folks are like said ginger despondently you know what it's like trying to get money out of em save your pocket money they say if they give me enough i'd be able to say what's sixpence could anyone save sixpence it's gone in a day sixpence is and they say save he ended bitterly well said william all i can say is that no one's folks can be stingier than mine and that if i can get a shilling yes but you've not got it yet have you taunted ginger no said william confidently but you wait till to-morrow william had spoken confidently but he felt far from confident he knew by experience the difficulty of extorting money from his family he had tried pathos resentment indignation pleading and all had failed on every occasion he was generally obliged to have recourse to finesse he only hoped that on this occasion fate would provide circumstances on which he could exercise his finesse he entered the drawing-room and it was then that he first saw mr bennison it was then that he took a violent and definite dislike to mr bennison yet he had a wild hope that he might be a profitable source of tips with a mental vision of the tops before his eyes he assumed an expression of virtue and innocence so this said mr bennison with a genial smile is the little brother william's expression of virtue melted into a scowl william was eleven years old he objected to being called a little anything i heard there was a little brother went on the visitor perpetrating the supreme mistake of laying his hand upon william's tousled head will is the name is it not willie for short i presume (laughs) mrs brown noting fearfully the expression upon her son's face interposed we call him william she said rather hastily i call him willie for short smiled mr bennison patting william's unruly locks mr bennison labored under the delusion that he got on with children it was well for his peace of mind that william's face was at that moment hidden from him it was only the thoughts of the top which might be the outcome of all that made william endure the indignity and i brought a present for willie for short went on mr bennison humorously william's heart rose it might be a top it might be something he could exchange for a top best of all it might be money but mr bennison took a book out of his pocket and handed it to william the book was called a child's encyclopedia of knowledge mrs brown who could see william's face went rather pale say thank you william dear she said nervously then hastily covering william's murmured thanks how very kind of you mr bennison how very kind he'll be most interested i'm sure he will won't you william dear Uh, um, i'm sure he will william freed himself from mr bennison's hand and went towards the door you will remember went on mr bennison pleasantly that in my early training of the young i lay down the rule that every present given to a child should tend to his or her mental development i do not believe in giving a child presents of money before he or she is sixteen no really wise faculty of choice is developed before then i expect you remember that in my parents help i said 
William crept quietly from the room. He went first of all to Ethel's bedroom. She was reading a novel in an armchair. Go away, she said to William. In the midst of his preoccupation, William found time to wonder again what people saw in her. Well, if they only knew her as well as he did. But the all-important question was the question of tops. Ethel, he said in a tone of brotherly sweetness and Christian forgiveness, have you got any tops left? You must have had tops when you were young. I wonder if you'd like to give them to me, if you've got any left, and I'll use them up for you. Well, I've not, snapped Ethel, so go away. William turned to the door, then turned back as if struck by a sudden thought. Do you remember, Ethel, he said, that I took a spider out of your hair for you last summer? I wondered if you'd care to lend me a shilling just till my next pocket money. You put it in my hair first, said Ethel indignantly, and I jolly well won't, and I wish you'd go away. William looked at her coldly how people can say you're attractive he said well all i can say is wait till they know you and that man downstairs coming just cause of you and worrying folks lives out and stroking their heads and giving em books well you'd think he'd be ashamed and you'd think you'd be ashamed too ethel had flushed you needn't think i want him she said i should think i'm the only person who can grumble about him being here i have to stay up here all the afternoon just because i can't bear the nonsense he talks when i'm down how long's he staying said william oh a week said ethel viciously he said he was motoring in the neighborhood and mother asked him to stay a week she likes him He's got three cars and a lot of money, and he can talk the hind leg off a donkey, and she likes him. All I can say, bitterly, is that I'm going to have a nice week. What about a shilling, said William, returning to the more important subject. Look here, if you lend me a shilling now, I'll give you a shilling and a penny when I get my pocket money on Saturday. I'll not forget a shilling and a penny for a shilling. I should think you'd call it a bargain well i wouldn't said ethel and i wish you'd go away away i don't call you very generous ethel said william loftily no and i'm not likely to be generous or feel generous with that man in the house said ethel william was silent he was silent for quite a long time william's silences generally meant something suppose he said at last suppose he went to-morrow would you feel generous then i would said ethel recklessly i'd feel it quite up to two shillings in that case but he won't go don't you think it and will you go away william went rather to her surprise without demur he walked very slowly downstairs his brow was knit in thought mr bennison was still talking to mrs brown in the drawing-room oh yes that is one of my very firmest tenets i have laid stress on that in all my books the child's curiosity must always be appeased no matter at what awkward time the child propounds the question he or she must be answered courteously and fully curiosity must be appeased the moment it appears if a child came to me in the middle of the night for knowledge he laughed uproariously at his joke i trust i should give it the best of my ability fully and er as i said uh, oh here is our little willie for short still holding his child's encyclopedia of knowledge william turned and quickly left the room mr bennison had had a good dinner and a pleasant talk with ethel before he came to bed the talk had been chiefly on his side but he preferred it that way he was thinking how pleasant would be a life in which he could talk continuously to Ethel while he looked at her blue eyes and auburn hair. He wrote a chapter of his new book, heading it, Common Mistakes in the Treatment of Children. He insisted in that chapter that children should be treated with reverence and respect. He laid down his favorite rule, a child's curiosity must be immediately satisfied when and where it appears, irrespective of inconvenience to the adult. Then he got into bed. 
the bed was warm and comfortable and he was drifting blissfully into a dreamless sleep when the door opened and william clad in pajamas and carrying the child's encyclopedia of knowledge appeared excuse me disturbing you said william politely but it says in this book what you kindly gave me something about sock crates william pronounced it in two syllables sock crates and i thought perhaps you wouldn't mind explaining to me what they are i don't know what sock crates are mr benison was on the whole rather pleased in all his books he had insisted that if the child came for knowledge at midnight the child's curiosity must be satisfied then and there and he was glad of an opportunity of living up to his ideals he dragged his mind back from the rosy mists of sleep and endeavoured to satisfy william's thirst for knowledge he talked long and earnestly about socrates his life and teaching and his place in history william listened with an expressionless face whenever the other seemed inclined to draw his remarks to a close william would gently interpose a question which would set his eloquence going again at full flow but mr benison's eyes began to droop and his eloquence began to languish he looked at his watch it was twelve thirty i think that's all my boy he said with quite a passable attempt at bluff hearty kindness in his voice you haven't quite splained to me began william i've told you all i know said mr benison irritably william still clasping his book went quietly from the room mr benison turned over and began to go to sleep it took a little time to get over the interruption but soon a delicious drowsiness began to steal over him going going william entered the room again still carrying his child's encyclopedia of knowledge it says in this book what you kindly gave me he said earnestly all about compound interest but i don't quite understand william was very clever at not understanding compound interest he had an excellent repertoire of intelligent questions about compound interest at school he could for a consideration play the mathematics master on compound interest for an entire lesson while his friends amused themselves in their own way in the desks behind mr benison's eloquence was somewhat lacking in lucidity and inspiration this time but he struggled gallantly to clear the mists of william's ignorance at times the earnestness of william's expression touched him at times he distrusted it at no time did it suggest those clouds of glory that he liked to associate with children by one thirty he had talked about compound interest till he was hoarse i don't think there's anything else i can tell you he said with an air of irritation which he vainly endeavoured to hide uh, oh shut the door after you it's very draughty when you leave it open oh dear boy william with the utmost docility went out of the room mr benison turned over and tried to go to sleep it did not seem so easy to go to sleep this time there's something about explaining compound interest to the young and ignorant that is very stimulating to the brain he tried to count sheep going through a stile and they persisted in turning into the figures of a compound interest sum he tried to call back the picture of domestic happiness with which the sight of william's sister had inspired him earlier in the evening and always the vision of william's earnest inscrutable countenance rose to spoil it sheep one two three four five the door opened and william appeared with the open book once more in his hand in this book what you kindly gave me he began it tells about the stars and the lion and that and i can't find the lion from the window though the stars are out i wondered if you'd kindly let me look through yours sheep and style vanished abruptly after a short silence pregnant with unspoken words mr benison sat up in bed he looked very weary as he stared at william but he was doggedly determined to act up to his ideals i don't think you can see the lion from this side of the house my boy he said in what he imagined was a kind tone of voice it must be right on the opposite side of the house then we could see it from my window said william brightly and guilelessly if you'll kindly come and help me find it 
Mr. Benison said nothing for a few seconds. He was counting forty to himself. It was a proceeding to ensure self-control taught him by his mother in early youth. It had never failed him yet, though it nearly did on this occasion. Then he followed William across the landing to his room. William was not content with the lion. He insisted on finding all the other constellations mentioned in the book. At 2.30, Mr. Benison staggered back to his bedroom. He did not go to bed at once. He took out the chapter he had written early in the evening and crossed out the words, A child's curiosity must be immediately satisfied when and where it appears, irrespective of inconvenience to the adult. He decided to cut out all similar sentiments in the next editions of all his books. Then he got into bed, sleep at last, blissful, drowsy, soul-satisfying sleep. Mr. Benison, Mr. Benison, in this book, what you kindly gave me, there are some kind of puzzles. Intelligence tests, it calls them, and I can't do them. I wonder if you kindly help me. Well, I won't, said Mr. Benison. Go away, go away, I tell you. There's only a page of them, said William. Go away, roared Mr. Benison, drawing the clothes over his head. I tell you, I won't, I won't. William quietly went away. Now, Mr. Benison was a conscientious man. Left alone in the silence of the night, all desire for sleep deserted him. He was horrified at his own depravity. He had deliberately broken his own rule. He had been false to his ideals. He had refused to satisfy the curiosity of the young when and where it appeared. A child had come to him for help in the middle of the night, and he had refused him or her the child moreover might repeat the story it might get about people might hold it up against him after wrestling with his conscience for half an hour he arose and sought william in his room at four o'clock he was still trying to solve the intelligence tests for william william stood by wearing that expression that mr benison was beginning to dislike intensely at four fifteen, Mr. Benison, looking wild and disheveled, returned to his room. But he was a broken man. He struggled no longer against fate. Five o'clock found him explaining to William exactly why Charles I had been put to death. Six o'clock found him trying to fathom the meaning of plunger and inductance and slider and various other words that occurred in the chapter on wireless. It fortunately never occurred to him that they were all terms with which William was perfectly familiar. As he held his head and tried to think from what Greek or Latin words the terms might have been derived, he missed the flicker that occasionally upset the perfect repose of William's features. At seven o'clock he felt really ill and went downstairs to try to find a whiskey and soda. It was not William's fault that he fell over the knitting on which Mrs. Brown had been engaged the evening before, and which had slipped from her chair onto the floor. His frenzied efforts to disentangle his feet entangled them still further. At last, with teeth bared in rage, and wearing the air of a Samson throwing off his enemies, he tore wildly at the wool, and scattering bits of this material and unraveled socks about him, he strode forward to the sideboard. He could not find a whiskey and soda. After upsetting a cruet in the sideboard cupboard, he went guiltily back to his bedroom. His bed looked tidier than he imagined he had left it, and very inviting. Perhaps he might get just half an hour's sleep before he got up. He flung himself onto the bed. His feet met with an unexpected resistance. Halfway down the bed, bringing his knees sharp up to his chin. The bed was wrong. The bed was all wrong. The bed was all very wrong. For a few seconds, Mr. Benison forgot the traditions of self-restraint and moderation of language on which he had been reared. William, standing in the doorway, listened with interest. I hope you don't mind me trying if I could do it, he said. I don't know why it's called an apple pie bed, do you? It doesn't say nothing about it in this book, what you kindly gave me. Mr. Benison flung himself upon William with a roar. William dodged lightly onto the landing. Mr. Benison followed and collided heavily with a housemaid who was carrying a tray of early morning tea. 
William came down to breakfast. He entered the dining room slowly and cautiously. Only his father and mother were there. His mother was talking to his father. He wouldn't even stay for breakfast, she was saying. He said his letter called him back to town on most urgent business. I didn't like his manner at all. Oh, said her husband from behind his paper, without much interest. No, I thought it rather ungracious, and he looked queer. Oh, said her husband, turning to the financial columns. Yes, wild and hollow-eyed and that sort of thing. I've wondered since whether perhaps he takes drugs. One reads of such things, you know, and he certainly looked queer. I'm glad he's gone. William went up to Ethel's bedroom. Ethel was gloomily putting the finishing touches to her auburn hair. He's gone, Ethel, he said in a conspiratorial whisper. Gone for good. Ethel's countenance brightened. Sure, she said. Sure, he said. Now, what about that two shillings? She looked at him with sudden suspicion. Have you... She began. Me? Broke in William indignantly. Why, I didn't know he'd gone till I got down to breakfast. All right, said Ethel carelessly. If he's really and truly gone, I'll give you half a crown. William, on his way to school, met Ginger at the end of the lane. I've tried them all, said Ginger despondently, and none of them will give me a penny. William, with a flourish, brought out his half a crown. This'll do for both of us, he said, with a lordly air. Crumbs, said Ginger, with respect and admiration in his voice. Who'd you get that out of? Well, a man came to stay at our house, began William. Ginger's respect and admiration vanished oh a visitor he said disparagingly is easy enough to get money out of a visitor if you think this was easy began william with deep feeling and then stopped it was a long story and already retreating into the limbo of the past he could not sully the golden present by a lengthy repetition of it it had been jolly hard work while it lasted but now it was over and done with it belonged to the past the present included a breathless run into the village, leaping backwards and forwards across the ditches, a race down the village streets, and tops, glorious tops, superior shilling each tops with sixpence over. He uttered his shrill, discordant war whoop. Come on, he shouted, for they're all sold out. Race you to the end of the road. End of chapter 13Chapter 14 of William the Fourth by Rick Maul Crompton. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 14. A Dress Rehearsal. It was Saturday, but despite that glorious fact, William, standing at the dining room window and surveying the world at large, could not for the moment think of anything to do. From the window he saw the figure of his father, who sat peacefully on the lawn reading a newspaper. William was not fond of his own society. He liked company of any sort. He went out to the lawn and stood by his father's chair. "'You've not got much hair right on the top of your head, father,' he said pleasantly and conversationally. There was no answer. "'I said you've not got much hair on the top of your head,' repeated William in a louder tone. "'I heard you,' said his father coldly. Oh, said William, sitting down on the ground. There was silence for a minute. Then William said in friendly tones, I, I only said it again, because I thought you didn't hear the first time. I, I thought you'd have said, oh, or yes, or no, or, or something, if you'd heard. There was no answer. And again, after a long silence, William spoke. I didn't mind your not saying, oh, or yes, or no, he said, only that was what made me say it again, because with you not saying it, I thought you'd not heard. Mr. Brown arose and moved his chair several feet away. William, on whom hints were wasted, followed. I was reading a tale yesterday, he said, about a man what's legs got bit off by sharks. Mr. Brown groaned. William, he said politely, pray don't let me keep you from your friends oh no that's quite all right said william well perhaps ginger is looking for me well i'll finish about the man and the sharks after tea you'll be here then won't you 
please don't trouble said mr brown with sarcasm that was entirely lost on his son oh it's not a trouble said william as he strolled off i like talking to people ginger was strolling disconsolately down the road looking for william his face brightened when he saw william in the distance hello william hello ginger in accordance with their usual ceremonial greeting they punched each other and wrestled with each other till they rolled onto the ground then they began to walk along the road together i've not got to stop with you long said ginger gloomily my mother's got an old sail of work in her garden and she wants me to help huh said william scornfully you helping at a sale of work you <laughs> she's going to give me five shillings went on ginger coldly william slightly modified his tone well i never said you can't help did i he said in a more friendly voice she said i needn't go for about half an hour what'll we do dig for hidden treasure two months ago william and his friends had been fired with the idea of digging for hidden treasure from various books they had read ralph the reckless hunted to death the quest of captain terrible etc they had gathered that the earth is chock full of buried treasure if only one takes the trouble to dig deep enough they had resolved to dig every inch of their native village collect all the treasure they could find and with it buy a desert island on which they proposed to spend the rest of their lives unhampered by parents and schoolmasters they had decided to begin with the uncultivated part of ginger's back garden and to buy further land for excavation with the treasure they found in the back garden their schemes were not narrow they had decided to purchase and to pull down all the houses in the village as their treasure grew and more and more land was acquired for digging but they had dug unsuccessfully for two months in ginger's back garden and were beginning to lose heart they had not realized that digging was such hard work or that ten feet square of perfectly good land would yield so little treasure conscientiously they carried on the search but it had lost its first fine careless rapture and they were glad of any excuse for avoiding it dig in your back garden with all those sail of work people messin about interruptin and gettin in the way said william sternly not much all right said ginger relieved i only suggested it well shall we hunt for smugglers there was a cave in the hillside just beneath the road and though the village in which william and ginger lived was more than a hundred miles inland william and ginger were ever hopeful of finding a smuggler or at any rate traces of a smuggler in the cave they searched it carefully every day as william said it's only likely the really cunning ones wouldn't stay sitting in their caves by the sea all the time they'd know folks would be on the lookout for em there they'd bring their things here where no one expect em why with a fine cave like this there's sure to be smugglers when tired of hunting for smugglers or traces of smugglers they adopted the characters of smugglers themselves and carried their treasure consisting of stones up the hillside to conceal it in the cave or fled for their lives to the cave with imaginary soldiers in pursuit from the cover of the cave bill the smuggler often covered the entire hillside with the dead bodies of soldiers in these frays the gallant smugglers never received even the slightest scratch with ever fresh hope they searched the cave again ginger found a stone that he said had not been there yesterday and must have been left as a kind of signal but william said that he distinctly recognized it as having been there yesterday and the matter dropped after a brief and indecisive discussion as to how they should spend the five shillings that ginger's mother had said she would give him they occupied themselves in crawling laboriously on their stomachs in and out of the cave so as to be unperceived by the soldiers who were on the watch above and below at last ginger moved not so much by his conscience as by fears of forfeiting his five shillings set off sadly homewards and william set off along the road in the opposite direction he walked slowly his hands in his pockets dragging his shoes in the dust in a manner which his mother frequently informed him brought the toes through in no time when he came to the school he stopped 
attracted by the noise that came through the open window of the classroom they were preparing for a dress rehearsal of the pageant of ancient britain which was to be performed the next month william who was not in the cast looked with interest through the window ancient britons in various stages of skins and woad and grease paint stood about the room or leapfrogged over each other's backs or wrestled with each other in corners william espied a particular enemy at the other end of the room he put his head through the window hello monkey brand he called in his strident devastating voice miss carter mistress of the second form raised herself wearily from arranging the skin of an infant ancient briton i wish you wouldn't she began testily then her voice sinking into hopelessness oh it's william brown william ignoring her put his fingers to his lips and still gazing belligerently at his enemy emitted a deafening whistle miss carter put her hands to her ears william she said irritably william wiped his mouth with the back of his hand beg pardon he said mechanically and without feeling as he withdrew his head and prepared to retire oh uh, one minute william what are you doing just now william inserted his untidy head in the window again me he said oh nothing just nothing well i wish you'd come and be an ancient briton just for the dress rehearsal it won't be long but so many of em can't come this afternoon and it's so difficult to arrange how they are to stand with only three quarters of them here you needn't be made up but just put this skin on she held up a small skin carelessly in her hand william looked round the room with his sternest and most disapproving scowl have i got her come in with all those boys all over the place and change with all those boys bother me all the time so's i don't know what i'm doing and miss carter was in a bad temper she threw the skin irritably at william through the window oh change where you like she snapped if you'll be back here in five minutes william took the skin eagerly oh yes i will he promised then he rolled up the skin and stuffed it under his arm it instantly changed into a bale of precious but vague contraband material glancing sternly round for soldiers william crept cautiously and silently down to his cave there he drew a sigh of relief placed his gun in a corner and changed into the skid once clad in the skin his ordinary clothes became the precious but vague contraband material he crept to the entrance glanced furtively round then wrapped his clothes into a bundle and looked around for some place of concealment on the ground at the further end of the cave was a large piece of paper in which he and ginger had once brought their lunch still with many furtive glances around he wrapped up his clothes and concealed the bundle on a shelf of rock in a corner of the cave then he took up his gun shot two soldiers who were just creeping towards the entrance of the cave walked to the doorway shot again at a crowd of soldiers who fled in panic terror at his approach then resplendent in his skin and drunk with heroism and triumph he swaggered up the hillside and into the school as an ancient briton he was not an unqualified success and more than once miss carter regretted her casual invitation william considered the rehearsal as disappointing as the rehearsal considered him just standing about and singing and talking and no fighting or shouting or nothing he was glad he wasn't a nanship briton if that's all the poor things could do however at last it was over and he crept again furtively down the hillside to his private dressing-room ginger was standing near the cave entrance what have you been doing all this time he began then as his gaze took in william's costume his mouth opened crumbs he said i'm an ancient briton said william airily they just wanted me to go and be an ancient briton up at the school and well interrupted ginger excitedly while you've been away i've found em at last what said william smugglers said ginger excitedly smugglers things golly said william equally thrilled where in the cave when i came to look for you and i couldn't find you and i looked round the cave again and i found em a sudden fear chilled william's enthusiasm what were they 
clothes and things i thought i wouldn't look at em properly till you came they was wrapped up in that old paper we brought our food in last week the ancient briton looked at him sternly and accusingly yes uh, well uh, they were my clothes what i'd changed out of that's what they were you're just a bit too clever taking people's clothes for smugglers things anyway i'm just getting cold with only a skin on so just please give me these smugglers things so i can put em on ginger's jaw dropped i uh, i took em home i didn't want to leave em about here in case someone else found em i hid em behind a tree in our garden the ancient briton's gaze became still more stern well perhaps you kindly get em for me out of your garden for i die a cold dressed in only a skin i should think the ancient britons all died a cold if they felt like what i feel like you're just a bit too clever with other people's smugglers things and suppose miss carter comes down for her skin and what do you think i'll look like then dressed in nothing all right said ginger i'll get em I, I won't be a minute if you will leave your clothes all behind the cave looking exactly like smugglers things he was gone and william sat shivering in a corner of the cave dressed in his ancient briton costume the glamour of the cave was gone william felt that he definitely disliked smugglers the only people he disliked more than he disliked smugglers were ancient britons for whom he now felt a profound scorn and loathing in about ten minutes time ginger returned he was empty-handed and there was a look of consternation on his face william he said meekly I i'm awfully sorry it's been sold they thought it was meant for the rummage sale and they have took it in and sold it william was speechless with indignation well he said at last you've gone and sold all my clothes and now what do you think's going to happen to me that's just what i'd like to know if you don't mind telling me what's going to happen to me perhaps if you sold all my clothes you kindly tell me what's going to happen to me getting colder and colder perhaps you'd like me to freeze to death how am i going to get home and if i don't get home how am i going to get anything to eat and if i don't get anything to eat how am i going to live i'm dying of cold now well i only hope you'll be sorry then then when probably you'll be being hung for murdering me william returned to earth from his flights of fancy well now perhaps you'll kindly get my clothes back how can i said ginger with the air of one goaded beyond endurance well you can go and find out who bought em i suppose only you needn't tell em whose they was again ginger departed and again the ancient briton sat shivering and gazing sternly and accusingly around the cave after a short interval ginger appeared again breathless with running mr groves bought it william from wayside cottage i don't know how i'm to get em back though william william sighed i'd better come with you he said wearily sighs i shall probably get froze into a glacier or something if i stay in here any more the ancient briton gazed furtively round him from the cave door without that bravado and swagger generally displayed by bill the smuggler the coast was clear the two boys crept out when i get to the road i'll crawl on my stomach in the ditch like as if i was a smuggler then no one'll see me ginger walked dejectedly along the road while the ancient briton made a slow and very conspicuous progress in the ditch beside him ejaculating irascibly as he went well i've just done with smugglers and with ancient britons i'll never look at another smuggler or an ancient briton while i live if you hadn't been so jolly clever running off with other people's clothes and selling em i shouldn't be crawling along and scratching myself and cutting myself and eating mud now in a voice of pure wonder how do ancient britons get about i don't know all shivering with cold and scratching themselves and cutting themselves wayside cottage was fortunately for the ancient briton on the outskirts of the village the front door was conveniently open there was a small garden in front and a longer garden behind with a little corrugated iron building at the end come on said william let's go and get em back are you going to ask him for em said ginger no i'm not i don't want everyone in this village talking about it said william sternly i just want to get em back quietly and put em on and no one know anything about it i don't want anyone talking about it no one was about they gazed at the stairs from the open doorway they'll be upstairs said william in a hoarse whisper clothes are always upstairs now come very quietly creep upstairs 
ginger followed him loyally fearfully reluctantly and they went upstairs every time ginger hit a stair rod or made a stair creak william turned round with a stern and resonant shush at last they reached the landing william cautiously opened the door and peeped within it was a bedroom and it was empty come on whispered william with the cheerfulness of the born optimist they're sure to be here they entered and closed the door now said william we'll look in all the drawers and then we'll look in the wardrobe they began to open the drawers one by one suddenly ginger said hush there was the sound of footsteps coming up the stairs they drew nearer the door crumbs gasped william under the bed quick as they disappeared under the bed the door opened and a little old gentleman came in he looked round at the open drawers and frowned how curious he said as he shut them how very curious then he hummed to himself straightened his collar at the glass took a few little dancing steps around the room and then stood irresolute his hand on his chin now what did i come up for he said what did i come up for oh, a, a, a handkerchief all might have been well had not the ancient britain at this moment succumbed to the united effects of cold and dust and emitted a resounding sneeze bless my soul said the old gentleman bless my he dived underneath the bed and seizing hold of william's bare and muddy foot he pulled but william had firm hold of the further leg of the bed and the old gentleman exerting his utmost strength only succeeded in pulling the bed across the room with william still firmly attached to it but this treatment infuriated william if you only kindly stop dragging me about on my stomach he began then emerged stern and dusty and arranging his skimpy and disheveled skin you 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 thief said the old man i'm not a thief said william i'm a nanchent but the old man made a dash at him and william dodged and fled out of the doorway ginger was already halfway downstairs the old man was delayed first by the door which william banged in his face and secondly by the fact that he slipped on the top stair and rolled down to the bottom there he sat up looked for his spectacles found them adjusted them and gazed round the hall still seated on the hall mat the two boys were nowhere to be seen muttering dear dear and bless my soul let me see what was it i wanted a, a handkerchief the old man began to ascend the stairs but william and ginger had not gone out of the front door a group of ginger's mother's friends could be plainly seen passing the little gateway and in panic william and ginger had dashed out of the back door into the little garden and into the corrugated iron building a lady dressed in an artist's smock a paintbrush in her hand looked up from an easel please don't come in quite so roughly she said disapprovingly i don't like rough little boys she looked william up and down and her disapproval seemed to deepen well she said stiffly it doesn't seem to me quite the costume i shouldn't have thought the vicar uh, however you'd better stay now you've come is the other little boy your friend he must sit down quietly and not disturb us you may just look at the picture first for a treat bewildered but ready to oblige her william wandered round and looked at it it seemed to consist of a chaos of snow and polar bears it's to be called the frozen north she said proudly now you must stand in the attitude of one drawing a sleigh so no the expression more gentle please i must say i do not care for the costume but the vicar must know i'm an ancient began william and then decided to take the line of least resistance and be the frozen north the lady painted in silence for some time occasionally looking at william's rather mangy skin and saying disapprovingly no no i must say i, I do not but of course the vicar just as the charm of novelty was disappearing from the procedure and he was devising means of escape another lady came in busy dear she said and then she adjusted her lorgnettes and she too looked disapprovingly at william my dear she said isn't that rather well of course i, I know you artists are 
well bohemian and all that but the artist looked worried my dear she said i showed the vicar the picture yesterday and he said that he had a child's eskimo costume and he'd find a boy to fit in and send it round for a model but i'd an idea that the eskimos dress more er, more completely than that hadn't you i'm an ancient began william and stopped again you remember mrs parks asking for money to buy clothes for her boy went on the artist as she painted well i got john to go to that sale of work this afternoon and got a suit from the rummage sale and he got quite a good suit and i've just sent it round to her do stand still little boy you know dear i wish i felt happier about this er uh, costume yet i feel i ought not to criticize and even in my mind anything the dear vicar well i'll be quite frank said the visitor i don't care for it and i do think that artists can't be too careful any suggestion of the nude is so well don't you agree with me i'm surprised at the vicar the artist held out half a crown to william you may go she said coldly take the costume back to the vicar and i don't think i shall require you again at that moment the little old man came in he started as his eye fell on william and ginger the thief he said excitedly the thief catch him catch catch him william dashed to the doorway upsetting the old man and a wet canvas on his way the old man landed on top of the canvas and sat there murmuring oh dear oh dear oh dear what a day and looking for his glasses the visitor pursued the two of them half-heartedly to the gate and then returned to help in the work of separating the old gentleman from the wet canvas william and ginger sat in a neighboring ditch and looked at each other breathlessly parks said ginger that's the shop at the end of the village yes said william and i'm just about sick of crawling in ditches and what's wrong with it i'd like to know he went on looking down indignantly at his limp skin it's all right not as clothes but as a kind of dress-up thing it's all right as good as that old penny for she was wearing and i jolly nearly said so and thief too well i wouldn't go inside that house again not if not not if they ask me anyway his expression softened anyway i got half a crown his expression grew bitter once more half a crown and not even a pocket to put it in come on to parks william returned to the ditch they only passed a little girl and her small brother look algy said the little girl look at him he's a loony and the others is keeper he think he's a frog maybe and that's why he goes in ditches and he doesn't wear no clothes william straightened himself i'm an ancient he began but at sight of his red and muddy face surmounted by his crest of muddy hair the little girl fled screaming come on algy he'll get your and eat your if you don't algy's screams reinforced hers and william disconsolately returned to the ditch as the screams still lusty faded into the distance i'm just getting a bit sick of this muttered the ancient briton they reached parks william lay concealed behind the hedge and ginger wandered round the shop reconnoitering go in goaded william in a hoarse whisper from the hedge go in and get em say you fetch a policeman make em give you em fight em take em you let em i can't stand this much longer i'm cold and i'm wet i feel as if i've been an ancient briton for years and years hurry up are you going to get me my clothes oh shut up said ginger miserably i'm doing all i can doing all you can are you well you're not doing much but walking around and round the shop do you think if you go on walking around and round the shop my clothes will come out of themselves come walking out to you cause if you think that shut up at this moment a small boy walked out of the shop hello said ginger with a fatuous smile of friendship hello said the boy ungraciously ginger moistened his lips and repeated the fatuous smile have you got any new clothes today the boy gave a fairly good imitation of the fatuous smile no he said have you don't go spoiling your face for me it's beautiful but don't waste it on me then whistling he prepared to walk away from ginger down the road desperately ginger stopped him i'll i'll, I'll, I'll give you he swallowed then with an effort made the nobler offer i'll give you five shillings if yes said the boy suddenly if if you give me those clothes the lady what paints sent you today 
Give me the five shillings, then. I won't give you the money till you give me the clothes. Oh, won't you? Well, I won't give you the clothes till you give me the money. They stared hostily at each other. Get my clothes, said the irate voice from the ditch. Punch him. Do anything to him. Get my clothes. The boy looked round with interest into the ditch look at him he shrieked mirthfully look at him naked just dressed in a muff ah <laughs> look at him william rose with murder in his face ginger hastily pressed the five shillings into the boy's hand get him quick he said the boy retreated to the shop and closed the door except for a small crack through that crack he shouted we dim want no narcy mangy mouldy cast off clothes from no one we give them to johnson's up the village then he banged the door William, in fury, kicked the door, and a crowd of small boys collected. William, perceiving them, fled through the hedge and into the field. The small boys followed, uttering derisive cries. Look at him! Look at him! He's a cannibal! He's got no clothes! He's out of a circus! He's balmy! He's wearing his mother's fur! William turned on them in fury. I'm an ancient! He began rushing upon them, and they fled in panic william and ginger sat down behind a haystack well you're very clever at getting back my clothes aren't you said william with heavy sarcasm i'm getting just about sick of your clothes said ginger gloomily sick of em echoed william i only wish i'd gotten to be sick of i'm just sick of not having em and walking about and prickles and stones and scratching myself and shivering with cold that boy just better wait till i get my clothes and then his eyes gleamed darkly with visions of future vengeance. Well, he turned to Ginger, and what we going to do now? To know, said Ginger despondently. Well, where's Johnson's? Mrs. Johnson's my aunt's charwoman, said Ginger wearily. I know where she lives. William rose with a determined air. Come on, he said. If we don't got him this time, said Ginger, as they started on their furtive journey, I'm going home oh are you said william sternly well then you're going in this ancient britain's thing and i'm going in your clothes you lost my clothes and if you don't get em back you can give me yours that's fair isn't it oh shut up said ginger in the tone of one who has suffered all that is possible to suffer and can suffer no more it's that five shillings that i keep thinking of five shillings and for nothing and calling my clothes moldy said william with equal indignation my clothes moldy she lives here said ginger from the shelter of a hedge they watched the house you'd better go and get em then said william unfeelingly how said ginger well you sold em i didn't sell em Shh, look the door of the johnsons home was opening a small boy came out he's dressed in my clothes said william excitedly get him get him my clothes his eye brightened and into his face came a radiant look as of one beholding some dear friend after a long absence my clothes ginger advanced to the small boy and smiled his anxious fatuous mirthless smile like to come and play with me he said yes please said the boy returning the friendly smile well you can come with me said ginger ingratiatingly he followed ginger through the stile and gave a shout of derision when he saw william crouching behind the hedge oh look at him he said dressed up funny a masterly plan had come into william's head he led the party to the next field to the disused barn which in their normal happy life that now seemed to him so far away served as castle or pirate ship now he said we're going to play as soldiers and you come and say you want to join the army but i don't said the small boy solemnly that would be a story never mind said william patiently you must pretend you want to join the army then you must take off your clothes and leave them with me and this boy will pretend to be the doctor and he'll tell you if you're strong enough you know he'll look at your lungs and things and then and then well that's all now i'll give you the half crown just for a present if you play it properly all right said the boy brightly beginning to take off his coat you've got bad lungs and a bad heart and bad legs and bad arms and bad ears and a bad head said the doctor and i'm afraid you can't be a soldier all right said the boy brightly don't want her be now i'll put on my clothes 
he came out to the back of the barn where he had left his clothes and burst into a howl oh oh oh, oh, oh he's taken my clothes took on my clothes he's took on my oh, oh mama he's taken my clothes his shirt fluttering in the wind he went howling down the road ginger went to the ditch whence william's gesticulating arms could be seen quick william quick gasped ginger william arose holding his ancient briton costume in his hand he was clothed in a tweed suit a very very small tweed suit the waistcoat would not button across him and the sleeve came only a little way below his elbow william gasped ginger it's not yours william's face was pale with horror it looked like mine he said in a sepulchral voice but it's not mine a babble of voices arose where are they lovey boo hoo boo hoo they took em my clothes wait till i get em that's all never mind darlin ma learn em with grim despair they saw what seemed to them an army of women running up the hill and with them a howling boy in a fluttering shirt one of the women carried a broom run william gasped ginger william flung his skin into the ditch and ran though his suit was so tight that he could only progress in little leaps and bounds he progressed with remarkable speed at last exhausted and breathless he walked round to the side entrance of his home and stood in the hall he could hear his mother's voice from the drawing-room miss carter's been ringing up all the afternoon she was saying she seems to think that william took away one of the costumes after the rehearsal i told her i was sure william wouldn't do such a thing my dear in his father's voice you do make the most rash statements william entered slowly his father and mother and sister turned and stared at him in silence william gasped his mother what are you wearing william made a desperate effort to carry off the situation you know everyone says how fast i'm growing i keep growing out of my things mother screamed ethel from the window there's a lot of awful women coming through the gate and an awful little boy in a shirt william was brushed and combed and dressed in his best suit his weekday suit had been with great trouble and at great expense brought back from mrs johnson and taken from the person of her eldest son and was now being disinfected from any possible germ which might have infested the person of her eldest son mrs johnson and her indignant younger son had been with great difficulty and also at great expense soothed and appeased william had eaten the bread and water considered in the circumstances a suitable meal for the prodigal son with that inward fury but with that outward appearance of intense enjoyment that he always fondly imagined made his family feel foolish he was not to leave the garden again that day he was to go to bed an hour before his usual time but that left him now half an hour to dispose of in the garden through the window william could see his father reclining in a deck chair and reading the evening paper william considered that his father had that evening shown himself conspicuously lacking in tact and sympathy and generosity but william did not bear malice and he knew that such qualities are not to be expected in grown-ups moreover his father was the only human being within sight and william felt disinclined for active pursuits he went out to his father and sat down on the grass in front of him oh uh, about that man what had his legs bit off by a shark father well i promise to tell you about well it begins when he starts out in the ship of mystery william's father tried to continue to read his paper finding it impossible he folded it up one minute william how long is there before you go to bed only about half an hour said william reproachfully but i can tell you quite a lot at that time and i can go on to-morrow if i don't finish you'll like it ginger and me liked it awfully well he starts off in the ship of mystery and why it's called the ship of mystery is because every night there's ghostly moanings and rattlings of chain and one day the man what the tales about went down to get something he'd forgot in the middle of the night and he saw a norfolk figure dressed in a long black cloak with gleaming eyes and just as he was running away it put out a norfolk skinny hand and said in a norfolk voice william's father looked wildly round for escape and saw none nemesis had overtaken him with a groan he gave himself up for lost 
and william already thrilled to his very soul by his story the memories of his exciting day already dim pursued his ruthless recital end of chapter fourteen end of william the fourth by rick Mall compton